one and all present. On the second day of 13th Ed Leadership International Roundtable, it is the largest virtual conference, and this is your host, Sarita Bhaskar, on behalf of Global Education and Training Institute. Together, we can make a difference. As we are here to promote an educational climate that is conducive to learning. Yesterday was thought-provoking and very enriching. It was instrumental in committing to revitalize education for the COVID-19 generation. We need to re-inspire the teacher within us to change our expectations from just education to other deep and profound ways. Guided by the NEP clearly, it is time to reimagine, restructure, and recreate a new and more meaningful education. Before we begin with our fifth round table, let us thank the Almighty. Oh, you thank you for loving me. Being with me and for details in my life. Fill me with grace that I may have the strength to face what is before me today. I know not today what it will bring for, what it will bring forth, but make me ready. So please join me to ask for the right guidance and blessings from the omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient almighty power. once admitted to the soul, becomes a spirit and never dies. Hope is the strength by which a shattered world shall emerge into the light. This song brings out the beauty of light in darkness, the beauty of hope, the beauty of believing through music. Now we have the choir of the Cambridge section with the song, When You Believe. Many nights we've prayed with no proof anyone could hear. In our hearts, a hopeful song we barely understood. Now we are not afraid, although we know there's much to fear. We were moving mountains up before we. 
a pleasant start to this beautiful day ahead and we are here with uh, getty that is global education and training institute our vision is to transform education it's time to rethink and revise the thoughts and practices getty is committed to bring this positive change so that we can do better and better each day let us hear this getty anthem you spell getty and getty for us all
There is so much positivity around, eagerness to bring about changes. And as Paulo Coelho said, when you are enthusiastic about what you do, you feel this positive energy and it's very simple. So now let me invite Ms. Roli Tripathi, a former principal who has been an innovative and accomplished English instructor. In her long career, in commitment towards education, she has pioneered events and brought positive organizational changes, opening new avenues for stakeholders and making qualitative changes. She is the co-convener of 13th Ed Leadership Roundtable International Conference, head at Getty, and head innovations and quality management Getty supported schools. So welcome Roli ma'am, please. Very good morning, everybody. Greetings from Getty. And once again, I welcome you all wonderful people. Today, this day of the 13th Ed Leadership International Roundtable. Let me begin thanking you, respected fellow educators and dear friends for your amazing support to us at the phenomenal beginning we made yesterday deliberating upon themes like a new mindset, teaching and learning as an art, from education to financial freedom, and so much more. We explored a whole prism of possibilities as we explored a number of perspectives towards innovative education. We heard the convener of the conference, Dr. Sunita Gandhi, talk about the framework of global education the four building blocks, universal values, excellence in all things, eloquence and service. Well, as educators, we all know the base of education from a tender age needs to be carved and molded well for which the role of teachers or educators is instrumental. There is a lot going on around us. These trends integrate the forecasts and predictions of a range of thought leaders and aggregate activities, initiatives, and projects everywhere. 
Personalization of learning using data and technology to adapt to the needs of a single learner. From a curriculum for a classroom of learners to a curriculum optimized to a single learner in a classroom of learners. Entrepreneurial thinking, a combination of creativity and innovation, problem solving, collaboration, teamwork, execution, and other habits of the mind like passion, drive, and above everything else, resilience. Learning analytics, new technologies that inform the teachers on students' learning with new and different modes of assessments and evaluations. Big data shapes the learning experience today. Global citizenship, technology continues to shrink the world. Our young learners learn to interact with their global peers, learning cultural competencies, cross-cultural communications, compassion, tolerance, and respect. We at Getty Global Education and Training Institute uphold this as much for elders. When we connect with the warnings that we called teachers empowerment to create space for important conversations, organizing conferences like the one we all are a part of today. We are soon planning an open with Meg Hanshaw and Martin Richards who propagate what they passionately call listening from the heart. We will be sharing more details with you about it. Project-based learning, an oldie but goodie is integrated project-based curricula pumped up by new technologies. Student learning is, has to be rather goal-driven with a learning experience that is addictive. Here I will share that we shall have the champion in project-based learning, Dr. Tom Markham, tomorrow morning with us at the same time for round table nine. Someone who has guided more than 6,000 educators from around the world and who is one of our Getty advisors too. And also who shall be conducting one of our upcoming trainings for teachers on project-based learning. As a teacher's training institute, we are constantly engaged in the endeavors relating to education, providing trainings in foundation skills of a teacher, experiential learning, spoken English courses, project-based learning, speed reading, mental math, and much more. Staying in the spirit of encouraging change and transformation in education, through this conference, we encourage schools to engage in implementing change and documenting evidence through our Innovation in Process Fellowships and Innovator Awards. We have been talking about this yesterday also. We feel these create the circumstances for real change on the ground. Each year at Ed Leadership, we look out for school heads and educators, the teachers interested in implementing change. They write their ideas for change in a fellowship and awards form. We invite you to apply this year also for the same in each round table, you will be provided with a link to access these forms. You can also find the form, the same form at our website edleader.in. Recipients of the fellowships implement their change, the ideas for change after the conference and they collect evidences in an e-portfolio, pictures, videos, slide <laughs> presentations, <laughs> all the <laughs> that they can. And these lead to their automatic entry for the Innovator Awards. So those individuals or schools that have already implemented innovations at their own levels, in their own institutions, organizations, you may please apply for the Innovator Awards. An international jury makes the selections based on the transparent criteria. 
So if you have an innovative idea that you would like to implement, please come on board with us. Fill up this simple form, log in to our website, edleader.in, or just stay through the roundtables where we shall constantly be sharing the link for filling this form. It is said, strong people don't put others down. They lift them up. Inspiration from whatever the source arouses feelings within us that re-enkindles hope, ambition, and determination. It is a momentary whisper of encouragement and reassurance that causes us to become aware of our potential. We all need that voice around us telling us you can do it. As I say this, I remember all those who have joined hands with us in our journey so far. I'll once again thank our chief guest for yesterday, uh, Mr. Anurag Tripathiji, the Secretary, Central Board of Secondary Education, who graced the occasion, shared so many insights and thoughts with us yesterday. And I would also express my gratitude to Her Excellency, Lieutenant Governor General uh, Kiran Bediji, and she has been a support to us all this while in almost all our endeavors. We have heard her from our Getty Live Talk Forum. And I think let's begin this day once again hearing her valuable thoughts. So over to hearing Ms. Kiran Bedi, Her Excellency, and the chief guest for the day. Thank you, Sunita. Thank you so much. I want to thank you and your family, you sisters, your parents for whom I have very, very high respect because that's when I visited you in 2015. I was very, very impressed for what your family, what you've inherited, but what your parents have done. You've given me a subject and you made me think. And of course, post-COVID is a very new challenge for all of us. Let me share with you. I know you very, very impressed for what your family and what your parents have done. Very, very excited. <laughs> and use it as a privilege to share. Uh, Sunita, one is I want to define what is education. What do I think is in a convocation of degrees, examinations, right? Attendance and scoring and getting gold medals. Yes, that's part of the certification of what we do. But I want to tell you what is education for me. And that's the way it's been as I grew up. Yeah. It's a constant gained learning. That's what I've lived in my life. For me, education was not finishing my master's and graduation and my education is over. For me, it's been constant and sustained learning. And it's also acquisition. But through two, three methods. And I want to share with you these three methods which I have practiced and I believe still. Number one, how do you do constant and sustained learning and acquisition? Number one is through our five senses. The five senses are as I see, as I hear, as I smell, as I taste, and as I touch. These are the five outdoors through which they entered into a 3H. I know you're very excited about what I'm saying. The five in outdoors, these are my absorbers. I then, now look, why I'm saying this? Because you've not had Rani Jhansi going to your school. You never had Shivaji going to her former school. But they are the ones who are considered, you probably didn't even have Chanakya going to school, but you got the Chanakya Niti from him. Which school did they go to? Which university did they go to? created institutions. So what I'm saying is, that, but they were using all our five senses. So I will tell you why I'm saying this, because this is where we need to go to. This is what education for me is. How do our children absorb and understand the values of these five sensory organs? The, the see, the hear, the smell, the, the task, touch, and the taste. Then these five doorways go through two, three H, the head, the heart, and the hands. So once all this what we do stores here as a memory, and if we keep sharpening that beautifully, it becomes intelligence. Then we it goes through a heart, which brings the emotional portion, and then it brings the hand where we use the skills. 
the skills training. So these five senses for me is education. And then they go through these. This is understanding the value of our system, of our body. What is it that we, well, after that we get a degree, but it's a combination of the head, the heart, and the hands. Then two things I want to take you towards, because this is where, because I'm talking to a, a, a community of teachers and administrators who have to pass this on to online learning now. And COVID, because of COVID, all this is becoming more and more relevant of what went wrong. All this went wrong because we lost, we had abused our senses. We had not looked at our head and our heart and the hands and we lost out on time and energy. And I'm a very avid listener of Sadhguru. And Sadhguru, all of the Visha Foundation, Sadhguru has been remarked, always been saying that two things are very important in life is time and energy. If those of us who use our time well, evolve. Those who are using the energy generated through these H and the five sensories emerge as a joyous human beings. But those of us who abuse this time, we let the energy be dissipated, are the ones who are losers in life, but we always are complaining. So this for me is education. Now my next question, which I've thought for you for this event, from what is education? See, I've not talked about masters and degrees, MBAs. For me, this is education. Because once these five sensories are correctly done, the head, the heart, and the hands are correctly placed, and the time is correctly used, and that the energy is correctly generated, tell me what stops me from achieving what I want to achieve. So should I have to tell that it karo, wo karega, wo bacha karegi, kyunki uski sari cheeze thik hain. Ab wo, wo karegi, jisko usme khushi milegi, to mujhe usko kehne ki zarurat nahi hai, kya karo? Kyunki uski choices correct hongi, wo galat baat sochegi nahi, ya soche karegi nahi, wo time bhi nahi barbaad karegi, wo energy bhi waste nahi karegi, wo energy generate karegi. Meri childhood mein yehi hua. Na maine time waste kiya, और अपनी एनर्जी जनरेट की जिसके साथ मैं यूनिवर्सिटी में भी टॉप करा और मैंने इंडिया नंबर वन भी बनी क्योंकि मैं पढ़ती थी और खेलती थी और तीसरी चीज का कोई टाइम वेस्ट नहीं होता था जिसकी वजह से 22 साल की उम्र में मैं इंडियन पुलिस सर्विस ऑफिसर बन गई क्योंकि मैंने एक भी दिन अपने स्टूडेंट के करियर में वेस्ट नहीं किया ये आदत बन गई लेकिन कहा जाता है क्रेडिट अब मैं जाती हूँ नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन से वेन डज दिस एजुकेशन बिगिन डज दिस एजुकेशन बिगिन वेन यू एंटर स्कूल नो The first part of our education is four years, from birth, born till four years. When does it begin? The beginning is of all these five senses you are born with. You are born with these five senses, but the nurturance of these five senses is in the hands of the home school, and the home school is our parents. You are a product of your parents. You not self. You initial period of you sisters. You are a product of your parents. I've seen them. How you girls have been nurtured. So, first four years is totally in the hands of the lap of our parents. हम वही खाते हैं, वही language बोलते हैं, वही कपड़े पहनते हैं, वही हमारा taste है, जो जो हमारे माँबाप पहले चार साल देते हैं. So, हमारी home schooling. So, before education is becoming outer and formal, when we go to a school, we are already schooled. Before we go to a school, and that's called the home school. Only guarantees today. So do your right thing of the five senses today. Use your time correctly today. Use your energy correctly today. Use your head, head heart, and the hands rightly today. When it comes tomorrow, it will be another today. One day at a time. Let it be today. And I think I'm grateful for what till went on till yesterday. If we have to educate, that these are the lessons from COVID in through education. Now, you see, I've not talked about how do you teach MBA course, how do you teach it. Look, all that follows when the child's attitude is right, well, these the priorities are right, understanding of realities are right. Nothing stops from the child from being a high achiever and earning a wonderful livelihood and living a beautiful life. Thank you, Sunita. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiran Bedi, for your so kind and inspiring words. We always look up to you. We have been looking up to you. You are such a source of inspiration. And on behalf of Getty, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because what you said 
is so very contemporary and it is not just related to what is important today but it is forever you talked about strengthening our five senses to strengthen and generate our energy make the best use of time because you said that education is not just degree it is not just attendance it is how we nurture our five senses so we take your guiding words one day at a time you have already inspired us you have been continuously inspiring us and thank you so much ma'am for sparing your time to be with us as our chief guest for this second day of our round table conference there is so much positivity i had already said the stage is set for a lovely day for this fifth sixth and seventh eighth round table four round tables are scheduled for today the theme of fifth round table is leading the way sydney j harris said the whole purpose of education is to turn mirrors into windows so very true so we begin with our first round table for the day and the chairpersons for this round table are mohammad abdul latif khan ji and mrs nuzhat khan so let me have the privilege of uh, introducing them mohammad abdul latif khan ji is the managing director of ms schools junior colleges and education center an electronics and communication engineer he is a committed educationist who has relentlessly tried to bring quality education at the doorsteps of the average student nuzat khan ji is the vice chairperson ms education expert trainer of speed reading from hyderabad telangana welcome sir welcome ma'am so over to you please thank you very much inaudible it's indeed a great great privilege to chair such an auspicious program and we feel that we are honored to be the chairperson and co-chairperson of this program i thank from the bottom of my heart to all the organizers especially to mrs sunita gandhi for assalam alaikum sir for for giving us this opportunity and allowing us to be in front of the great education fraternity i would like to share something about us that we are running 90 institutions across india with more than 30000 plus students and we have learned a lot in the past 6 years since the time when we started attending this uh, ed leadership program uh, when we used to, every year we used to visit lucknow and attend these sessions and we felt very happy and we have got lot of opportunities to get the new type of uh, knowledge and we 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 got introduced to so many international speakers and this kind of things has really changed our mindset and it has given us a new vision a different kind of thought process and that has really helped us in Uh, growing our institution so i hope this session will go successfully and we are happy to have so many good speakers in our panel uh, over to mrs zukhan please hello everyone a very good morning and a warm welcome to one and all it's uh, exciting to see so many enlightened faces and i'm fortunate to be a part of this panel 
and I'm looking forward to learn. And of course, uh, take so many uh, important feedbacks as well as the important uh, um, theme of this uh, leading the way, the, the importance of this uh, panel. Definitely, we are going to make a very remarkable uh, moment of this uh, conference. Of course, I feel fortunate to co chair this Roundtable 5 with eminent personalities from across the globe. Uh, we have John Bergman and from which, uh, US, and of course, uh, Ms. Pandit Dasa from US, and Professor Geeta Kingdom from UK, John Yo from Singapore, Rosaline So from South Korea, and Dr. Rasila Tufu from Samoa, which is the smallest island in the South Pacific Ocean. Honestly, I look, I think uh, this is such a gamut opportunity to diverse, uh, opportunities for the diversity of speakers that you get to learn from and also share with. During this round table, and the entire conference thereafter. Let's help each other in maximizing the learning potential by sharing your thoughts and feedbacks in the chat window throughout the session. Before the end, kindly share your questions and well, as well as your feedbacks about the keynote speakers. We we'll look forward to uh, listen and of course we we'll look forward to learn from the keynote speakers. Thank you. So let me now take the opportunity to invite a true visionary, Mr. John Brigman. I have attended his last session, I think some five years back, uh, when the, when in the same Ed Leadership Program. And uh, I am surprised to see what he was speaking five years ago is what actually is happening today during this COVID. I really appreciate his vision and his thought process, how he has understood the future of the learning process. And he is the uh, inventor of uh, flipped learning. And he has a lot of different ideas. Today, what we see um, they, these days about the Baijus or the unacademy, all such things, all such, all these things, he has imagined long back when, I, when we listened to him, during this ed leadership program at that time, at that time we didn't realize what actually he was speaking, but we, he, he has posed us to think about that. And today we are seeing what he was speaking at that time. And I really appreciate to have such a great personality in this panel. And I, am, I want to introduce him for those people who are listening to him first time. I request uh, Mrs. Nuzul Khan to give his introduction. Mr. John Bergman, USA. John Bergman is one of the pioneers of the flipped classroom movement. He is leading the worldwide adoption of flipped learning. He is the author of 10 books, including the best selling books, Flip Your Classroom, which has been translated into 13 languages. Amazing. John has been an educator for 34 years, 26 years as a classroom teacher. In 2002, John received the Presidential Award of, for Excellence for Maths and Science Teaching. And in 2010, he was named semi-finalist for Colorado Teacher for the Year. He serves on the advisory board for TED Education. He currently is teaching science and leading staff development at Houston Christian High School. We welcome you, Mr. John Berg. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with everybody, sharing with you about education and what really matters. Here, let me share my screen for you all to see. Uh, first of all, before I, I, I share real briefly, I just want to say I get it. Uh, two years ago, I went back into the classroom after spending much time traveling the world. I met Ms. Sunita Muhammad. I remember meeting you at the conference there. 
uh, in India. And what a great time that was sharing with you guys there. It's an honor to be back. But I, I also want to acknowledge that we are, we are in such an interesting time. And uh, I want to talk specifically about how do we rethink, how, how do we do education in a COVID and even in a post-COVID world? But notice the point is reaching students every day in the midst of the COVID world. And, and I, did a, I did a Google search. So I was doing a Google search. And I said, what do classes look like right now? And uh, so I, I Googled Google school and then I added country codes. And this is what I found. This is what one looks like in Taiwan. And this is what one looks like in Argentina and at the University of Oklahoma. Boy, that looks fun, doesn't it? No, not really. Uh, this is in France at a university, in Japan, at the University of Kentucky, the Vatican, South Korea, and in India. But maybe your classrooms don't look like that. Maybe, maybe they look more like this, right? Here's one in the United Kingdom, or just Zoom, right? What we're doing right now. Stanford Medical School, Furman University, Harvard, Indonesia, South Korea, the Brookings Institute, New York University, this is what it's looking like in most schools in the USA, or yeah, this is what it looks like to the students in India, but not all, because I was doing some research and so many of your, your schools in India have been closed. So how? How, how should we teach? Now, Abdullah, you, or Mohammed, you said this very well just a bit ago, is that Flipped learning has been around for a long time. I don't know if you realize this. And I helped pioneer in 2007. I actually wouldn't say I'm the inventor. Uh, there are some people in 1999, uh, uh, Dr. Richard Platt from University of Miami, Ohio, who was actually flipping classes with old videotapes back in 1999. But I, I want to posit something for you guys and ask a question. I think it's a pretty interesting question. Can flipped learning or could flipped learning be the answer? Could it be the answer to teaching in a COVID world, but more than just teaching, it's about reaching every student. So if I know most of you have an idea of what you think flipped learning is, but let me give you like the official definition. Developed by a hundred people, 49 countries, some from India, some from Australia and Spain and in the US and Brazil, all over the world. And the, uh, the Academy of Active Learning Arts and Sciences said that flipped learning is a framework that enables educators, get to this, to reach every student. This is done two years ago. We were talking about reaching every student and our esteemed guest, I heard her very clearly saying, what I'll say in a few minutes, and I'll say it now, I guess, is good teachings about relationships. We also know what makes good flip learning good. We've, there's actually standards on flip learning. These same people, 100 people, 49 countries, came up with 12 sectors of flip learning and uh, a bunch of standards. Kind of looks like a, you know, a chemistry periodic table uh, developed by our team, uh, the author being Earl St. Clair Smith, as it turns out. He was one who kind of came up with the idea and led this effort. And that said, I'm going to just sort of like super simplify this. If you want to think about flip learning, I want you to think about Bloom's taxonomy. So I want to define this, and I'll show you how flip learning can really be the answer. Uh, most of our class time, so, so I taught traditionally for 19 years. I, I, I stood up and I, I did the lecture thing. And when I was doing the lecture thing, I spent the vast majority of my time class time, doing, remembering, understanding. It was a very passive learning activity. And then I sent my kids home to apply, analyze, and evaluate. But when you flip your class, you flip Bloom's taxonomy on its head, and you spend more class time on the hard stuff, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. And as we thought more deeply, I, I published this in one of my books. Honestly, I think the ideal picture of flip learning, or of, of learning, that's flip learning, should be we should spend the vast majority of our class time. Now, class time can be in a Zoom room in the middle of Bloom's taxonomy. So, my classrooms, so I, I've been teaching. So when the COVID happened, I started teaching remotely. Uh, then our school partially went back in the fall in August uh, when we first started school. And then we went back to full online or full, not full online, full face-to-face, -face, although with less time because there's spacing of students and yeah, we have lunch breaks that are now spread out. So we've met money more or many less minutes. And this whole week, actually I've been teaching from home while my students are at school over the Zoom. Why? Because I got sick this weekend and I don't have a negative COVID test yet. And so my school won't let me back in the building until I get the test. By the way, I feel fine. I don't think I have the COVID, 
but uh, I have to get the test and the results aren't here yet. So I have to, I have to be patient and my students are just learning from home. But I wanna add some context uh, that will help us understand, I think how this all works. Uh, in, in the chat room, and I would encourage you to uh, interact with him is Dan Jones. He's watching this here from Ohio. And Dan and I helped develop or we developed this chart. I wanna explain this chart, it's kind of an important chart. Is if you look uh, up and down, you, you have Bloom's taxonomy, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. And you've got two colors, the orange and the blue. So in the fluke learning world, we like to talk about sort of two spaces, the independent space and the group space. Now the group space makes sense. That's when you are with your students in your class. And the independent space is when you are, when the student is alone and working on their own. Now, right now, well, not now, now, but last week before I uh, got sick and couldn't teach from the class, I was able to be to the right on this chart. So we are mostly back, but I still, and so that means I spend most of my class time doing the hard stuff with my students. So for their pre-learning work, what they primarily do is they're either watching a short video or they are reading some text. And then we spend class time working on the hard stuff, analyzing, evaluating, creating. But when I was in full on remote learning mode back in uh, the spring, March, April, May, when the pandemic hit, um, I was much further to the left on this chart. I was much more asynchronous. I had many, many less minutes with my students in a synchronous room. So when you have less face-to-face -face time with your students, you need to spend more time providing support for the hard stuff when they're working alone. There's lots of ways to do this. I've created some courses to help you with that idea if you want. No, so, so and, and look on the up and down axis uh, that's got micro and macro support is that the, you need to provide more support for the hard stuff to the degree that you have less face-to-face -face time with your students. I mean, if anything, if anything we learned in the pandemic is the value of face-to-face -face class time. We all need face-to-face -face class time with our students and we, got, we lost it. We lost, and, and we, we lost all of it because you're completely asynchronous or we lost some of it or um, you know, we lost some, you know, some variation of it. So it's so important. We, and another interesting thing, and I think you said this earlier, Mohammed didn't quite say it in these words, but do you realize that flip learning teachers have been preparing for the pandemic for the last 10 years? Now, that wasn't originally, I saw that on Twitter with one of the, one of the flip learning early people. So I, I wanna summarize all of educational research just for just a quick moment here uh, to help you understand I think what's gonna be the answer going forward. What are we gonna do going forward when the pandemic ends or, and as we're going through the end of the pandemic as we're at right now with the vaccines. And as I've thought through the educational research, I wanna just make a quick summarization. Over here, professors, you're probably gonna say, well, that's really simplistic, but it is. Uh, I think if you boil down all of the educational research, it boils down to two big ideas. Number one, active learning wins. All right, but what we've been doing for so long is passive learning. And number two, relationships win too. So if you can couple building strong relationships with students, which is what, uh, what our esteemed guest mentioned earlier, um, if you can bring in active learning, that is what makes, that's the, that's the, the magic sauce for learning, all right? But, but the question I posited in my description is how do we reach every student? Every student, yeah. Because I think the problem that we're facing right now is unprecedented, as you know. I mean, I'm not speaking anything you don't know, because there's huge gaps in inequity in our educational systems across the world. And the pandemic exposed this in a, in a huge way. And when the students come back from and get back to full-time uh, learning in their full schools, let's say it's a year from now, I don't know when it's really going to happen. What we're going to find is that we're going to have a huge number of students who are really far behind, right? So how do we solve that problem? Honestly, I think the answer is right here before us. Do you realize that in 1984, Benjamin Bloom, yeah, the same guy who did the taxonomy, he wrote a paper called The Two Sigma Problem, The Search for Methods of Group Instruction as Effective as One-on-One -on -one Tutoring. Now kind of take a moment, read that title. The Search for Methods of Group Instruction as Effective as One-on-One -on -one Tutoring. So what he did is he's been, he started doing studies and he's very famous for his taxonomy, but his life's work wasn't the taxonomy. His life work was mastery learning. And he, uh, he charted the effectiveness of three types of learning, conventional learning, passive learning, 
mastery learning was one standard deviation better. And then if you have tutorial or one-on-one -on -one individual instruction, that gives you a two standard deviation or two sigma improvement in education. And he said this, he said, so he, this paper wasn't like, I've solved the problem. His paper was a challenge for us to come up with the answer to where we could get two sigma improvement. In fact, he said this, read this. If the research of the two sigma problem yields practical methods, methods that the average teacher or school faculty can learn in a brief period of time and use with little more cost or time, then it would be an educational contribution of the greatest magnitude. It would change popular notions about human potential and would have significant effects on what the schools can and should do with the educational years of our young people. And I'm going to be bold right now and I'm going to say something that you're going to be like, whoa, really? Yeah. Has this problem been solved? Has the two sigma problem been solved? And I'm going to say yes, because there's a model of learning that's called the flipped mastery model. All right, where's this one? It's called the flipped mastery model. In the flipped mastery model, the students work through the content sort of at their own pace. It's mastery with a flipped twist. I did this this morning with my students. because it's, it's, it's evening here in the US. Uh, this morning I met with my students and I had, uh, so the, there was a laptop in my classroom and this, the computer I'm on with you. And I talked with each student. I talked to every student today in my classes. And I talked about where they're at on their learning journeys, what the next steps they were. I uh, had conversations about science with them. I asked them to tell, we were studying volcanoes in my geology class. And I said, you know, explain to me the different, uh, you know, or like a, a typical question was, what is something interesting that you've learned in the process of these lessons? And then they would ask, a, they would respond. And then I would kind of go deeper. And I would, we just had great conversations about volcanoes, which are, by the way, super cool. By the way, I mean, they blow up, they do all kinds of awesome stuff. And uh, my students were like into it, but in small groups. And, and the idea of Flip Master, if you're looking at the graph or the chart here, is you start with direct instruction, DI stands for direct instructions, then they practice, then they apply, and then they assess. The big idea of mastery learning is that they don't, they don't pass the exit assessment, the summative assessment, then they have to go back and do it again. In fact, in my geology class, I would say half of my students were ready for their, their summative assessment for uh, the unit that were doing volcanoes. And of those, they took it online. And after they took it online, I said, come grab the laptop and let's go over your, in, uh, we'll go over your test. I went over their tests. And if they scored more than 80%, I said, you have mastered this topic. You may move on. If they scored less, then they have to go back and I talked about what is it, what were the gaps in your, what, what do you not understand? What do you need to do? And I'm proud to say that of the half the students who took it, only three of the students um, scored less than 80. They've been working hard. I was very, very proud of that. Uh, and what I'm gonna attempt to do, I hope this will work. I'm gonna attempt to show a video of what my class looked like last year. And note, this is pre-pandemic. Um, and then I'll talk about why mastery matters, okay? <laughs> Notice it's like a three ring circle. So why do I think mastery should be something we should really, really explore? Uh, it's because what we need to do is we need to think, rethink how we teach. And since our students are going to be coming in with gaps, how else can we do this? In fact, we started our, our second semester uh, two or three weeks ago. And uh, since we are meeting in person, our, our school has uh, attracted more students. 
And I had a student come to my chemistry class. I also teach chemistry, you know, and she came into my class and I said, so tell me what was the background of chemistry that you had before you came? And the long story short is she had been completely remote at her previous school and had learned very little. And I don't know if you, those of you who are chemistry teachers, you basically would say, I'm sorry, you, uh, I, too much to catch up. But I said, okay, I'm your mastery coach. I'm here to help you. And she is catching up. She's doing amazing. She's working hard. I said, you have to work hard and come in extra time. And she is catching up because she, she can't do the stuff that we're doing until she learns the stuff before, but she's learning the stuff before. And this is so important. I'm also, I'm working with a brand new teacher. It's her first year teaching. And she has decided, she teaches in a very disadvantaged school. And she's been struggling with how to teach her, her students who come with a very, very large educational needs. And she says, I, I got to do mastery. I don't know how else to do it. And so I'm trying to, I'm coaching her through that, helping her through. I chatted with her just today. She's very frustrated because many of the teachers don't get what she's trying to do. And it's sad, but uh, I'm continuing to encourage her to do her students. So I can't tell you how much I think Uh, Mr. John, uh, I'm unable to hear your voice. Mr. John? Hi. Yeah, we are missing your you know, presentation on the screen and your voice. Yeah. John Bergman, sorry. It's lagging. Yeah, maybe some problem. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. John Bergman. Yes, sir. Uh, from the technical team, uh, can anybody give some idea that uh, why there is a gap? I think uh, we lost his signal. And this way, we will. We would like to thank Mr. John Wegman. It was truly badly in need of the hour, the presentation, what he gave us, the flipped learning. And of course, uh, we can't enough thank him for his concerns and uh, his care for the teaching learning uh, of uh, this education system. I see there is a lot of feedback, and of course, there's some takeaways from all the. Uh, listeners from this uh, presentation. I'm very much thankful to Mr. John, John Bergman to be a part of this panel and this round table, the leading the way. Thank you so much, Mr. John Bergman. A couple of the things which has opened my mind were the relief that a teacher would get by unburdening the explanation part and focus on the matter that is the most important. I really appreciate the vision of the flip teachers. And I, I, I should say that the real vision is the one which, which actually takes the shape. And as just now, John Bugman has explained that and said that the flip teachers have actually started preparing 10 years back for the COVID. What a vision. Nobody even have thought about such thing, that too, but I really appreciate them. One thing is certain that these Philip teachers, they get more time to interact with the students compared to the, the regular teachers who are uh, taking the sessions in the regular schools, because in this flip system, the PS students, they already you know, refer things online or through the system and then when they come to the classroom, they get a lot of time, and even the teacher get time to interact with individual <laughs> students, and they get a lot of thought process 
to do the to do so so anyhow it is a, it was a very good in time yeah, mr john bugman uh, i really appreciate your uh, uh, thought process and vision i hope this will go further and people will get benefited with such things now hey, would, uh, now, now yeah i'm back so sorry about that my computer completely crashed so. I, I welcome you i welcome you back i was just speaking about you uh, and i hope uh, we are very we are short of time and summarize in the time i would be appreciating it okay so uh, can i just say just a few last words i just would really really encourage everybody to take your time to build the relationships with your students i know this has been a hard time i know you have really struggled i have struggled teaching in the pandemic time but i believe in you and i know that you can make the difference in your students by reaching every student in every class every day take that time to get to know your students even if like today i had to do that remotely from my office it can be done it really can i know i know you can do that so i'll, I'll stop I, i apologize my computer just died or crashed in the middle of the presentation so uh yeah i'll i'll stay on to do uh, answer any more questions uh in the chat yes uh any question please from the audience and you know, i i request mr john mr john bugman to be in touch with us we maybe uh, we'll be in a position to you know ask question at, at the end um uh, i hope you are available yes uh, okay thank you thank you very much so the this covid has this covid has you know forced us to think about our well being and uh, well being is the most important thing because you, you you should be in a position to you know maintain your immunity and your strength so that you should be in a position to as uh, teach as well as learn so this is the right time where i can introduce you to our next speaker mr pandit dasa and uh, known as an urban monk among us who believes in creating mindful leaders and a positive workplace culture now i would like to welcome and of course feel privileged to introduce mr pandit dasa who is a mindful leadership expert author and motivational keynote speaker his inspirational speeches aim to help organizations create a movement retention and productivity he encourages leadership and co-workers to appreciate and celebrate the success and contributions of others This attitude fosters trust, enhances teamwork, and greatly impacts employee performance. He emphasizes the importance of leading without ego and highlights the importance of cultivating self-awareness and personal growth and development. Some organizations he has spoken for: Google, IBM, City State Farm, Bank of America. Oracle HCM convention national worldwide worldwide insurance the world government summit comcast novartis pharmaceuticals to to name a few may i now invite mr pandit dasa to bestow the audience with his wise and soothing words we welcome you sir thank you very much for that kind introduction i'm very happy to be here uh, with all of you Uh, so as uh, was mentioned, I is, sometimes I go by the the phrase urban monk. Uh, that's because I spent 15 years living living as a monk in New York City. And when I was living as a monk in New York City, I the the most common question I was asked is, "How did you become a monk? Why are you a monk?" And now I'm not a monk, so people are always asking me why I'm not a monk anymore. So I figured I can go ahead and share a little bit of my own story and a little bit of my own journey with you. and talk about a little bit on the topic of what it means to have mindfulness in the field of education. So, you know, I grew up um in um I was actually born in Kanpur, India. My my father is actually from Lucknow and uh my mom is from Kanpur, so I'm from somewhere in between. <laughs> um we migrated to the US uh in 1980. I was only 7 years old. My parents came to this country 
with next to nothing. So they came with, you know, very simple, very humble beginnings. They didn't come over with much man, money or anything like that. So one of the first things they did that they set up a small shop and we're just selling gift items. Right? So that, that it was a very simple beginning, but within a matter of about seven years, my parents were able to, with a lot of hard work and of course, a lot of luck, I think you need both. Uh, they were able to establish a multi-million dollar jewelry business in, in, the, in, the, in Los Angeles, California. So, you know, very quickly, we began living that so-called quote unquote American dream. Uh, it happened much faster than we, we thought it would. And in the early 1990s, my parents' jewelry factory caught on fire. It burnt down and we ended up losing everything. We ended up losing everything, right? Life is like that. <laughs> sometimes you have a lot and then sometimes you don't have anything. Uh, and so at, once we lost everything in Los Angeles, at that time, my father decided to explore new business opportunities in post-communist Bulgaria in 1992, 1993. Now I know I, I'm, I'm, build, I'm leading up to the point of how I became a monk, by the way. So <laughs> just be patient with the story. So here we are in post-communist Uh, Mr. Dasa, uh, excuse me, sorry, we are unable to listen to your voice. Okay. Um, uh, is that okay? Fine. Yes. Yeah, okay. it's fine now. Okay. So, um, I don't know when that happened, but uh, so basically in 1992, 1993, we ended up in post-communist Bulgaria after we lost our business in Los Angeles. And then at that time, you know, in, in, at that time, no one in uh, post-communist Bulgaria spoke any English. Like literally everything on TV was in Bulgarian or in Russian. And all the movies were several years old because I don't think American movies were allowed. And of course there was no internet. So you can just imagine my entire social life, recreational life, life as I had known it came to a complete stop. So when all of my external distractions came to a stop, I had nowhere else to turn but to turn inward. And that's when I began my mindfulness practice to sort of stay sane in the middle of all that chaos that was, and my life had turned upside down. You know, that's a very, very big dramatic change that I went through. It was quite stressful. It was quite challenging. Nothing about it was easy. So we spent a few years in Bulgaria, moved back to the U.S., to the East Coast, to New Jersey, the New York City area. Then in 1999, I just wanted clarity for my own life. Right. I wanted clarity about my own life. So I decided to go to live in a monastery in Mumbai, India. I thought I would spend maybe just a month because I'm like, I've never stayed in a monastery. I don't know if I'll survive a month in a monastery. So I, went to a monastery. So, so I decided to go to a monastery in Mumbai, India. And here I am living with 40 monks and no one has beds. You know, everybody sleeps on a thin straw mat no cushions, no mattresses. Uh, we all woke up at five in the morning or 4.30. So the meditation started at five and the rest of the day was spent, you know, serving one another, serving the community. And so this was, and to my own surprise, I fell in love with that lifestyle, living with very minimal possessions, just a suitcase and a life of service to others. And I can say, I, I feel like in the monasteries when my true education really began. Because I started learning about things that really mattered to me and how to sort of uh, learn to balance my material life and the spiritual component as well. So I spent, ended up spending six months in a few different monasteries in India, came back, moved into a monastery in New York City. And in New York City, I thought I'd spend maybe a few months in the monastery, ended up spending 15 years living as a monk, 15 years. Uh, during that time, I was doing a lot of educational work at Columbia University, but more slightly more on the spiritual side, I became one of the chaplains on campus. I started to uh, teach meditation, started to teach some spiritual subjects, started to teach vegetarian cooking, gave me a chance to interact with students in a, in a positive way, helping them explore different aspects of their own life. And then about six years ago, at the end of 2014, I decided I wanted to take, so, and I, I was also speaking on college campuses around the US in philosophy classes and religion classes, just on 
spirituality, philosophy, things like that. And mindfulness and meditation, of course. And then I wanted to take what I'd learned and bring mindfulness into the corporate environment. So I left the monastic life six years ago. And since then I've been speaking in companies around the country and around the US and sometimes overseas in India as well. So one of the key things that, you know, when I'm, since we're gonna be talking about mindfulness, it's important to be able to, first of all, understand what the mind is. So I like to think of the mind like a smart device. I know we all have one, or maybe two, maybe three. Maybe we have more than that. And, you know, what happens in our mind or what happens on our smart device when we have too many apps open? Basically, it slows down and sometimes it freezes up and it drains the battery. And so the same thing happens in our mind. Now, I'm going to ask you a question and feel free to put an answer in the chat. How many apps do you think are open in your mind right now? You should have put something in the chat. How many apps do you think literally are open in your mind right now? Go ahead, put a number in there. Only three, somebody said. That's not bad. <laughs> then you're more monk than I am if you only have three apps. <laughs> Someone said one. Wow, we've got some serious monks here. I feel uh, not qualified to speak to all those people here. So some people are saying 10, 15. Some said too many to count. Um, so our mind is a very, very busy place, obviously. How can we be mindful when we have a mind that's fully cluttered with 10, 15, 20, 30 things? It's, it's almost impossible. Now, what so what mindfulness can help us do is become aware of the different apps that are open up here. So we can close out the apps we no longer need, right? And keep open the ones that we do. And that's really what mindfulness can help us do. Especially during this time where we are experiencing so much uncertainty, so much anxiety, so much additional stress, we need to make sure that we are taking care of our mind, our emotional health, our mental health, our physical health, and our spiritual health. If we're not taking care of all of these, how are we actually going to be able to teach? How are we actually going to be able to interact with our colleagues and our students? You know, the airline industry has something we can all learn from. The airline industry tells us that in case there's a drop in oxygen in the cabin, the oxygen mask will come down. And what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put your own oxygen mask on first before helping someone else. And education is so much about helping others. But, but if we're not helping ourselves, if, if we're not taking in enough oxygen for our own mental well-being, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, if we're not getting enough oxygen, we are not going to have any battery life left. Yeah? The battery up here is going to be on red, you know, 5%, 10% when we get up in front of our students. So we need to make sure we recharge because our mind is constantly going back and forth, right? Our mind is constantly thinking about the things that have happened in the past. Now, let me ask another question. How many of you are still bothered by something and, some, and, and you still remember something that happened over five years ago to you? How many of you remember that from five years ago? Just, put, just to put a yes if, you, if that happens to you. Like something happened five years ago and you still remember it, something painful. You're just like, oh my gosh, why, is it, why did it happen? That was so unfair. That shouldn't have happened to me. I didn't do anything wrong. We have this whole tape that plays in our head. Right? Now, how many of you have done this before where you have an argument with someone and then you start replaying the whole argument in your head all over again. How many of you have done that kind of thing? That really fun activity that's very, very, uh, makes us feel really mature, right? <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, because that's a completely useless thing. If you cannot control something, then you don't have to worry because you, you can't control it anyways. <laughs> if you can't control it, no need to worry. If you can't control it, no need to worry. So just something for us to think about. So when our mind is back and forth, and you know, we worry about things that aren't, our mind is great at coming up with all kinds of scenarios that aren't even gonna happen. 
Oh, what if this goes on for another five years? Oh, then I might get sick. Oh, then I might lose my job. Oh, and this, oh, and that. Oh, it's not even happened. Oh, let me just stop worrying about it. Because usually it's never as bad as we imagine it to be, correct? <laughs> Would you agree with that? That's usually never as bad as we think it's going to be. The mind just makes something huge in our head, but that's not even reality. That's not even reality. So mindfulness is about becoming aware of our thoughts and emotions and bringing our mind to the present moment. The present moment is what we have. We don't need to worry about, we can plan and prepare for the future and just don't need to worry about stuff. Easier said than done, I know, I know. It's not like I'm in that always Zen and calm state where I'm not worrying about stuff. I do too. So what does it really mean to be, to bring mindfulness into education? How can we bring mindfulness into education? I think one very important thing for everyone, especially for those who are in a teaching position, who are educators. I think it's really important that we understand that as educators, we're not only communicating information, data, and knowledge and research. We're doing a lot more than that. And what does that mean we're doing a lot more than that? Well, we're also communicating a portion of who we are. Our own character is also being communicated at the time we're communicating knowledge and information right? That is happening. And I think we all are, you know, we've all experienced situations in our life where people have told us to do something, especially those in leadership positions, and they're not doing it themselves. And that just feels terrible, doesn't it? And so as educators, you know that when you're up there, you might think that, well, you know, I'm not here to be a character example for students. I'm just here to teach. That's what they pay me for. And that's what I'm doing. Sure. Sure. That's very, very true. But that's not the, obviously the ideal attitude. I think we have more of a response with just the fact that we're in a leader, we're in an education role, a role of an educator. It automatically, it automatically means we also need to lead by example of our character, of our behavior, because whatever behavior we're going to demonstrate, whatever character we're going to demonstrate when we're up there, the students are going to absorb that. And if they go into the teaching profession, then they're going to communicate the same way. They're going to take a piece of us with them. So we want to ask ourselves, you know, what piece of ourselves are we giving to those individuals? I think we can all remember I think we can all remember all the good teachers we have, we had even in our you know, second, third, fourth standard, right? I think we, I can remember the face of all the teachers I liked <laughs> that were nice, caring, and we can all remember, especially the teachers that weren't nice, that weren't caring. Like they, le le they left a very deep and powerful impression in our mind. So let's ask ourselves, what is the impression we want to leave in the minds of students because we are giving a piece of ourselves to them and we are shaping who they are. We're shaping their personality, their behavior, their character. So even though we didn't sign up to be a role model, but I feel that a teacher automatically is a role model. You know, I think most of you are familiar with the text, the Bhagavad Gita, and there's actually a really interesting verse there about leadership, believe it or not. And it says that, you know, in there, it's, there's a verse that says that whatever great personalities do, everyone else follows their example. And I feel that an education, an educator is a great personality because they're responsible for training the youth, right? So I think that's really important that we, when we stand up there, when we get up there to really think about what example am I setting for the folks that I'm gonna teach and especially now, during this time of COVID, during this time of COVID, which is going on so much longer than we expected and probably going to go on for a little longer, we are all struggling because our work and our personal life, the boundaries have completely blurred. Basically, boundaries have ceased to exist. 
right? Boundaries don't exist. Like you could be working from your desk, your dining table, and then you're eating breakfast and lunch and continue to work. There is no like leaving your work or leaving your school. Everything is from home. You have multiple family members at home and it's just hard to concentrate and focus and not being able to interact with other students or for, if you're faculty, being able to interact with your colleagues. That's also very, very incredibly stressful. You're just at home all the time. Human interaction is something we all need, definitely need. It's a very important aspect of our life. So I think it's really important, all of us, especially educators, but for everyone, what it means to bring mindfulness into education is that is the development of empathy. Right? Basically, which means, mm -hmm. yes. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, no, we are short of time. Uh, the topic is very interesting and people are immersed into it. Uh, but uh, I request you to please summarize it so that we can you know, work out with other speakers also who are in this time. We have very less time. Okay, sure. How much time do I have? Just so I know. Just give me the amount of time I have, please. Actually, your time is uh, over. You, are, you have already exceeded your time. Uh, please, you can, you can continue, but please summarize it as soon as possible. Okay, I thought I actually had another 20 minutes, by the way. <laughs> That's what I was told. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, so I'll go ahead and summarize. One yes. thing is, well, I will, I'll just continue where I was going. One thing as educators, I think it's really important for us to develop empathy, understand that if students aren't perform performing at the level that they are, perhaps there's, they're going through a lot of difficult situations uh, in their own life, like understanding what they're going through. And I think it's also important that we think about our communication and, and that when we communicate to think of what we're saying, how we're saying it, the impact it's going to have on those individuals and what's, how it's going to impact my relationship with them. So having mindful communication, because if we communicate in a way that creates more fear and anxiety in people's mind, we're not really doing any service to them. We're only creating more difficulty, more stress and more anxiety for them. Right now, we wanna see how we can help reduce the anxiety for each other as opposed to increasing it. And I think one simple thing is we can do is throughout our day, if we're feeling stressed and anxious, is just take five or 10 deep breaths and really try to clear the mind to close out the apps up here. We need to continue to clear out the apps to clear the traffic jam so we can reduce our stress and anxiety and we can be more focused and productive and if we can reduce our strengths and anxiety, and then naturally we can be more, you know, we can take care of our emotional health, mental health, physical health, and spiritual health. So thank you all very much. I hope you can use some of these techniques in your own everyday life, professionally and personally. Thank you very much, Mr. Dasa. It was beyond my expectations. Uh, <laughs> you have given us a completely new perspective and what a beautiful idea of bringing, you know, mindfulness into the classroom. And just I'm thinking and imagining that it, every teacher who is entering into the class is mindful and she is understanding the concepts and helping children to become uh, mindfully fit. I think we should change the entire uh, education system in coming days. I, I found the participants are uh, highly involved into this session and people are, I think people are interested to know more about uh, this mindfulness. I, okay. I request you to please share some source through which they can, you know, um, they, they can go through it and they can learn more about mindfulness. Sure. I'm going to put my website in the chat right now. It's called panditdasa.com, P-A-N-D-I-T-D-A-S-A.com. That's my website where also I have, a, you know, there's another, I wrote a book recently. It's called How to Be Mindful at Work and at Home. And if you go to my website, um, it's called Closing the Apps. <laughs> uh, so on my website, panditdasa.com, you can find the book. Um, and there's also another one where I wrote about uh, my journey into how I and why I became a monk. So if anybody wants to know more about that, both of these and other things are available on my website. So you feel free to check that out and reach out to me on LinkedIn also if you want. If anybody has any questions, 
uh, feel free to reach out to me on connect with me on LinkedIn or through my website. And I'll be happy to answer questions and connect with you. It's very interesting to know, to see this, the, the caption of the book, the name of the book, Closing the Apps. Yeah, it's called Closing the Apps. <laughs> How to be mindful <laughs> at work and at home. Yeah, we are, we are so much worried about our mobiles. For most of the time, we, do, we, we open our mobile for some work and we get engaged in some other app just by seeing the notification and other things. I think this book will be very much useful. And I appreciate that you have suggested us so many good things. I wish we can, we'll be in a position to use this. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dasa. Uh, let me continue the, uh, the uh, session. I would like to you know, uh, invite you to one of the very important uh, speaker of uh, this session. Uh, who is going to speak about the burning topic in India, that is NEP, uh, Professor Geeta Gandhi Kingdon. She is a stalwart in education and a real genius. I have been attending her sessions since four, uh, five, six years uh, when we were attending the leadership uh, program. And she is oh, wonderful when she starts speaking uh, I think I, I'm, I'm worrying more about you know, how I can you know, uh, ask her to stop because every word which she says and every sentence which comes from her mouth gives a lot of information to all of us. Thank you so much, Mr. Dasa, as well as I'm very much excited and very much, um, I feel I'm, it's a very auspicious moment for me that I'm going to introduce the lady and of course, I look up to and I'm very much inspired by this. Of course, I'm inspired with this complete family, uh, starting from Bharti ma'am, and of course, then Sunita Gandhi ma'am, then uh, Geeta ma'am. Uh, it's a privilege for me to introduce her. That uh, I interacted with her during last conferences, but I feel very limited. Uh, I will look forward to learn more from Geeta ma'am. Uh, Mrs. Geeta Gandhi, uh, she is dissipates radiance in the form of confidence, determina determination, and perseverance to achieve beyond imagination. Gita Gandhi Kingdon is a professor at the Institute of Education, University College London, where she, she holds the chair of education, economics, and international development. Prior to this, she was research fellow for 11 years at the Department of Economics, University of Oxford. She has a BSc honors in economics from the London School of Economics and MSc and D, D, uh, DPhil in Development Economics from the University of Oxford. He, her research on economics of education is based mostly on statistical analysis of education database. Uh, based on, the, on this research, she advised governments and donor agencies such as the World Bank, the European Union, and the UK government's department for the international development. In India, she has been a member of the international development. In India, she has been a member of MHRD's joint review mission of public education programs, Sarva Siksha Abhyanand, the Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhyan, and is a member of the Uttar Pradesh Secondary Education Board. In 2013, Professor Kindon received an honorary doctorate from Kingston University, London. Professor Kingdon is also a president and managing director of the board of City Montessori School, Lucknow, managing, uh, which has 57,000 students and is entered in the Guinness Book of Record as the largest city school in the world. She divides her time between the UK and India. We welcome you, Geeta Gani, ma'am. Thank you so much for, um, for this presence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that generous introduction and uh, to be following uh, Pandit Dasa and jo John Bergman. Uh, these are very hard acts to follow. Uh, we've learned so much from both the, uh, the uh, foregoing uh, presentations. And frankly, I would have loved to have learned more and heard more from both of those speakers. Um, however, my topic for today is the new education policy of India. Uh, this policy has been in the making for the past uh, four years, 
And uh, after four years of deliberations, the, the recommendations of this policy were given uh, about 500 page document after extensive consultations throughout the country. And this is the first time after 34 years that India has come up with a, a new uh, national education policy. Uh, this policy uh, document, which is the product of extensive consultation and expert uh, opinion gathering, uh, written by a group of, uh, uh, you know, eminent uh, academics and, and others, uh, has, has two sections. It has a section on school education and it has a section on higher education. The, I'm going to be speaking about the section on school education exclusively. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen. I hope that's um, visible. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the, uh, I'm just going to first talk about the main provisions of the new uh, national education policy. Uh, the first and uh, most important uh, things uh, in the policy, uh, which I will summarize are as follows. Firstly, that it talks about the uh, integration of the education of uh, what we call pre-primary education, uh, education for children aged three, four and five years old into uh, the school education system. In the public school education system in India, uh, there is no provision for uh, educating three, four and five year olds within schools. There is a separate provision called the Anganwadi system uh, that seeks to cater to the needs of this age group. Uh, but the new education policy seeks to integrate uh, the, uh, this early childhood care and education as part, as an integral part of schools. And so that's going to be quite a change. And I think that the reason for this is uh, basically the research, the gathering research, the accumulated research that suggests that, uh, well, it's a very long standing body of research, but India's policy is now acknowledging that uh, th this research, uh, particularly the work of Jim, Jim Heckman, the economist, the econometrician, in fact, whose uh, work on the Perry experiments uh, suggested that uh, early childhood interventions have very long lasting positive beneficial impacts. Uh, so uh, that is really the basis that the recognition that at this age, uh, development of um, you know, the, the mind is extremely rapid and it's an opportunity for learning that should not be lost. Uh, the second area of priority is foundational, the building up of foundational literacy and numeracy. By the time that a child enters grade three, they should have acquired foundational literacy and numeracy. Now we know from the USA report, the annual status of education report that we do appallingly badly in that department. Even children who are in, uh, you know, who are uh, 10 years old in grade five uh, in a state like Uttar Pradesh, for example, in public schools, only 12% of children of grade five, that means 10 year olds are able to do a grade three, a read a grade three level text or do uh, a division sum, which is a three digit by one digit dig division sum. So literacy and numeracy are very uh, difficult uh, areas for many, many developing countries, for most developing countries, in fact. And India's performance in the PISA test was dismal. It came last or second from last in the two subjects in which uh, young people were tested. Uh, and that was out of 74 countries. Uh, so it was a jolt. And I think the new education policy is partly a response uh, to that. The third thing that the new education policy proposes is to end the hard separation uh, within the secondary school curriculum uh, into you know, sciences, arts, or humanities, and commerce. At the moment in India, secondary school children, particularly at the, in the last two years before uh, they go to university, in those two years, which are called intermediate in India, or it's called grade 11 and 12, in that uh, part of the secondary school system, the children are uh, are obliged to choose either science side subjects or humanity subjects or commercial, commerce related subjects. And they cannot choose combination, subject combinations that draw subjects from these, these three different areas. So the new education policy proposes to end that hard separation, encourage more broad based learning, more experiential learning, sports and arts integrated learning. 
The fourth thing that the policy proposes to do is to integrate vocational education into the regular school curriculum. Uh, basically, there is a stigma attached in India uh, to vocational education uh, such that there is a perception that general academic education is, um, is respected and vocational education is a poor second cousin. And so this, um, the idea that every single child in a year will come to school without their school bag, without their textbooks, uh, for two weeks, they will learn some skill or another. And so because every single child will be exposed to uh, some kind of vocational skill, it would be uh, a stigma free way of uh, introducing um, something which children can learn to do with their hands. Uh, fifthly, uh, the new education policy uh, seeks a very uh, fundamental change of uh, assessments uh, system, uh, the examination system uh, and the testing regime. So basically what they say is that assessment should be for learning rather than assessment of learning uh, in and of itself. Uh, Assessments should focus on, uh, uh, you know, testing core competencies. There needs to be a reduced emphasis on rote learning and on the private tutoring industry. Uh, there, uh, we need to develop more higher order thinking skills. Uh, the board exams at the grade 10 and 12 level uh, are going to be uh, set at two different levels. One would be a standard level and one would be a higher level, which would allow children who are bright to demonstrate their achievement at higher levels. Uh, so for example, a grade 10 exam in maths is going to happen at two levels, a standard maths and a higher maths of grade 10. So children can choose which, which of these two levels they would like to take the exam at. Then they want to propose the greater use of multiple choice questions, objective questions, and uh, uh, some, of course, descriptive questions as well. Uh, and one could talk a lot more about each of these things, but I'm giving you a very broad brush um, introduction. Sixth emphasis of the uh, new education policy is around teachers. Uh, so far, there is not a uh, proper performance appraisal of teachers. The new education policy proposes to introduce a merit-based structure of tenure, promotion, and salaries. Uh, where, whereby there would be multiple levels within each uh, teacher stage so that there are opportunities for teachers to uh, have professional development. So it's not the case that they enter as a teacher and they retire, you know, 35 or 40 years later as a teacher. And that's the only designation that they, that they have, except for those uh, when they're the most senior person in their school, they, they, call, they get called the head teacher. So other than that, there are no professional development stages at the moment. And so the new education policy proposes to introduce those. And um, it proposes to have a system which incentivizes and recognizes outstanding teachers. Um, uh, seventh, and to me, uh, really the important piece is the seventh one, which is the recognition that at the moment, the government is the funder of schools. It is also the operator, or if you like, the provider of schools. It is um, also the regulator of schools. And finally, it is also the assessor of schools. And this has led to deep conflicts of interest. And so the new education policy proposes the separation of the powers of government, uh, you know, which are currently concentrated all in this one entity, which is the state government's education department, uh, which, as I said, is operator, regulator, assessor, and of course, government this funder. So, uh, you know, one can give examples of how this these conflicts of interest have stymied the education sector. The policy, the new education policy, proposes the establishment uh, of a new entity called the State School Standards Authority, which would ensure quality standards on a few parameters. It is suggested that it would be light but tight, tight regulation, which would be equally applicable to government schools and private schools. They also propose to set up an independent assessment body called Parak, uh, which would have both, uh, you know, which would which would uh, test children's learning achievement levels for both private schools and public schools. Currently, government uh, exercises of assessing children's learning levels are uh, restricted to public schools only as if uh, you know, uh, private school children are children are from some other land. So I think it's a very good move to, uh, to shift that and, and to, to have a, a more symmetrical approach. 
Now, I think uh, if we come to an analyze what the policy, uh, you know, how effective the policy is likely to be, I think it misses the heart of the problem in school education, which is the extremely poor delivery of learning outcomes, especially in public schools. And it seems to me that the main problem is a poor work culture and a paucity of effort. There's a lack of an effective system of accountability for teachers and schools. They face no reprimand, including, for example, dismissal for teachers or the closing down of schools if they completely fail to perform their duties. Um, if you look at the district information system on education data, the DICE data, and all uh, elementary schools in the country have to fill in the DICE data format, and there are about uh, 1.5 million elementary schools in India, uh, uh, out of which about 10 point, uh, 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 well, 1.05 uh, million schools, just over 1 million schools are government schools, uh, government run schools. So the DICE data uh, shows, if you look at the period 2010 to 2017, it shows that enrollment in public schools fell by uh, 24 million and enrollment in uh, uh, private schools rose by uh, 21 million uh, children over this short seven year period. Uh, cost effectiveness and value for money from public expenditure on education are extremely low. One could show, I could show you tables, but I'm not sure that my time would allow that. In many situations, this, the, in many states of India, the situation is quite catastrophic. It says that mean enrollment per public school in 2017, <clears throat> for example, in a state like Himachal Pradesh, it was just 34 children. Average enrollment in school as a whole in the sure, state of sure Himachal Pradesh, is 34 children per school. In Uttarakhand, 39 children per school. Jammu and Kashmir, 40 children. Madhya Pradesh, 63 children per school. And in Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest state of the country, with a population of uh, uh, 220 million people, uh, the average uh, enrollment in the school as a whole in public schools is 97 children per school. So you can imagine the, uh, the cost effectiveness of such a situation. I've just highlighted, this is from the, this is straight from the DICE data summary tables put out by the government. And if I, I've just put a circle around the one which says pupil teacher ratio in elementary, you can see that in the year 2005 or six, um, the pupil teacher ratio in public elementary schools was 36 and has fallen to 24 over uh, a 10 year period. So uh, you can, that suggests what a, uh, an exodus there has been from the public elementary school system uh, away from public elementary schools and into private schools. If we look at uh, school attendance rates, if we just for a moment concentrate on the, the, the column in the middle where, uh, you know, this is a survey I did, a small survey of 115 schools across five districts that I did in Uttar Pradesh in the year 2017. Well, almost 2018, January 2018, uh, December 2017. You can see that the uh, in July the enrollment of teach uh, uh, per appointed teacher enrollment was 36 children, and uh, in December uh, it was 35. So it was still roughly the same. You know, enrollment had fallen just a little bit, and then by December the head count, the actual number of children attending. Per, tea, per you know per appointed teacher was 12.6 children mm -hmm. so you can see that the actual attendance rate is a fraction a small one third roughly of the uh, uh, enrollment rate teacher absence rates this was this is from a survey done by the world bank in um, in 2010 we don't have more recent figures one would love to have a, a, a teacher absence survey but the government uh, is not uh, very comfortable probably in doing such a survey and we can see that in a state like bihar the absence rate has fallen teacher absence rate fell from nearly 40% to 28% but even 28% is more than once every four days a teacher being absent um uh, in Uttar Pradesh, it is uh, in the year 2010, the attendance absence rate is 31%. One day out of every three days, roughly, the teacher is absent. Nationally, that figure is about a quarter. A quarter of the teachers are absent on any given day. So it's extremely high rates of teacher absence. And if you like, um, uh, you know, a paucity of teacher effort, a, a, a poor work culture, um, 
uh, not a very strong work ethic. Now, if we look at what some of the political factors are, the governance issues are behind it, we can see teachers as a percentage of the total membership of the lower house of the state legislature. Uh, this is to illustrate from one state, the state of Uttar Pradesh. We don't have this data because India has a uh, st structure of federal government, uh, that is the central government of India, and then state governments. So this is from one state to illustrate the point that nearly 17% of the legislators in this state, the largest state of India, Uttar Pradesh, are people whose occupation is teaching. So teachers have a very high penetration into uh, the, uh, the, uh, the corridors of power. Um, this is because of a constitutional guarantee that teachers will have guaranteed representation in the upper house of the state legislature, which has led to a culture of political activism such that even in the lower house, which is where there is no uh, quota for teachers, in the upper house there is a quota. One twelfth of the membership of the upper house must compulsorily be made up of people who are, who are teachers. But in the lower house, there is no such uh, 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 quota or representation, uh, reserved representation. But nevertheless, you saw that nearly 17% of the lower house is made up of teachers. Uh, sorry, the upper house is made up of teachers. And in the lower house, 6.5% as this table shows. Uh, 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 the, the connectedness of teachers to, teach, uh, to politicians is extremely high. So I've circled the thing there. So it shows the percentage of teachers who say that they have met or they personally know a teacher MLC. And we can see that in government schools, that figure is about 23% of teachers who have personally met or personally know a teacher member of the legislative council. In aided schools, is 48% of teachers and so on. Overall, about 33% of teachers are well connected. Now, the new education policy recognizes the empty of public schools and the poor learning levels. But the solutions that it offers, such as, for example, the merging or consolidation of schools that are that have become very small, you know, consolidating two or three schools together, merging them together. It, this is one solution that suggests, then it suggests the creation of school complexes and additional teacher trainings. Um, you know, these things address the symptom rather than the root cause of the problem. Deep down, it seems to me, it is the absence of any teacher accountability whatsoever that is behind the poor educational outcomes in public schools. Now, I really don't believe that the emptying phenomenon, the emptying of government schools, this phenomenon will go away after you do school, school consolidation. And even if you were to impart additional skills to teachers, because they will not you know, it won't help if teachers don't won't use those skills, or if they remain chronically absentee, they may be highly skilled people, if you've trained them, but, you know, if they're absentee, it's of no use to the children. So accountability is mentioned very briefly in passing in the new education policy, but it's not at all center stage. So if it is the case that teacher accountability in public schools is politically a non-starter, for example, if the government finds it difficult to have the spine to confront the teacher unions and to bring them to heel, it is time to confront this fact for what it is. If we choose to look the other way, we only commit ourselves to condemning yet more generations of students to poor outcomes. I could say a lot more, but I think I will stop there in view of the time and I'd be very happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Geeta, ma'am. Uh, it was truly uh, eye-opening. You have cleared the air and instilled I just stop hope. The share. Sorry, just one moment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it was truly an eye-opening, ma'am. You have cleared the air and instilled hope among all of us. We can't uh, hear you, Mr. Mr. Muhammad Latif Khan. Am I audible now, ma'am? Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, the points which was discussed was really very good. Assessment for learning, not for assessment of learning. The NEP is talking about. I think there is a lot of hope and expectations from the NEP. I, I wish this the, the discussions which we are having these days and the points which uh, just now Gita Ma'am has shared with us are going to really give a lot of inputs to us and that will uh, I hope that will instill uh, a confidence in the system 
and the the way you know the things are you know design getting designed is to emphasize learning and to develop thinking skills and particularly for the teachers it is you know uh, performance appraisal uh, is being done here and lot of professional developments are expected from this and the one of the basic thing is the conflict of interest which was there uh, is will not be there there will no more be there and i hope these things will uh, suddenly help us and there are no doubt there are few concerns that has to be addressed i hope uh, the, these things are being you know worked out uh, in a, anyhow this very soon this is going to be implemented before that things may take shape thank you very much uh, geeta ma'am for your inputs now moving forward we will be you know uh, introducing to a new speaker for the, our next speaker our next speaker mr john yo he is from singapore uh, i would like to invite the expert in creativity creativity john yo founded at impact a research and training firm specializing in disruptive innovation since 2017 Currently he is also the headmaster of Singapore Prep International School in Korea. Mr. John has was the first Asian recipient of the Ruth B. Noller Research Grant award for his research on problem finding in creative inquiry in 2017. This annual award by the US Creative Education Foundation supports emerging paradigm shifting research with high potential for impact in the field of creativity. Mr. Jo John Yo we would like to welcome you for the presentation thank you so much for your presence Hi everyone 안녕하세요 大家下午好 good afternoon selamat pagi malam my name is John and it's my great pleasure to be back again on the this at leadership conference I'm very thankful that two years ago I was invited to be the keynote speaker, and the topic then given to me was towards a stress-free education, looking to Singapore. For those friends of you who were there, hello, hello, hello! I'm back, and it was so much fun. But the fact is, in today's world. What do we understand as stress? Is school or coming to school a form of stress? Do we even consider that not being able to attend school could be huge stress, not just to parents, not just to the neighborhood, perhaps even a big stress point. to the economy not just to the country to the city but globally covid has taught us a lot of lessons my dear friends before i start allow me to pose this question unlike the other speakers so thank you john thank you gita it's so good to see you again i don't want to use powerpoint slides because today's world requires us to find new ways to inspire change and i want to hinge on my part to allow us to take some time to examine why change it is important to say change but why change if i look at change from a perspective of globalization and new liberalism then i look at innovation as an artifact of how change is critical to shift the new paradigm of world views forward and hey since i am blessed to be able to speak from home allow me to pose this question and dear participants if you're there join me in putting in the chat box in zoom your response and your thoughts since my topic is about change and creativity i got this do you know what this is this is my dyson hair <laughs> try it help me understand this my dear friends put it in your chat box 
type in there, what has a Dyson hair dryer got to do with plants? Let me say it again. What might be the connection between innovation, products, household goods, or specifically to Dyson hair dryer got to do with an air plant? I love to see your responses. If you're still awake, type in there. Let's read out some of your thoughts. Whoa, I like what I'm reading. Alignment. Hmm, what else? Drying things up, power up, yes. Cutting scientific logic, yes. Go on. What are you cutting? What do you want to cut? This is a plant living. This is a non-living thing. Out of the box. Woo. What's the box? How might you define the box? Innovation, yes, indeed. But what does innovation got to do with plants and products? Grooming, grooming, yes. Grooming, fostering, inspiring minds, education, schools, so much. What else? Oh, how air ships things. That's right. And create movement. Keep it going, guys. Keep it going. Thank you. Sustainability and creativity. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Indeed. All oh, innovation yes. needs to be purposeful. All <laughs> innovation needs to be purposeful. But my dear friends, as we drive more policy change, and as we look at how curriculum or policy national level changes impact on ground level, let us not forget the purpose of change. Today's topic where I talk about empowering change. Yes, indeed, I'm thankful that you talk about powering up. What drives power? I go back to a good 20 odd years ago when I started as a science teacher. I'm a zoologist by training, but by hobbies, I enjoy plants. And I want to share this. Yes, without indeed, I'm thankful that you talk. Whoa, without PowerPoint slides, I'm sharing with you my magic. This is an air plant. As a biology teacher, we teach students that plants require sunlight, plants require nutrients, plants require water, and of course, minerals for photosynthesis to take place. But this is a very unusual plant. No, it's not a pineapple. This is an air plant. And all it does it really is the roots allow it to absorb the necessary nutrients that it can. And all we have to do is just leaving it and hanging it and misting it once in a while. The fact is to power growth, to power change. And the reality of change is that we cannot predict the growth rate or the transpiration rate or how plants itself can twirl or untwirl itself. And this to me is a marvelous plant because change, while it's inevitable, change, while it could be fostered, but change reveals surprises. And I'm saying this because education today requires us to innovate and surprise learners. Why am I saying this? Two years ago, when I was the keynote speaker, at the same conference, I asked this question. What can we teach that the internet cannot offer? Let me ask the same question again. What can you as teachers, what can we as educationists, what can you as policymakers teach that the internet does not offer? My research on 21st century skills highlight one critical touch point. A lot of the 21st century learning embedded within curriculum often are taught. They are taught. We teach students creative thinking. We teach students the ability to critique, 
to think critically, critical thinking. We teach students to collaborate, especially in times like this where we use technology as a platform to empower new ways of thinking, to empower change. And we teach students to think globally because today, when the world is flattening with technology, what is new out there? But my dear friends, what is taught oftentimes is not taught. What we can teach may not be learned. And that's the reality that we as educators need to recognize that. Let me say that again. What is taught in our standard old ways of teaching, in our textbooks, in our curriculum, in our lesson plans, oftentimes is not caught or learned. And that is worrying because I question the relevance of schools today. I even question how we as educators still serve that purpose to ignite learning. If what is taught is not caught or learned, then clearly we can be redundant. But the fact is, we are human beings with emotions. We are able to situate cognition in the tools, in the textbooks, in the way that we inspire better ways of allowing children to envision the future. We clearly can create artificial products that looks good, but not tangible. Because after a while, it does not grow, it does not change, it does not inspire us to look at this differently. The human mind is wired for novelty. Let me say that again, my dear friends. The human mind is wired for novelty. And that's why change is critical. And change is critical because we need to inspire better ways to change, more meaningful and impactful ways to change. And that to me is where we need to learn both the art and the science of teaching. But what hinges on good learning? Let me say that question again. What hinges on good learning? Not just good teaching, but good learning. Allow me to share some principles through my plants. Yay, my plants, my plants. About what I think are timeless principles of learning. Since I'm blessed to be able to now speak with you and to learn from you, so please continue to put in the chat group. The mind is wired to enjoy. But if you don't think and if you don't process, our mind will start meandering and that's dangerous. Today where we are flooded and I want to thank uh, our earlier speaker. Our mind has so much active apps working. We tend to lose sight and we lose focus and our attention span Narrows. So allow me, please, to continue to challenge you. What new thoughts inspire you to grow? What new ways can we as teachers learn, unlearn, and relearn? Plants are my way of constantly telling me how I, as a person, as a father, as a teacher, as a school principal, as a dancer, yeah, for those who remember me back in 2018, we were dancing, <laughs> right? But what inspires me to grow as a person is constantly to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Plants like this. In Singapore, we're coming to the Lunar Chinese New Year. Plants like this are what we have all the time. But even within here, how we allow the buds to grow, how we allow water as a constant supply, how we even engineer plants um, aesthetically pleasing is a type of innovation. But you know, I have one strange hobby. 
I love to pick up plants that people abandon. And this is one plant. Oh my gosh. Whoa. This is my big baby that allows me to keep looking at how we can, as educators, be patient. Be patient with growth. Creative change should not be temporal. It should not be a fad. And it shouldn't just be creating new trends for the sake of changing and challenging things. But as you timelessly look at how plants grow, you realize that as this plant was first abandoned by the roadside, I picked this plant up. And after half a year, the new shoots and buds inspire me. The conditions of how a plant grows is similar. Air, where we get oxygen, through photosynthesis, we get new oxygen, we recycle carbon dioxide, the soil and all. But the conditions of learning are similar. What might be the soil in these times of change? Are the types of minerals, the kind of investment of curriculum, the type of pedagogy, the way that we teach inspire better ways of understanding. And that's why Madam Gita's point is so powerful because we talk about assessment for learning, not just assessment of learning, but assessment for learning. We talk about creativity and change. And clearly there needs to be a signposting of where we hope education will head to it. That's why I'm constantly on the lookout for national policy changes. In Singapore, our curriculum review happens every six years. And every six years, we look at relevancy of learning. We see what are the future trends that needs to change policies so that at ground level, learning still becomes relevant. Learning becomes more student-centered. And learning becomes one that we stop telling students what to learn, but encourage them to find their own ways to learn. That to me is a lot more purposeful. That to me is a lot more purposeful. As we look at the triangulation from national level policies, and that's why I'm thankful for the recent updates because your national policy sets a good forward direction for people to look forward. But at the same time, while the different types of plants requires different types of aeration, different needs, so do our learners. Different learning needs, different child's progress. And more importantly, how might we contextualize learning to inspire the students to take action? My dear friends, COVID, clearly offers to us a chance in a lifetime to make that difference. Today, me and my team work hard to challenge how students themselves can become How students themselves absorb the school culture, take into consideration their identity, who they are, why are they born today, what struggles do they go through. But more importantly, that curriculum needs to challenge the way that students view the world and what is their place to make that unique difference. Creativity is just a lot of good things that's fun and beautiful if we do not inspire them to find new ways to know themselves. More importantly, how might they themselves become agents of change? Please, my dear friends, put aside the old notion that students themselves need to sit down, be quiet, and just absorb all I said. Please put aside the notion that good students are those who just perform academically well. Because as change agents, we need to recognize that all of us, number one, are creative. Number two, all of us have the ability to change, but giving the plants, just like giving our students the environment to know themselves, to understand learning deeply is important. 
My last call to all of us here is this. How might we as educationists be in touch on ground with the learner's needs and at the same time be aware and to be the voice of change at national policy levels? This is important because no one can claim to be an authority of the future if we don't ourselves start to co-create. And this is why I think teachers are the most exciting career because we put aside what we think we know, but be open and willing to co-learn from them. Who says I'm the master of my plants? The plants teach me a lot. The venation, the plants lacking phosphorus, the plants require different environment. Oh, my dear friends, education is such a calling. And I'm thankful that we're here to learn from one another. I pray that as we rethink about how education and plants drive change, just as Dyson is expensive because it drives new ways of looking at how we blow our hair, how we style ourselves. But seemingly, how the technology itself oftentimes allow us to also learn from plants. Plants, animals, living things offer bioengineering concepts. That's why biomimicry. That's why plants allow us to understand resilience. But at the same time, because we are all wired to grow. Mr. John, thank you very much. Very quick. Thank you. Yeah. I I'm done. <laughs> I think uh, I am biased because I have, I have allowed you more time because your topic was so interested. Uh, you got me thinking, John. Mesmerizing and igniting, I must say. <laughs> I remember you uh, the, the last time in 2018 when you came to Lucknow for the same conference. You made everyone dance in the auditorium on your tune. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mr. John, uh, as you said, education requires innovation. And really, uh, the, the, the examples which were given through plants are really uh, presentable and uh, lively. And we, I think uh, uh, the input which I have taken it seriously here is First of all, we need to teach our students think globally because the world is becoming flat and we need to you know, think in that direction and we need to make our children think in that, that, that direction. And as you, as you said, Mr. John, that human mind is wired for novelty. It is designed for innovations, growth, development. These are the basic things required in the education system. I hope, I hope things will change as you were talking more about change. I remember the quote from Einstein. He said that doing same thing and different, expecting different results is an insanity. So we need to change our my thought process. And I hope in time things will take better shape in the education system. With the new NEP, I expect there are going to be a lot of change in the system. Thank you, John. I could barely settle down from this thrilling ride of creativity from Mr. John Yo. We are very much thankful to you, sir. But the show must go on, and we would have a wonderful topic about helping schools create a culture of world peace and love. All this while we have seen this at CMS Lucknow, and now I am delighted to see Rosalene So from South Korea sharing her views and experiences in this regard. Rosaline is a general director of International Law Department of SWPL Western Busan Branch, Korean language teacher of international people <coughs> certified by the Minister of Culture, Sports and Tourism, Republic of Korea. Rosaline speaks uh, and shares her views on this uh, theme of leading the way. I welcome you, Mr. Rosaline. Ms. Rosaline. Okay. Uh, good morning, warm hearted innovators. Greeting from HWPL. And thank you for inviting this roundtable 
especially the Dr. Jagdish Gandhi and Sunita Gandhi and Dr. Gita Kingdom Gandhi and all CMS member family. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Rosalind Sa, a director of International Law Department of HWPL, the International Peace NGO. It's my pleasure to be at here to talk about the, how creating a culture of world peace is important in today's world. During the pandemic, our daily lives have been uh, destroyed. Even in the most powerful nation has gone through lockdown, then let's imagine what would have happened in the nations which are going through war. Even in this pandemic, there are attacks in Afghanistan. I got one letter from my friend in Afghanistan. The letter is that we are suffering from the security situation here, especially in Kabul, in capital of Afghanistan, the situation is not good. We had several attacks and implosions. This situation is really difficult to bear. It is a harsh time, enough without this conflict. We must achieve so, we must achieve actually world peace as fast as we can do, restore the daily life of people, especially for our children. I'd like to start with a question. How was your day today? Okay. Then let's move on to yesterday. How was it? In my case, it was just an ordinary day. I woke up in the morning, ate breakfast with my family, worked, had a lunch and walked I'd away. Like to start with the I'm sure that How this routine it? might not extremely change. In the big picture, your daily life could be similar, right? If you think of a, if, if you think of it as a children's daily life, they must be studying. Children will be able to make a lot of progress by learning from school. But what if we go back to the 900s, 1900s? It is a long time when war broke out and the whole world discriminated against each other, hated each other, and thought. They were enemies. How did education come about at this time? In the midst of a lot of chaos, children had to be thrown into livelihood immediately and they were sent to war. In education, the phenomenon of teaching ideology was prevalent. This learning had turned their enemies into monsters People didn't consider the enemies as humans anymore. And during this COVID-19 pandemic, these discriminations are happening all around the world. However, 100 years later, we have been running for a long time not to make the same mistake. Reflecting on our past mistakes, there are still many lacking things to say that peace has come true. But the clear point is that the steps for peace have continued and are being built up little by little over a long time. Through this process, I think we can get a daily life that we can call ordinarily and our children can get a real education to overcome this pandemic. Peace is always threatened even in a small crisis. So we have to keep moving toward the peace. And one of the organizations participating in that step is us, HWPL. We are the international peace organization and also a non-government organization that is part of the active UN Economic and Social Council. The idea of a higher level culture which transcends religion ideology, ethnicity, and nations. We suggest the guideline of humanity to promote harmonious coexistence and development of the international society. I'm in the international law department. So what I want to focus today's talk is international law initiative. I would like to introduce DPCW, which means Declaration of World Peace and Cessation of War, the core of our international law initiative. 
It consists of 10 articles and 38 clauses. The DPCW is created by the renowned international law experts, and its goal is to eradicate the structural causes of the violent conflicts and its categories are divided into three parts. So first category is preventing all conflicts and it contains article one to five. And secondly, article six to seven is included in uh, serving conflict category. And last part is achieving a peaceful world and leaving peace as a legacy for the future generations. To help your understanding, I'd like to show you the short video. <laughs> Article 1. The Threat or Use of Force <laughs> Article 2. Reduce War Potential and Repurpose Weapons to Benefit Humanity Article 3. Develop friendly relations and prohibit acts of aggression. Article 4. Prohibit coercion against internationally recognized state boundaries. Article 5. Ensure the right to self-determination of peoples or states. Article 6. Settle international disputes through peaceful means. Article 7. Acknowledge the right to self-defense. Article 8. Foster religious freedom. Article 9. Promote peaceful coexistence amongst religious and ethnic groups. Article 10. Spread a culture of peace. The signatories to the present declaration do hereby urge that all efforts So, how does the PCW relate related to uh, today's topic, the importance of the creating a culture of world peace? It is in the value of the DPCW bottom-up approach. We HWPL engaged substantially with the civil society actors because peace cannot be sustained only through the voices of elites and institutionalized processes. Going beyond all divisional lines, HWPL suggests a civil society function in peace building, which aims at the implementation of citizens' advocacy and the voluntary 
practice of the democratic values, thus fostering a culture of peace. And because we all belong to citizens regardless of status, for example, presidents will become a citizen when their term ends. Bottom-up approach is an ideal value-seeking system. Let's find out the value of the DPCW more specifically. For example, Article 7 of DPCW is right to self-defense. The right to self-defense literally refers to the right to protect yourself. But rights can be exercised when you know that you have rights. So we are letting everyone know that these rights apply to them and we are suggesting how to protect them. In that way, it is necessary to grow the consciousness of civil society so that citizens can protect their rights so that they can monitor institutions that implement and lead international laws. That's why we concentrate on education of a culture of world peace. The first thing that I'd like to introduce the DPCW Handbook Discussion Project. Please look at the book designed with a symbol of a peace bird. We thought it was important to improve citizens' awareness of peace and human rights just as the active independence movement led by Mahatma Gandhi Ji was carried out by citizens. I believe you will understand the importance of the power of citizens more than any other countries. Under these objectives, we are not just aiming to pass the DPCW as a resolution, but we are right. This DPCW is needed and what it has a crucial meaning to our lives. Learning and sharing the spirit in this resolution. As a result of this thought, we hope that the time for discussions on peace and human rights and with the DPCW will definitely be of significant value with the students who will be the ma mainstream of the civil society in the future. This project is currently being carried out four times at 13 universities currently. Law school students are mentees and law professors are leading the discussion as mentors. Here are the participants' comments in the third discussion of the topic was DPCW Article 3, Friendly Relations and the Prohibition of Acts of Aggression. He's a, a prof, a Bila Masum, who is an assistant professor in Zanat University. Unlike his first and second HWPL handbook discussion projects, Five different groups, A to E, conducted the third discussion project in the form of research and presentation on five different topics. And I am happy to see that students have developed critical and analytics to explain its close of the DPCW to students to help prepare for the remaining discussions. And the DPCW handbook discussion project is a project that requires students' general thoughts and broad perspectives as well as presenting on specific topics. If you can find the presentations from each section in this debate webinar, it will be an educational textbook that will be available to international law professors and law professors that he said that its section should be prepared to related to the peace and international law emphasized by the DPCW. Mm -hmm. Take some time to think about the reasons why DPCW is needed and then talk about the international laws such as the UN Charter and the Declaration of Friendships to be prepared by each group are suggested to include a part uh, that addresses why the PCW is needed in accordance with the provisions of the PCW. Excuse me. Look at this. Uh, These uh, are students' uh, comments in the first discussion. The topic was the PCW Article 4, State Boundaries. 
Group D that he, uh, they seem to illu illustrate the potential of the DPCW and wall a bit in law and political reality. And group C that the comparison between the occurrence of illegal and legal coercion and the provisions of the international law was good. Is a Roman who is also a law student in Dhaka University in Bangladesh. And I was really interested in the comparison of existing legal mechanisms of the DPCW to Group C, but I think it could have been more sophisticated in how DPCW could strengthen existing international law, including coercion in material terms. However, the analysis is the occurrence of illegal and legal coercion is really impressive. Here is the other project for DPCW education, cultural expression of the DPCW. It is a project currently in the planning stage, deliver DPCW to everyone and think about its meaning and value because we believe that DPCW is not only for legal professionals, but also necessary for all of us. This will be what you see on the slide. We are currently planning in the context looking for schools where we can work together. My department is dealing with the international law, but we are not just focusing on the effectiveness of law, but on joining everyone in achieving peace in a waking spirit. So we have an, we'll continue to go forward. And I believe that we can True me, true peace only when everyone is the bright light. So I feel this time is very precious. <clears throat> if we all make efforts to a lot to think about peace and share its value, we will definitely reach what we want. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosaline. Thank you, Rosaline, for making us feel like sitting in CMS school, even though we are at our place with all your... <laughs> <information> <laughs> <on> <laughs> <laughs> learning about world peace. I wish all of us were taught like this in our schools, but it's not too late. Let's take a pledge that we will incorporate all the learnings from Rosaline in our school policies. Thank you very much. Now, after encapsulating the essence of this round table, we have Dr. Rachel from Samo among us. Dr. Rachel Tofu yeah. is an associate professor in inclusive uh, education yeah. at the National University of Samo. She has been much involved in development of education, course courses both at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. She is currently teaching postgraduate courses offered for teachers and education leaders at the National University of Sama. Her research interest includes policy for inclusive education, transfer of training, teacher development, <laughs> teacher <laughs> mentoring, and parental involvement in children's education. She has published peer-reviewed journal papers on this topic in addition to other contemporary education issue. She also holds a master education in studies, diploma in teaching English as second language and diploma in education, educating students with special teaching needs. We welcome you, Ms. Rasella. Thank you. Saloma from Samoa. Thanks for the, for the opportunity to present in this um, virtual conference. Yeah, I am privileged. Um, the title, as you can see on the screen, serve to lead, lead to serve, a leader in a servant shoes. Now the overarching theme, power of change inspire the teacher within, and the session, a new education is very important to me. Why? Uh, because I'm a firm believer uh, in the influence, the, the influential power of the, of the teacher on the learners that they teach. Why they, this bold statement? Because I was first a learner and 
now a teacher. Now, the question I wish to pose at this point, how do you wish to be remembered by your followers or your students when you are long gone? I'd like to uh, share my experience um, briefly as a learner and then as a teacher. Um, I do not have much uh, favorable um, memories of teachers that I have passed through during my schooling years, because it appears like a number of teachers do not seem to understand my own individualistic um, personality. And I never made it to my final year at college. Why? Because I was uh, the teacher who was supposed to be uh, taking us um, through that um, time uh, dismissed me from school because I came in one week after class has started. And that was the end of my year 13 or form six uh, at college. And I, and I uh, ended up at the teacher's training college, which was not my, my choice. But um, one may ask, why, why are you still here today? Because um, when I graduated from teacher's college, I was uh, placed uh, in, a, in a primary school uh, to teach five-year-olds, and that was very challenging for me. However, I realized that I could make a difference in the lives of these individuals. And when parents came to me and uh, thanked me and appreciated the work that I did, thanking me for teaching their little ones how to read, how to write, that was an inspiration for me. So for me, I decided that was, that was my calling. And for me, that was the deciding factor, the fact that I could make a difference in somebody else's life. Um, the 21st century um, has a lot of challenges as we notice. And as um, covered by a number of presentations, the COVID-19 is one of the uh, challenges that we are facing now in our education system. And I believe uh, we need teachers at this point with a mindset, uh, teachers who are willing to be in the system, teachers who are passionate. Um, and as a teacher educator, I believe there is a need uh, for teacher education programs to be re-examined re from the perspective of serving, of being a servant. That's the concept of servant leadership. This presentation will focus on servant leadership in relation to teacher education. Because I believe that servant leadership should allow teacher edu education, um, teacher educators to become effective, to become caring and moral leaders in the future. Now, what is servant leadership? It has its grounded in the Bible in the form of Jesus, the King of Kings who practiced this type of leadership while he was on earth 2000 years ago. One of his acts as a servant was where he watched it, that his disciples feed in John as, as is found in John 13, 12 to 16. And he says like when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he said, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so for that is what I am now that I, your Lord and teacher, had washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So this is very important uh, concept for me. Growing up in a Christian um, uh, society, I was grounded in this type of, uh, this type of uh, principle, this type of uh, uh, concept. And um, so Robert uh, Kiffner Greenleaf, 1904-1990, coined this um, uh, concept later. And according to him, according to Greenleaf, to parents, we are there, sisters, we are there. What was Sorry. Can you hear me? Involves the leader doing the work of serving. Yes, we are. We are. We are hearing them. Listening to your voice. Now, a definition of servant leadership can be defined as a multidimensional uh, leadership theory that starts with a desire to serve, followed by an intent to lead and develop others, to ultimately achieve a higher purpose objective to the benefit of individuals, organizations. Um, and the definition of servant leadership can be defined as the constitutional uh, leadership. 
Now, there are 10 characteristics of servant leadership. One, listening. Second, empathy. Third, healing. Fourth, awareness. Fifth, persuasion. Sixth, conceptualization. Seven, foresight. Eight, stewardship. Nine, commitment to others' growth. And 10, community building. Um, I will try and um, take a look at this briefly and relate them to uh, teacher education because um, I believe that um, as a teacher educator, I am interested in seeing how I can develop these uh, characteristics within my own students so that when they go out to teach themselves, they should be able to be in a, they should be in a better position to be, uh, to be uh, serving leadership, serving teachers themselves. Now, no, no, what is no. listening? It's a deep commitment to listening to others is very important according to Greenleaf. Um, there needs to be reflection and meditation. There needs to be uh, active listening. And uh, the person needs to um, have to listen and hear what, what's being said. Um, how do I help my pre-service teachers in this respect? Well, it's important for me to model it. It's important for me to um, involve our students in sharing in lectures and uh, group um, uh, interaction so that they will be able to um, develop this, um, con this characteristic. The second one, empathy, and uh, somebody has also noted before, and, uh, uh, students. according to um, Spears 1998, I, I find this um, quote very, very um, uh, touching. Individuals grow taller when those who lead them empathize, when they are accepted for what they are, even though their performance may be judged critically in terms of what they are capable of doing. Leaders who empathize, who fully accept those who go with them on this basis are more likely to be trusted. So uh, how would I help pre-service teachers in this respect? I need to consider this, uh, uh, um, this statement in relation to them. I need to help them so that they be able to have that confidence I also remember what, what's being said in the, in the first Corinthians 13, 1, where Paul, the writer, he talks about uh, love, a cup of love. And he says that even if I uh, do all chari charitable work or give everything to help others, or when I speak like to nothing. So I believe um, about the, the importance of being empathetic as a, as a leader. The, the next characteristic is healing, which is very important as well. I, a lot of students, a lot of learners come to school with a lot of pain and a lot of hurting. And as we can see now, especially with this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there's a lot of this um, uh, happening. People are hurting everywhere. And when it, the students, we need to um, help them. They need to be supported. Um, for my um, students who um, I work with, they need to be supported with the knowledge, the resources they need to do their work effectively. Uh, provide them with a health, healthy learning environment so that they are happy and be engaging in their roles. So again, I talk about the, the notion of being a, a role model first. The notion of awareness, which is the fourth characteristic. Um, servant leaders develop general awareness, especially self-awareness, through self-reflection, by listening to what others have say about them, by being continually open to learning and by making the connection between what they know and, in, and believe in what they say or do, according to Bailey and Goldsmith and Crippen 2010. Now, as educators, we need to become students of our students. According to Crippen 2010, I find this very interesting. We need, I need to become a student of my student, meaning I need to listen to their, to their views. Uh, and the notion of being humble is also important to me. Why? Because I need to listen to, um, I, I need to be accepting of people's um, criticism because I can never tell um, my own weaknesses or my own shortcomings or strengths unless somebody would point it out. So this is very crucial. Persuasion is another critical um, aspect of um, being a servant leader. Serve, according to Greenleaf in Frick and Spears 1996, servant leader seeks to convince others rather than use of coerce, compliance. Um, in relation to service, um, uh, helping pre-service teachers in, uh, 
in this respect, I, I feel that when people see you as an expert, they are more likely to listen when you want to persuade them. So um, people can be inspired and be um, persuaded into listening and doing things if one is an expert. And at the same time, uh, we go back to the notion of uh, being empathetic, as I mentioned earlier on. And then conceptualization. What is conceptualization is in relation to servant leadership? Servant leaders seek to nurture their own abilities to dream great dreams. According to Greenleaf, he sees conceptual talent as the ability to see the whole in the perspective of history, past and future, to state and adjust goals, to evaluate, to analyze, and to foresee contingency along way ahead. Pre-service teachers and conceptualization, how would, uh, how would I get them to be able to um, understand and apply this um, concept? I, I believe that uh, teaching practice, when they go out to practice, I think it gives them an opportunity to practice how to conceptualize their day-to-day -day activity at school, from extracurriculum to classroom teaching and learning. And then we move on to this uh, characteristic of foresight. Greenleaf refers to this ability to foresee or know the likely outcome of a situation as a better than average guess about what is going to happen and when in the future. Now, in developing this uh, characteristic for my own uh, pre-service teachers, um, most of the time I use ad, uh, advanced organizer in my, with uh, my own students. So where I um, put a plan, what's going to happen throughout the lesson, what will happen at the end. So I believe that is one um, a strategy that um, I practice with them. Another one, I would give um, them these questions for them to ask in relation to the students that they are likely to um, encounter when they go out to teach. The questions would be, or the pre-service teachers need to be asking, how can my students be accommodated in a more practical and a realistic manner? The other question that they may ask in relation to their own students, their own learners, what are some of the obstacles that are likely to affect the success for my students? And the, the final um, or additional um, question, how they, he, the, the students are going to be, be supported. What type of support is required for the success of my students? Stewardship is another um, characteristic and uh, Green Lead believe that all members of an institution or organization uh, play significant roles in caring for the well-being of the institution and serving the needs of others in the institutions for the greater good of our society. Now, for pre-service teachers from the educators uh, need to lead by example. They need to demonstrate values and behaviors they want in pre-service teachers, meaning modeling. Educators and pre-service teachers need to dialogue and share ideas together with regards to the importance of stewardship and accountability. Again, we come back to the importance of me being the role model, the educator, the leader being the role model first. Um, the ninth one, the, it talks about um, commit, committed to the growth of uh, others. The servant is, um, leader is committed to the individual growth of human beings and to everything they can commit to others. According to Greenleaf, I find this um, comment very, statement very important. Couldn't many respected teachers speak those words that may, might change the course of life or give it new purpose? Now, I think uh, success stories and testimonies are another powerful way to get um, uh, pre-service teachers um, to listen and for them to follow, for them to understand what it means by committing to the growth of others. I remember a story told me or shared to me by one of my colleagues during our PhD studies, and this stayed with me always. She said, when she was growing up, in the first four years of uh, uh, at school, she was uh, known, she was looked down, she was labeled as a, as a dumb kid. Ex until she come, she come across this teacher who said something positive, you are very brilliant. And for her, from that moment on, she looked at herself differently. From then on, she moved on, she excelled. So the importance of us leaders or educators to help other people grow. Um, 
Then I come to building community, which is the last characteristic. Serving leader seeks to identify some means of building community, the means of acknowledging that we are in a relationship with one another. And Margaret Wheatley, 2007, page, I mean, page 173 says, people learn best in community when they are engaged with one another, when everyone is both a student and a teacher, an expert and apprentice in a rich exchange of experiences and learning. Pre-service teachers and community building, how do um, I help them to uh, understand what it means by community building? Again, educators, leaders, and pre-service teachers need to share ideas and learning experiences together. Again, I go back to the idea, the importance of uh, the modeling concept. I need to um, walk the talk. Now, if I were to um, define, if I were to, if there's one word I could um, use to describe uh, as the core of servant leadership, I would say akape love. Akape love, what is, what is it? It's goodwill, compassion, empathetic, being empathy. Because every human being is driven by sense of love or goodwill. Everybody needs to be loved. When the teacher shows care, love, empathy towards his students, the students are highly likely to succeed. When the teacher steps into the shoes of a servant, she or he is more likely to leave a favorable mark on his students. So what mark do you desire to leave on your followers, on your students? How do you wish to be remembered by those who came through your path? And then I like to um, wrap up with the final quotes from the Bible. But Jesus called them, his disciples to himself and said, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is found in Matthew 20, 25 to 28. So I believe, and my, my question shouldn't be the, be every a model that any leader, um, should follow. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Razel Tufo. Uh, it was a very good presentation, and the inputs which we have got are very good, and we have got a lot of opportunity to learn from this. Actually, we heard a lot and wanted to do even for all this servant leadership process, but your presentation has given us the direction to move and practice it in a systematical way. Thank you very much, Dr. Razel Tufu. Thank you. Thank you. Time has come to conclude this round table, leading the way. By concluding this complete round table, I would like to be very thankful to all the keynote speakers, especially John Bergman, sir who have enlightened us with a very important message of flipped learning, that he said that if someone asks a teacher what subject you teach, he just mentioned, don't tell your subject, tell that you teach kids. This is a very important message we have got from this roundtable conference. And he said that students don't care you know until they know that you care for them. They don't care what you know. They just know that they, you care for them. And I would like to thank Mr. Pandit Dasa who make us aware about mindfulness. And of course, he make us uh, register this phrase that closing the app, a very important message that we all have to focus on the present and we just focus on the productivity of the present. And I would like to thank Ms. Uh, Geeta Gandhi, ma'am, who introduced us with NEP policy. That is NEP, which is going, forward, which is going to take our education uh, coming forward. And I would like to uh, thank Mr. John Yo, making us realize the importance of change and novelty. I would like to thank Mr. Rosaline from South Korea, who make us uh, realize the importance of peace. And of course, Mr. Vessel Tofo for making us understand to serve, to lead, and lead to serve. And again, it's a very golden opportunity for all of us, for all uh, the participants of this roundtable conference that we have come across with so much of important inputs from the keynote speakers, the esteemed keynote speakers. For this, I'm truly indebted to the leadership team and all you wonderful people for making this roundtable uh, opportunity for uh, schools and our future. Thank you so much, Sunita ma'am. Th thank you so much, um, uh, Gita ma'am. And thank you so much, Bharti ma'am. We are very much thankful to all of you and your team. Thank you so much. We thank you. Thank you very much.
थैंक यू सो मच मोहम्मद लतीफ खान जी एंड मैम नुजहत खान जी फॉर योर सच वनफुल डेलीब्रेशन एंड ऑफकोर्स ऑल आर एस्टीम्ड स्पीकर थ्रू लाइट ऑन वेरियस एस्पेक्ट ऑफ एजुकेशन टूडे द थीम वॉज लीडिंग द वे and as someone remarked that we are learning we are learners actually with a mission and the need is value based learning so with this uh, there are certain gentle reminders for all our guests that very soon we'll be starting with the next round table and before that i would just like to uh, give a little reminder about our fellowships and awards we invite you and your teachers to apply for the getty innovations in process fellowships at this year's ed leadership anyone working in education at any level can apply from anywhere in the world policy makers heads of schools and ngos working in education getty innovator awards are for an idea you have already implemented and for which you have collected evidence getty innovation in process fellowships are given for an idea for change that you have that you wish to implement after the conference this idea may be the one you gather during the conversations that take place at ed leadership please fill the fellowship and award forms today link is provided to you in the zoom chat room and those watching from facebook and youtube may go to www.getilearn.org and apply from there we are looking forward to your applications to your participation for the same thank you so much and of course another very gentle reminder is regarding the protocols of the zoom meeting uh, kindly be vigilant for your mics please keep yourself on mute yeah. video was on the um, on mode it should be switched or be should be on so that we can actually see you there and it gives a feeling of a um, as if you are right there and we are talking to you heart to heart it's definitely very disturbing for the speakers as well as the other participants and the uh, the people who have come to participate in this ed leadership conference so again a very mild request please be vigilant regarding your speakers your mics thank you so much we will not uh, keep logged in and before we uh, begin with the next one in just few minutes with the next session uh, with the next round table i would just like to uh, thank our sponsors learning a to z we have s chand Youfus Learning and Ratna Sagar. Thank you to our media partner, Digital Learning. So very soon, in five minutes' uh, time, or just a five-minute break, so that we are just keeping up with the time. Within five minutes, we'll be coming up for the next roundtable. That is the sixth roundtable of the day. Feedback has to be definitely filled in. The link has already been shared in the Zoom chat box. Please. feel free to share your opinion to share your feedback it helps us grow thank you so much thank you thank you bopo tonyoba thank you <laughs> thank you so much
कर दे चुका Welcome you all back after this very very short break, and to continue with the sixth round table, I welcome the chairperson for the session, Miss Sushmita Basu. Miss Sushmita Basu has been head of the Quality Assurance and Innovations Department, City Montessori School, Lucknow, for the past ten years. She is also superior principal of CMS. Ms. Basu, as superior principal and head, quality education and innovations department, along with her team, engages in regular inspection throughout the academic session of all the 18 campuses of City Montessori School, many of which are council-affiliated ISC and ICSC campuses. The principals of all 18 CMS campuses report to her as part of the management. She was nominated to be the part of British Council's program of Indian school visits to various British universities. She was also part of the UK government schooling exchange program with schools in Wisbeck area of UK, funded by the DFID UK. She has also been part of a Heads of Schools delegation to Helsinki, Finland, to study the Finnish model of education. In her role as Head Kaid CMS, she has visited over 15 countries to study various school systems, personalized and differentiated learning, and participated in numerous educational workshops, conferences, and webinars. We welcome you, Basu ma'am. And uh, now over to you. And just I would just like to request our speakers to kindly stick to the 10 minute schedule so that we have enough time for the question answer session. Thank you, Basuman. Please over to you. Thank you so much, Jai Jagat. And a very warm good morning to all of y'all from City Montessori School, Lucknow. We all know that education is a process of facilitating learning or the acquisition of knowledge, skills, values, morals, beliefs, and habits. In India, the Education Commission had remarked that education is also a powerful instrument of social, economic, and cultural transformation necessary for the realization of a nation's goals. At City Montessori School, one of the four pillars of CMS education are knowledge, wisdom, spiritual perception, and eloquent speech. Today, our topic is educating the spirit. We have with us very illustrious speakers who will form 
part of this panel and who will present their views about the what, the why, and the how of educating the spirit. We would introduce the speakers one by one as they present, or rather before they present. But I have one request, and that is, please try to wind up in 10 minutes because we would like this session to be interactive and leave time to the end of the session to be able to take questions from the audience. Thank you. So over to our first speaker, Maud Monk Anshul, who is from Pune, Maharashtra, India who will speak on integrating spirituality with education. She is a renowned business psychologist, personality profiler and chartered marketer. She's a mind transformer and spiritual coach of Soul School Pune. Over to Maud Monk Anshul. Namaskar everyone, a very, very warm and a good morning. Um, I just want to know how I can share my screen uh, with you. I think um, just a quick sharing will be an easy thing for me to do. Um, is everybody able to see my screen? Yes, yes we are. Yeah. Uh, so, and can everybody see me also with it? Just a quick question. Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. You may proceed. Namaskar once again. Um, a very, very warm welcome. And I'm so glad and grateful to be speaking on the platform. Uh, my name is Madhma Kanshul and I have been in the journey of education for a long time. And, uh, my spiritual journey started when I was 11 years old, so almost 27 years from now, before. And I truly enjoy teaching and I love education. Um, and I've been, I've been wanting and keeping myself in the field of education. But at the same time, me being uh, and taking monkhood, I truly think spirituality is something that we need to integrate within our education system. And that's exactly what I plan to speak about today, is integrating spirituality in education. That is what uh, we need to speak. And uh, before I start, I would like to start with a small shlok, which is from Mahabharat. It is also, um, Vidur, it's from the Vidur Niti. Uh, Vidur, Vidura had actually spoken this. It says, Na sabha yatra na bhati kaschit na, sa sabha yatra vibhati chai kaha, sabha tu saivasti yathar harupa, paras param yatra vibhanti sarvehe. It, the meaning is very simple. Our education system is when a lot of students come together, the teachers come, and it's like a meeting. So any conference, any meeting, any collection of students and uh, teachers, it is not complete if everybody within that meeting does not shine, does, is not able to uh, enlighten themselves. And that is what our education system needs to be. That is how I feel that the education system has been for years together in the Vedic times and needs to continue the principle of meeting together, the principle of actually all of these coming together has to be purely that we shine. And nobody shines alone. They shine with their own merit and exactly as they particularly or want to grow as an individual during their spiritual growth, during the educational growth. Because education per se is abhyas. Now, what is education? Uh, before I get into the detail of how we can, uh, you know, use education in, and how we can integrate education and spirituality, there is something that I would like to speak about, about education itself. 
Now, we speak about education in today's society and uh, we want our children to get educated. But what is it that we are really wanting our children to learn? What do we really want them to understand? Now, understanding the word education per se also means that you are getting to know a little more about yourself. You're understanding yourself. You're, you're on the journey of knowing self. And that is what education is all about. That is education. And abhyas means a regular learning persistently and persistent effort in maintaining emotional, physical, economical, and spiritual tranquility in an individual. Now, keeping this in mind, what do we do in our, edu in our everyday education system? Are we really learning about ourselves or are we only learning about uh, situations of course, geography, history, science, chemistry, all physics? All of these are important aspects of our being the two. That is what we are made up of. But do we look at that education from that point of view? That is the question. Do we listen to what our mind, our body, our intellect is teaching us? And do we understand what they are trying to explain to us? And when we do, as teachers, if we do that, do we digest that information completely and use that information for our individual growth? Many times what happens is in today's world is that we end up just mugging up information. A, of course, it's important to earn. It's important to have a career and we will speak about it. But what is really happening? The, the content, the context of actual education, are we really focusing on that? After we have been graduated and post-graduated, do we really understand our being? Is that our education? Is our education system looking at that aspect? And that is important. Do our, does our education system look at who I really am? What I need to do? Yes. Where I need to go? Yes. We know what all do I need as an equipment or a technique to kind of grow in the world? I agree, yes. But do we look at who, who is looking for the technique? Who is really wanting to grow? Who is the person who is actually going through the process of growing or understanding? Who is this particular person? Who am I? Are we really connecting our mind, body and intellect together? Now, these are important aspects of spiritual growth. And it's very important as a person to understand. this. Now, I truly feel if we can integrate these basics of education and abhyas, regular practice in an everyday life, in, uh, in our spiritual growth, our spiritual growth will naturally happen in a way that we will grow internally. We will, of course, become a far more focused person and we'll speak about that also. But I think, yes, education is something, uh, is all about knowing self. It's all about understanding self and that that basic context we kind of miss out many a times. Now, when we speak about integrating spirituality and education together, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind. Um, many times that people have asked me about the same thing, asking is education the same thing as religion? Uh, the, first, the first and the most important aspect that we need to understand uh, when we speak about education is that they are not, their religion and spirituality are not the same thing. They are very, very different. We, when we speak about spirituality, we are speaking about the spirit. We are speaking about the journey of knowing self through the help of self. So we are trying to understand aspects of our individual personality. The whole point of being in this world is understanding why, what, how, and where you come from and how do you move this journey forward. Now, that is what is important. So there are two different aspects. That's something that we need to clearly uh, segregate between the two things. Yes, a religion helps in, uh, you know, growing you spiritually, but they're not the same thing. Many times also, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, you know, parents come and ask that, is you know if a person is more spiritually inclined the career will not you know happen again that is something we need to make sure that career and spirituality go hand in hand if you are far more 
tuned into your mind, body and spirit and where you really want to go, what your passion is, you get more focus, you get more clarity and you get more choices and satisfaction in everything that yeah. you do. And of course, um, when, when we speak about spirituality and education, we have to say that it is not only for uh, the students per se or the children per se, because it's very important that everybody, including the parents, the teachers, the principals, the deans, the, uh, the institution of education have to come and really join hands together for children to understand, for parents to understand what spirituality is. When we speak this, we need to really get the definition of spirituality clear. Uh, many people have different definitions of spirituality, depending on where they are at this given moment in their life in terms of their spiritual growth. But simply to understand, spirituality means that a person or an individual learns about himself or herself as a spirit as to what the journey is, what are the areas that a child or a person or an individual needs to learn to grow, what are the learning lessons, how does the person get to know the essence, how he or she can connect back with the divine, because he or she at the end of the day is um, a part of the universe and we are one with the universe and that's the whole journey knowing that i'm a part of the universe will truly help a child or a parent to understand broad perspective of life per se this is like a whole life school and when we introduce life school and education we are opening doors to a lot and lot of um, perspective, lot of uh, options, opportunities for a person. And I think that is why integrating um, spirituality and education is very important. Where is the gap today? We will, I was trying to understand the gap and I've been speaking to quite a few people in for the past couple of um, months about the same thing because I run a school and we've been trying to, you know, incorporate programs to help students understand and parents understand spirituality. Over, let's, uh, you know, about, about 200 people that we spoke to, 100 to 150 people that we spoke to, um, most of the people did, did not know what, they were not spiritually aware that they wanted to grow as an individual because that concept was missing. That concept was missing. There was a lot of competition with the children. There was a lot of anger built up and anger was built up with emotions, not just with themselves, but with family. It was a very little level of patience. Mostly parents complained of children not having patience. And my question always was, if children do not have that patience, where are the children getting that streak of understanding of having no patience from? It has to come from, it, is, it comes from parents or somebody around them. So they pick up, you know, they, they, they replicate patterns of being. And that is what happens relationship balance was a problem forgiveness and letting go was a major problem with again the children they were not ready to let go of something that did not happen according to the way they wanted now these are the areas that we find gaps so what we do with children is we give them knowledge we tell them what is right what is wrong but we don't explain to them so knowledge and wisdom are two different things we explain to them about you know how and what is important in an ideal world. But we, the gap is that we do not explain the children where they are and everybody's ideal world is different. Not your, your ideal world will not be the same as mine. And that is what the gap that we need to follow. Then I was thinking, why should educational institutions, and I truly feel that we need to, because it, we come from a parampara of Gurukul, we come from a parampara of Vedic knowledge, we come from a parampara uh, of sadhana and meditation. How do we get those things back in our um, everyday educational system? And to do that, we need to know why we need to do it. Why bother doing something like this? And how will connecting to the divine, how will connecting to the universal source, because you come from a source and that is what something a child needs to understand. How will that help? Well, of course, it brings focus because you are questioning yourself. It gives you 
qualitative analytical thinking abilities because you're again questioning you're breaking down every question every answer and that is what is happening you also have emotional intelligence because you try to understand what the other person is saying the minute you look at yourself spiritually the minute you look at your entire being spiritually you will disconnect yourself from the physical body that you are living in and when you disconnect yourself from the physical body that you live in you tend to look at everything around from a third person's perspective from a from a helicopter view and when you do that you tend to grow an emotional intelligence sense you understand how other person empathy grow sorry empathy grows and when an empathy grows when you understand yourself you focus you analytically think about situations you break down those information you grow emotionally intelligent you will naturally build healthy relationships you will build relationships with less than expectations which will actually get you mental stability which will help you create a balance between your mind body and spirit and all of these will help you understand the universal laws of existence what is the whole point of doing this is helping a child to get spiritually as an internally as a spirit as a being of i um who am i that particular i that that child needs or the parent needs to get connected and feel the belonging of um feeling the oneness and the belongingness with the universe when you connect to that lot of the other aspects that trouble us in the daily everyday life and specifically now that the covid-19 situation has happened we've all gone through so much of emotional um, you know trouble and lot of issues have happened in many families parents they've had relationship issues they've had frustration depression anger all of these can easily be handled if you realize that you are connected as one with the universe and everything that is happening around you is happening as an illusion we are playing a part in this drama we are not the drama and that is what spiritually um, integrating spirituality with education will bring about it will help the children to understand this making them far more stable and give a purpose a direction many times children are directionless purposeless they are going where the wind is kind of flow taking them but this will help them give a purpose to life but again the question is how do we do this as a coach as a spiritual coach and as a mom i've been teaching children over the past couple of years and we've been we've been doing programs for them so schools also i think there are three folds that we need to look at one is teaching them certain principles basic certain principles and we start from the very young age we don't start from the 8th grade or the 9th grade but we start from a very very young age as as small as um nursery or pre nursery when they just come in let them enjoy the music let them let them really be with themselves now being with yourself is also a way of meditating but in the curriculum i think there we can look at three tools that i chose that is really then understanding third in principles of uh, as a spiritual approach teach them these third in principles let them have an inner quest of understanding what is happening through mindfulness through inner questioning through meditation through vedic principles and shlokas and it's important because they have got so much of meaning again when i say vedic principles i'm not speaking about religion i'm speaking about the actual truth the fact of an inner person those and stories theater will be a great way to express expression is important in spirituality now when these things happen we need to see that they are being applied application and knowledge is extremely important so what happens is that through um, actually through books through um, through a lot of um, everyday lessons maybe once a week and move it towards mix it with the inner quest we can make it very interesting and uh, and then apply it tracking every day we have a lot of applications now that people track we can do that or otherwise also tracking becomes very easy if they start journaling what their experiences are 
But usually, again, we need to be a little careful here. I feel um, a lot of people get stuck with external uh, factors tracking them and they lose their own navigation needle. Now, that is something that the teachers who or the, or the coaches who help them need to tell them regularly that do not lose your track, internal track. That is important. So I think threefold of um, approach for a curriculum will be great. How do we do it? I think we can target three audiences. It's extremely important, again, to target all the three areas, all the three people, individuals, uh, groups of people in, in this uh, the journey are very important. The schools, yes, through teacher training programs, helping them really understand. And why I say schools and parents here are very important because at the end of the day, children are going to imitate what the parents and teachers are saying. As, as, a, as a monk or as a coach, I can tell my children as to what and how they need to behave. But if they go back and the parents are not in the same thing, then there is a problem. And hence, explaining the same aspect to parents becomes extremely important uh, in terms of integrating something in an education system, it has to happen with from the root level. I think that is very, very important. Of course, there are challenges. It is going to be uh, difficult to reach out to all areas within the country. I think when we speak about spirituality... Pam, can you prepare to wind up soon? Yes, of Thank course. Thank you. Of course. Uh, so I was saying that uh, it is important to uh, grow together spiritually, understand and be connected to the divine source. And that is the whole important aspect. Um, we will surely, hopefully, you know, uh, make this work. And uh, together we can make this difference. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mod Monk Anshul. Thank you so much. For educating us about how to create a balance between mind, body, and spirit, and what teachers and schools can do to enable this. Sure. We move to our second illustrious speaker of the day, of the session. She is Bhavna Arora from New Delhi, India. She would be discussing a spiritual curriculum. She is an awardee of the Innovative Teacher Award by CED Foundation and Star Creative. She is also a teacher awardee at the Zamid International Schools Award. She is working at Darshan Academy for the past 20 years as senior coordinator. Bhavna Arora, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen first. All right. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Am I also visible? Am I also visible there? No, ma'am, no visible. I can see. Yeah, I think sure. it's fine now. No. I can see that. Thank you very much for your kind words, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be a part of this uh, uh, program today. Warm greetings to all of you. I'm very happy to share my views on the essence of the well-being of human beings. And that's what uh, we are here to talk about. I truly agree with Ms. Anshul, you know, all that she spoke, I think, word to word, everything. Uh, I just would like to take it a step ahead and would like to tell you something about spiritual curriculum and its relevance in the life of students. Actually, we all know that the purpose to join, uh, my purpose to join the movement is basically to, join, uh, to do my bit for world beneficence. We all know education is the seed that generates the future course of humanity and global development, but I feel it's incomplete until our students are given spiritual curriculum. So it's very important that we inculcate or develop a spiritual mentality among our students and 
to take them out from the grip of fear and develop the growth of faith among all of them. So that's how we are going to start. Okay, just a minute. Now, what we are going to talk about is uh, inculcating values through spiritual curriculum. Uh, you know, what I would like to say that it is not as much what is poured into the students, but what is planted that really counts and makes the difference. Uh, you know, in our school, uh, we have the school-wide meditation throughout, which is followed by uh, the spiral spiritual curriculum. You know, uh, because uh, I think spiritual caution is also very important as IQ or EQ. Am I audible to everyone? Yes, you are. Please continue. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So what we were talking about is uh, the spiritual curriculum that is followed at our school. What do we do initially in morning? We start with school-wide meditation where everyone right from class four employee to the principal all sit in meditation at a particular time because it has its own importance. I'll be talking about it a little late, which is followed by one particular period of uh, spiritual curriculum, which is a kind of spiritual spiral curriculum, which is followed right from kindergarten to grade 12. Same topics, but obviously the level gets changed. And that's how children, you know, every year when they keep learning something that really helps them provide value-based education right from their formative years. That's really very important. Then comes the promotion of peace because we are actually committed to create the uh, generations of peacemakers, you know. So that's how, you know, we give them uh, various opportunities to different roles, uh, to different activities that children do in their classes in this particular period so that, you know, they are able to feel peace and they're able to promote that. Same way they are able to, you know, resolve their own conflicts. There are some activities like role plays or simulations. This kind of, you know, opportunities are given to them so that they are able to resolve their conflicts on their own. And that's how, you know, they also learn that ethical and spiritual values which are common to all religion. So they, they learn to value all these things and they learn to give importance to all, all these. So this is really very important. You know, what I actually firmly believe in that there is no greater calling than to serve our fellow men. There is no greater contribution than to help the weak. And there is no greater satisfaction than to have done it all. So uh, because of this one belief, we always have our children, you know, celebrate different kinds of acts of kindness. Weeks we celebrate throughout the year, uh, at least three, four times in a year. Like we have a you know, special week of human unity. We have a, a you know, love and service week. In this week, what do children do? They do certain acts of kindness, which, is, which we think that it is the essential part of their holistic development. Because most of the schools we have seen that they you know, give importance to their mental development, the physical development, even the emotional development. But hardly there are uh, the, the schools who actually you know, give proper relevance to a development of spiritual caution as well among students and that really makes a difference in their life and the kind of activities that they do are you know planting trees to improve the ecological environment they distribute they uh, we have actually adopted a slum area near our school uh, and you know that is officially adopted and there we uh, you know keep on having number of programs so at, so as to you know physically and practically give the experience to students we have a friday collection where children bring one onion and one potato every Friday. And once, you know, every child brings, it becomes too much. And then, you know, they go and distribute to that area, which is called Kilonabag near our school. And you see uh, people actually wait for, uh, you know, uh, these children to come and uh, give it to them. We also have uh, started the Roti Bank, which we, you know, have it every Tuesday, every Tuesday, uh, I mean, in a fortnight. So, you know, every second and fourth Tuesday, we uh, go and distribute. So every child, you know, brings home from home one chapati, one pranti, whatever, along with pickle or vegetable, whatever they want to bring. And then they actually, you know, we collect it. And then a group of uh, students of Interact Club, they go and distribute among uh, the needy and uh, the people who actually require it. So this is how, you know, they get the practical training of being compassionate to others. So distributing food and clothing to people in need, 
following vegetarianism this because you know we there is a particular chapter in spiritual curriculum where they actually learn how important it is to be vegetarian and the implications and the benefits of it and you see children uh, when they understand they themselves they first of all they themselves do not take it and then they also you know coach and also tell their parents and their friends that they should not be taking non vegetarian food and you know the uh, ill effects of that so that's how you know the training should be given to students i feel and developing the skills of avoiding or resolving conflicts on their own they they come up with solutions you know how can they resolve conflicts among among themselves only in a class and then in school and gradually you know when they increase in the class then you know it it goes on from uh, class to class and then you know they they come talking about how can they resolve the issues in society and then in country and then even you know to have world peace and very important is sitting in meditation as i told you that all of us sit in meditation for 10 minutes the whole school there's yeah, a ma'am no, ma sorry uh, your attention please ma'am your ppt is showing patches to the viewers uh -huh. so we request you to either share the complete screen okay if you can just look into the technical side of ppt presentation please thank you so much yeah some words can't be visible are not visible i think there is a yes, network issue uh is it okay now ma'am no. you can reshare you can stop sharing and reshare the screen right and right. we request you to do the screen share please and not the window sharing okay okay thank you ma'am thanks roli thank you ma'am I think it is visible now is it I I just try and share it again just to me Is it fine Ma'am, we still see the patches, so we request you to stop sharing and share the complete screen. Maybe that helps. Maybe it's the window sharing which is bringing in the patches. Maybe we can try once. Thank you, ma'am. I think I'm still. I mean, sharing the complete screen. Ma'am, if you wish, you can share your presentation quickly with any of us back with the at Team Getty, and we can share your presentation share from Zenim. here. If she can do it, please. I have yes. already shared it with Zainab. All right, ma'am. Just yeah, give me a share. moment. We'll do it. Yeah. So in the meantime, the when uh, by the time this uh, PPT is uh, shared, I was. Yeah, you please continue because we'll uh, run out of time otherwise. Okay. Thank you so much. That's what I'm doing. So I was just telling you the importance of sitting in meditation. You know, all the children at our school, right from uh, junior classes, if you go and you talk to them, they start telling you the benefits of, uh, you know, sitting in meditation. First, if you talk about the intellectual benefit, you know, uh, even before I started doing it, I also did not know that it thickens the gray matter that we have here, and you know that helps us to stop forgetting things because as we age, you know, we start start forgetting things, and the gray matter gets thinner. So once we keep practicing meditation it helps us thickening it and then it helps us to you know uh, remember things for a longer time so i think this becomes the need of the hour especially for we people when we age you know it's very important that we remember everything and for that sitting in meditation will really help uh, this is one of the intellectual benefits i was telling and plus if we sit at the same place and the same time you know what happens our mind gets disciplined and then our nervous system also gets uh, relaxed and then our decision making power and our problem solving capacity everything gets increased and then what happens basically then our whole system you know starts getting in control and then uh, we really can you know work on our concentrate on our work very well 
and if you talk about physical benefits you see even the cancer institutes now you know they they you know tell us tell people to meditate as uh, as uh, you know one of the you can say uh, the thing that helps in medication it it actually helps them in medication it is uh, one of the supple supplement you can say to their medication so they also say because it reduces the chances of getting cancer by 49% so it so happens and uh, most of us we may not even know that one sitting in one hour of meditation is equivalent to four hours of sleep that's how you know it goes on so it's really very important that uh, you know we sit in meditation and we actually start practicing it and as far as the emotional benefit is concerned you know it balances our hormones and what does it do as i told you it relaxes our nervous system also and makes us emotionally stable otherwise you see there are people because of the last year all the problems that we have gone through we see um, most of us we become emotionally unstable so this 10 minutes that we do in school in morning that actually gives them a taste of you know doing something once they know the benefit they start doing it themselves and not only students student students sit in meditation they also you know uh, uh, tell their parents and their friends in the neighborhood and otherwise other people also to sit in meditation and see the benefits you know in in our in our school there is one room basically which is actually assigned as a meditation room so any child when you you know feeling low or not feeling good or would like to concentrate he gets the permission from the teacher and goes there and sits you know for some time to get you know to get connected to himself or herself and then you know then comes back to the class so that's how it happens and we all know spiritual benefits it is it actually takes us close to god because it really it, it really helps us taking back to uh, god so what we actually train our children to be the reason for bringing positive change in the world that's really very important because by involving children in so service to society at and by giving them regular meditation practice and also by you know um, training them through this specially designed spiritual curriculum to students we think that it helps in reinforcing the fact among our students that the eventual purpose or the ultimate purpose of all education is to help and serve society and humanity so once we are able to inculcate them in the very formative years of our students i think half of the battle is already won because you know i firmly believe in mahatma gandhi's quote when he says that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of mankind so not only this as uh, uh, ms anshul also said that involving parents also very important because they play a very important role it's not only the teachers and the authority uh, with students is the parents also because um, once the parents are involved you know preparing students for uh, life become all the more important for students with the help of parents so that the students can fulfill their responsibilities towards the family and society while pursuing a spiritual life of inner contemplation and also their own personal development i i i personally believe that uh, when all of us you know we start infusing this spirit among our students our children as uh, you know, because this way you know we'll be able to develop in them the appreciation and regard for people of all religion because many people they just get confused between spirituality and you know would you just scream that has to be made very clear among all our students so that children can develop respect for cultural diversity and uh, uh, you know uh, i just would like to end because i know i'm running short of time and i'm just completing 10 minutes so in a nutshell i just yeah, would thank you ma'am and it with a quote saying that there is an excitement in the emerging of new forms of education while the course may be uncharted it is from this creative chaos that the new life will spring and i understand when all of us understand the importance of you know giving the spiritual training to our students through this kind of seminars or webinars or things like that you know when it it not only will have an impact on ourselves but we'll also be able to pass on the same vibes to our children and that's how you know we we will be able to contribute to create you know generations of peacemakers and future builders who will be confident enough who will be uh, the conflict resolvers and who will be the one who will take our world our nation in the right direction thank you very much thank you thank you so much bhavna ma'am
for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Emphasizing and re-emphasizing on the fact that well-being is important, but education is incomplete without the spiritual training. Spiritual aspect of education. We have to remove fear and develop the growth of faith in the child. The third speaker for today is Ms. Kashmira Jaiswal from Vadodara, Gujarat, India. Her topic is Upskill to Upcycle, a crusade to live responsibly for a healthy environmental future. Ms. Jaiswal is the vice principal of Navrachna School, Sama, and she is the recipient of the India Inspirational Women Award 2020. Over to Kashmira Jaiswal, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Sushmita, ma'am. It's a pleasure to be here on this platform. And uh, allow me to share my screen with you all in a minute. Is the screen visible now? Yes, it is, ma'am. Okay, Please great. Continue. Thank you so much. Okay, so here is uh, the topic power of change, inspiring the teacher within. And uh, everybody has a story to tell. And so I thought, let me also come to this, uh, you know, August gathering to tell a tiny little story that I have to share. And uh, so I happen to be uh, an alumni of the Fulbright Distingu Distinguished Awards for Teachers. And in 2015 cohort, when I got this award, it was called the International Leaders in Education ILEP program. And so uh, as an alumnus, it allows us, uh, the alumni, to call for go, you know, exchange programs, apply for grants, and many of among the August gathering would be Fulbright Fellows and maybe ILEP alumni or TEA. But this is what we did. So we uh, were to design projects and uh, I designed a project for Upskill to Upcycle, which uh, uh, involved civic participation and uh, sustainable development goals. And lo and behold, it was a very competitive uh, competition, but Navrashna School Sama managed to, you know, bag this prestigious, the Federal Assistance Award that is called. Now, we got this uh, Federal Assistance Grant Award for our project Upskill to Upcycle. What is the project about? The project is to build awareness about upcycling. The project is to upskill students and teachers to upcycle. The project is to create the communicating skills among students to spread the message out to the world through posters, hoarding, short films, radio jingles, programs. It is to develop these skills among children create a studio where they can go and upcycle and educate other members of the community to create a ripple effect. So this project was a year long project with all these objectives in mind. Very briefly, we'll stay here for what is upcycling because we know a lot of reuse, recycle, but what is upcycle? This is one uh, uh, you know, notion that we wanted our children to understand because upcycling is about transforming creatively products into new products for better environmental value, longevity and quality. So uh, it minimizes the, you know, discarded materials. It reduces the trash fields, the mountains of trash heaps, reduces the, you know, uh, use of new production or new raw material and uh, reduces the air and water pollution and conserves the global resources because we are upcycling old things into things that are for longevity and our students who are the you know harbingers of future need to learn that. Very briefly, difference between recycle and upcycle because this is a crusade and uh, we wanted to break the notions of recycling and we wanted children to uh, 
get into the mode of upcycling. So what is upcycling? So you treat a process, uh, you treat uh, you know, the waste materials break down into, so a glass bottle, if it's broken into glass or a plastic bag, broken into its particles and created a new bag or a bottle is recycling. But upcycling is the creative conversion. So for example, you can see in the picture, you have a t-shirt there and you, you it's cut and it's weaved into something else or a bag and so very easily could can be done by our students. So this is what we did. We received the award, but COVID-19 happened for all of us. And it was a dampener and it was a, like a jamming your foot in the door to not allow us to do things. But did we sit hand on hand as a school? No, as a school, uh, a charged administration and a charged teacher fraternity, we wanted to go ahead with our program. And so we started online, thankfully. We had already created a platform for ourselves. And so we started everything as designed as scheduled. We did the project in four phases. In the first phase, we learned how to build awareness and spread it through social media, holdings, posters, radio, Mirchi. Phase two, we uh, you know did training sessions for our students to learn upcycling. Uh, phase three, the children did all of their work in their homes. And phase four, the exhibition that we will just be showing to you. So this is a part of phase one. We were to collaborate. So this is Mr. Murugia from Malaysia. We collaborated. He did a print medium uh, workshop. He did an audio radio mirchi workshop. He did filmmaking. And our children learned to create their communicables, their posters, their banners, their hoardings, their radio mirchi jingles about upcycling, their short films that are to be shown in through the film theaters. And uh, despite lockdown, you can see 100% engagement amongst all the students. And so uh, these are the kinds of posters. With a lot of research went into it. They learned tools. They went, learned Corel. They learned a lot of technology tools to create their posters. And so a lot of upskilling happening over here. Just a few glimpses of what our children did. And uh, a lot of them were trained and a few glimpses of the posters created by them. We time constraints, I'll not share the films and the radio jingles, but they're on the social media, we'll share if you wish to. The second objective was to train them for upcycling and none other than Ritu and Surya Singh from Wolf Jaipur. They are the experts who uh, expertly refashion uh, properties big properties into the, the, you know, beautifying the properties with waste and junk and upcycle these products for aesthetic purposes. So they were invited and again during the lockdown, not a moment of disengagement for the students or mental health issues that they were, uh, they didn't have activity for want of activity or engagement, but our students were all 100% into the project. And so, um, these are Ritu and Surya Singh. They came to our school through online and they did the project and our students right from grade six to grade 11. So um, what I want to say is uh, because they could not come to school and learn on all the tools like upcycling wood, upcycling plastic, upcycling stuff, but every household has a uh, used cloth, a scissor, pair of scissors, Sui and dhaga. It's like, you know, thread and a needle. So our children got into, we decided to, you know, use the upcycled cloth as our theme for the year. And so you can see 100% engaged children working with, a, you know, a excitement and joy and creating wonderful products out of it. And you can, then this is the exhibition where every child is proudly exhibiting. And grades eight and nine had a different objective. So grade six and seven, they created these bags. These are called borrow bags. We use a running stitch for that. But grades eight and nine, they were older children. So we had got them into researching. So they researched about traditional board games of India, the heritage board games. And here you see them designing our traditional heritage board games on cloth using the running stitch. But this is uh, these are our children. They are learning to conserve the heritage and legacy. 
and they are learning to upcycle. So uh, you can see them, it's a tedious process, but our children are working heartily to develop their skills to accomplish the mission that they, and you can see some examples. I didn't have space enough to write the names of the uh, games as well, but this is what they have done a lot of research. Here's an exhibition of what our children did, them playing with their family, them playing with their friends, them displaying their product. And then grade 10 and 11, they went on to upcycle fashion. You know, they wanted to redesign. That was their objective told to them. So here is them converting into designers and they are redesigning their t-shirts and jeans and making motifs and something that, you know, gives them the aesthetic sense to, uh, and a uh, eureka feeling to be able to, you know, uh, be fashionistas and fashion uh, the proponents and so this is an exhibition so here is uh you know she's redesigned a trouser into a skirt and uh, created motifs created uh, um so also we broke gender stigmas and so girls and boys there was no gender stigma boys were equally enthused to uh you know upcycle their clothes and their you'll see a pair of shoes being upcycled you'll see a table runner out of a pair of jeans you'll see a bag and stuff so we broke gender stigmas so we achieved a lot in the periphery with the upcycling and here are students uh, uh, of grade 10 and 11 who have uh, read uh, redefined fashion so what was the widespread impact uh, we received this award this award was for 25000 usd to create the entire one year old project with the studio, with the impact. And so what was we, uh, Navrachna School Sama in Vadodara, Gujarat, it got this award basically because the project was designed for a widespread impact. And so what was the widespread impact? Not only the 2,500 students that we touched from you know, grade six to 11, who learned and taught it to their peers. So they collaborated with peers from other schools and so the ripple effect they taught it forward the teachers 150 of them they stood like stalwarts like pillars and uh, you know went on motivating looking at the project what have you done let's know and so it went uh, they were motivators and inspirers and drivers of change the civic participation we had hoardings we had uh, radio mirchi beings uh, you know children doing their jingles designing learning music we had a global impact through the social media platforms and a small step at a time. The planet starts to breathe free of plastic and other waste. So that's the impact that was seen by the Department of State USA and we got this project. And so our National Education Policy 2020, it is mandated for educators to inculcate 21st century skills. And so, of course, our project met all of the skills. We developed empathy for the environment, leadership skills, communication skills, collaboration, sustainable development, real world problem solving, because they're getting together, they are getting to collaborate. So uh, we achieved all of that and mandatory. There were four sustainable goals that we were to meet. And yes, we did quality education, climate action, responsible consumption, civic uh, citizenship. And so we did achieve these uh, sustainable development goals. Our students were the perpetrators of the change. And there is a ripple in our school with the upside. It's like buzzing with excitement. So uh, because this theme was uh, inspired uh, the educator within yourself, so I thought I'll share the story with you because the most important thing is that uh, we need to inspire before we expire or the idea expires or the thought expires. So it's important to, you know, even if it's a small story, if it, even if it's a small step, we need to get it out and share it with the world. It might just click somewhere. It might just get somebody to think, oh, that's a great idea. Why can't I go ahead with it? So that's my Chotasa story that I wanted to share with you. And uh, like I just said, don't be ashamed of your story ever because you know it may just click a 
ignite a tiny little spark in someone so this is from navrachna school sama teacher fraternity management fraternity from vadodara who are pretty excited about what they are doing for upcycling and upskilling their students and teachers and i wish to thank uh, ad leadership and getty sushmita ma'am thank you so much for getting us here and for allowing us to share our story that was indeed excellent and i love that presentation to try to ignite the spark i'm sure it will at city montessori school also kashmira ma'am despite covid and uh, you know all the um, barriers which face to face education has created you have managed to really inspire 2500 students and it's an amazing story thank you so much for presenting and i'm sure just like us from city montessori school all the other schools here are inspired and we are going to go back with many ideas thank you so much kashmira ma'am again thank you so much ma'am for allowing me to share my story with the world thank you our pleasure and our benefit thank you over to poonam kamdar from new delhi india who would be presenting catering to emotional needs of children and she is a freelance counselor and mentor and trainer from new delhi and she would be sharing her presentation and her views with us thank you namaskar thank you sushmita ma'am i'm delighted to be a part of the largest international virtual ed leadership conference which is organized by getty and uh, my topic is catering to the emotional needs of children but before i begin i would like to compliment kashmira ma'am for her the energy uh, that she was bubbling with and this is the kind of energy i think which is a strong representation of what our teachers must possess that is what that is how we can help in the uh, our kids in the emotional de development now uh, our children actually they do not need any makeover they just need to be understood and if we understand their needs right now we can save them from the lifetime of searching for what they never had as a child so we talk about life skills we all know about life skills which are basically behavioral development approaches which is designed to balance the areas like knowledge attitude and skills and uh, we all, we already know that there are three main components of life skills that is thinking social and emotional skills now when i talk about emotional skills it refers to the skills to increase the internal locus of control which is now we in our days we say that our children they do not listen to us they do not uh, do the things as we used to do as uh, when we were uh, young so the thing is uh, these emotional skills are going to help them so not only that that individuals they it is it is the power within themselves it is something feeling within themselves that yes they have the faith that they can make a difference in the world and uh, it includes managing the feelings emotions and coping with stress so 10 life skills have been talked about and some of them have been very well covered in the earlier presentation also that is uh, empathy problem solving skills creativity effective communication skills and uh, decision making creative thinking interpersonal skills now if i share with you all that if uh, uh, let's say that 10 emotional needs that we've talked about and in general we keep on sharing with uh, whenever we talk to the educational uh, fraternity basically that is security as a teacher community yes it is very important that we are providing our children with a safe environment a safe territory which allows them to develop fully Be bullying is a total no no it is the teachers uh, who has to see that the environment that they are giving to the children in the classroom that particular time when they are studying when they are learning because this environment is required it need to be conducive for learning 
It will reduce, it will not lead to frustration and anger amongst children. And these children will learn better. Teachers, again, a lot of onus is on them when we are talking about the, uh, meeting their emotional needs. They have, they have to see that they are being non-judgmental, not biased towards any child. We talk, we, we, we share, uh, we say, uh, uh, we talk about inclusive education. We are respecting the dignity of every individual because, and we are saying that every individual is different and unique and we have to cater to individual needs uh, of every student in, uh, in the best possible manner so that when they grow up, they, they feel uh, they, they are a confident person they are a confident person and they can meet the challenges of life and come out with elan the attention is to be given to each and every child so that their emotional needs are met, are met very well learn to take their names they, they feel important that way give them responsibilities allow them to take the lead give them small small opportunities where they, which helps in the development of the self-confidence and they feel that, yes, I can do it myself. Give them responsible, give them more opportunities for making responsible choices as well. Again, feeling a part of the wider community social service, let them learn to appreciate the bounties around them. Empathize with the children of lesser God. Some schools, what they do is they make children, uh, let's uh, say about academically, uh, those who are not so strong, they need some sort of support. So they make, they make the children sit, uh, once, uh, one who is very is, uh, highly academically sound with another person who can help the other person. So together, both of them are winner because one is getting the need to, uh, of helping the other person being satisfied and the other person is getting the help. Then... Teamwork and collaboration, which is again very important because being a social animal, we, are, we all need to be working together and in this particular society. And this helps in later adjustment in the society as well. Give them opportunities to, uh, or a private corner at times for self-reflection if they are showing some sort, if they are sad, they don't want to share the feelings when they are, uh, they want some seclusion for themselves. And feel, I mean, they can reflect upon and then after some time, they can get connected with the people who are in the classroom. Have, uh, you, uh, as a teacher, yes, it is very important that uh, giving them under, or making them understand the meaning and purpose of why, why they are here in the classroom. What is the larger purpose? It is not just studies. It is, it is uh, getting uh, intermingling, intermingling with the people socially as well, developing emotionally also. And I mean, every person should come out with the feeling of achievement in some way or the other when they're coming to the school. And the teacher who's full of energy and bubbling with energy, she can make a I mean, mountain of um, change in every child. For that, I would like to suggest that morning time when the teacher is coming, smile is one thing that they should wear every day. Keep your baggage. They, they must keep all the baggage at home. A conflicting situation or the worries of the household, everything should be there. I mean, you have to see that you have to act as a professional teacher. Now, when you're in the school, you have to give 100% over there. Wear that smile because that, that can make a day of the child. Begin your day with the laughter therapy. I'm very much in for laughter therapy, where, where uh, students are laughing together. Even it is observed that children, those who do not speak, those who do not like to interact, they also love to participate because laughter, it, it, is, it is universal in nature. It has no language as by itself. Anyone can do it at any point of time and brings about a lot of positive changes um, in, the in the body also, which makes them feel happy, happy hormones are released. Everyone feels elated after having a good hearty laughter in early in the morning. Then secondly, positive attitude. You know, it is very well said that uh, a person can make or mar a per other person's day by not being positive in approach. One single sentence which is said without an air of positivity. 
i mean i can uh, i i think uh, that can uh, if it happens with us also i think uh, we we have seen in earlier situations uh, in our, maybe during our childhood also in day to day uh, current scenario also one negative sentence how our day entire day goes off and we are not able to handle it at all so have that positivity share and in fact create situations within the classroom where children are getting that or creating that ambience of positivity within the classroom your whatever you say verbally or express in written form let's say via the report card the remark in the report card or in the notebook or in the answer sheet or in the diary for that matter it can affect the person like anything a negative remark can affect the psyche of the person which is going to be highly detrimental for his overall development so be very choosy be very careful sarcastic comments within the classroom it affects the emotional development of every child adversely so be very careful about how and what you are speaking your tone the body language that we use that also has a strong impact i mean we as a teacher though we have lot of powers but yes remember that we are here to shape the child's personality overall grooming is important and for that if my one single word can have a long term negative effect why should i use it at all so be very selective be very choosy then i strongly feel that schools they are doing a lot uh, i mean many schools are doing a lot as far as teacher trainings are concerned students uh, sessions are concerned workshops are concerned and many of them are do it are uh, taking care of involving the parents via a workshop i strongly feel when teachers have to act as a bridge between the parent and the child at times because together when you do the work by have it hand in hand in in that case the result is actually it it goes beyond the expectation if you don't seek cooperation from the parents or if you uh, do not make a step forward to get the uh, their cooperation things may not be as per your expectation so there must be lot of workshops sensitization sessions for the parents counseling session for the parents right from pre primary till class 12 for the schools so that parents are involved and they know how changes are taking place yesterday dr sunita gandhi have, has shared that yes um, the, an injection with an expiry date is is not the need of the hour we need to replace it so yes we need to replace parenting techniques have changed uh, strategies have changed in fact nowadays parents are to be involved more in the education process of the children so for that we need their cooperation so it is one part that should not be missed at any any cost for that matter now uh, not taking much of your time i would like uh, that every teacher should take a pledge that they will apply all the knowledge and experience for the benefit of the child so that they are not fallen into the, into the twin trap of misjudgment and ment and not only this this will help them to focus on their strength reduce their weaknesses emphasize on optimism and positivity and cater to the emotional needs by emphasizing on the acquisition of life skills show them show each child that use your voice for kindness ears for compassion hands for charity mind for truth and heart for love and we shall be able to create well emotionally balanced human beings with the sensitivity and this will be the greatest service to humanity thank you so much sunita gandhi ma'am for giving me this platform to express my views and uh, make it available or reach out to the la larger educational fraternity thank you so much thank you so much poonam kamdar ma'am for that wonderful presentation and reminder from a counselor's point of view that in today's day and age where children have so much access and you know exposure to so many newer things we have to you know deal with the new parent the new child and as sunita gandhi didi said 
that we can't give him that expired injection. We need to think afresh and we need to think new. Thank you so much. And I'm sure all principals and educators here would remember all your points and apply them in their schools. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to the fifth presenter, Mary Chikala. She is a veteran educator, been here for in this field for over 19 years and spent time in France, China, Kyrgyzstan and Russia. And she has been teaching, she has been a student advisor and youth counselor in universities abroad. And all through her goal for teaching was integral and universal education through enhancing of moral values. Over to Mary Chikala, ma'am. Hello, can you hear me, please? Yes, we can, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Because, um, all right. Um, so, uh, I'm so grateful to be back again at Getty Screen. Of course, this time it is the um, for the international conference. And the theme is how relationships matter. And we may also ask why relationships matter because the one true God exalted be his glory hath wished nothing for himself. So what God has bestowed on us, we relate to others. Relationships matter if you are an authentic human being as the creation of God. Relationships matter if you are a sincere educator. And relationships do matter for every student and learner. Because no human being is an island. And ultimate purpose of everyone is to restate, relate to others in the society but above all in the field of education. So we have here, uh, please, may I have the um, screen? Yes, we have the, sorry, we have the um, screen, uh, the slide two with the keywords uh, that would run through this theme, this topic. So they are gems, spiritual values, virtues, truthfulness, understanding, cooperation, patience, perseverance, reaching out to others, power to change, aligning and being connected to others, relating to each other as a sole purpose, cultural appreciation, gender identity, building future, global citizens, in, uh, sorry, <laughs> connectedness, convictions to change, cooperate and grow. So we have this a beautiful uh, quote, very aptly written by Aristotle, education or educating the heart, that is spirit, is essential. More so, it is the primary goal of any in institution for this would connect and bring people together in basic human relations. And we have this beautiful quote again, man is the supreme talisman lack of a proper education has, however, deprived him of that which he doth inherently possess. So we can ask a few questions. Um, a short, uh, this is a short reflection of this quote. What is the talisman, the precious gem or the charm, which is a person's gift from his creator? What is that which the human being is deprived of? a spiritual education, 
which ultimately connects one human being with another. What are those a person inherently possess? Hidden gems, the most beautiful qualities and virtues. With this question reflection in mind, I would now give a brief outline of this presentation that um, elaborates for the coming few minutes. Yeah, I think the screen is there about the, a brief outline, please, the next slide. Um, I mean, it's not too clear for me on my paper, but I think you all can read it. The first one is actually explanation about the quote on gems. The, the second is a gist of my personal experience. And the third is reaching out to others, um, values. And the next is values-based education. Then cooperation for being, for, okay, for a change, for bringing out a change. Sorry, I have no electricity here, so I'm trying to read <laughs> the small print difficult. Okay, so we have here another beautiful quote based on the virtues and values and the beautiful qualities which God himself has bestowed upon us from the time of our birth. The great being said, regard man as a mind rich in gems of inestimable value. Education can alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit therefrom. So we have here some of these stones and jewels. You might wonder what it is. So some miners find a piece of stone from, of, from gold, silver, or diamond mines, send it to purification, cleaning, processing, and polishing it. Later, a goldsmith shapes it and makes beautiful ornaments. And that's not enough. Someone has to wear it to beautify oneself. Then, only then, then the worth of the, that rough stone containing the gold diamond would become most valuable treasure. Similarly, the inborn and hidden gems of virtues need to shine out through proper education for a child to practically be related to others in the family, in school, and in the wider society. That is nothing but the spiritual education. So the next slide, please. Um, all right, so we have here the a few ideas of my personal experience. So I think you can read it while I'm speaking there. Um, so education that, that has no restrictions has not, um, is not, narrowed down to one's place and country, but, in it, but widened and expanded for creating bonds with all peoples. So the first one is my experience for the past 19 years uh, while teaching English language, how the uh, virtues were um, imparted. Reaching, next, reaching out to others beyond oneself and our nation. The goal beyond um, behind is integral approach values-based learning, inculcating a feeling of unity and global vision. Yesterday, one of the speakers said that degrees are not uh, the main uh, important thing, but uh, moving to other countries, other places, and experiencing life is essential. So that's, that's me, actually. So, so the first experience was like the... Uh, for, my main goal was to help students to help themselves and to make up a challenge, to take up a challenge to learn this auxiliary English language that connects with uh, anyone around the world. Along with the teaching of English, worked with them in developing human values and incorporated the spiritual qualities ensuring better relationships. Goal and my goal and desire had taken fruition with those opportunities that came in front of me, ex especially stepping into foreign countries, as, as being said already. So from 87 to 89, Paris, France, um, opportunity for two years to work with youth in a few schools, and in addition, responded to the needs and initiative of some adults in a 
little town in the outskirts of Paris through informal groups and worked with them to master English speaking skills for a better communication. This initiative was highly appreciated as they saw improvement in themselves to communicate well and relate better with the people of other countries. The next country is Kyrgyzstan, they are in the city Bishkek, 97 to 2005, another nation which was eager to learn English and communicate with the rest of the world and given me a chance to impart educational values with simple conversational English classes, also my classroom language learning at uh, um, American University of Central Asia and for the adults at the Institute of Pedagogy of English Language. Next country is China, 2006 to 17. Another unique experience working in two of the major cities um, named Tianjin in the north and Zhuhai in the um, south of China. Um, this slide, please, later. This slide would be later, please. And um, the teaching the teaching experience for the university students in these major cities related a goal for those diligent hardworking students to set their aims at integral education, who exhibited the qualities of unity, perseverance, and determination for outward goals to establish good relationships with outside world. And um, the increase, the, sorry, the innocence, kindness, and pure-hearted eagerness for higher achievements were a hallmark of deep relationships among those students during those seven years spent there. My overall goal of educational experience, be it through teaching English language and be it French language, were through integral and creative approaches of language learning, at the same time, creating bonds of friendship. At this juncture, we may ask another question. Do relationships matter? Yes, they do. If yes, how? This is the next insight. Out um, the previous one, please. Our education, learning experiences, and thought patterns as well are not, the limited, not limited to just oneself, I and me, but for an outward move. move. That is, towards the human race to build healthy and purposeful relationships. May we have the slide seven, please? No, slide eight, seven, yeah, thank you. And so we have, uh, I mean, this is uh, mentioned, next one, uh, mentioned here about how to reach out to others. First of all, um, through minds, intellectual, through psyche, emotional, reaching to others, um, uh, the hearts, reaching out to the hearts, spiritual and divine, reaching out to society, all kinds of communities, and then reaching out to the nature. So for this, I picked up a few photos that strengthen bonds. Here are some pictures that are shared from different countries where the bond gets strengthened among adults, teachers, students, because of their honest and practical ways of implementing the education methods during the COVID-19 situation. So now we are, we are seeing the slide nine, that is the deeper bonds of friendship that participants in the English Corner program in Vancouver, Canada have developed are proving to be a source of vitality and resilience during the challenging time. This is an example to show how to how it creates a bond and fellowship um, among and deeper relationships among the people of different nations. So here it is. It explains a program for English learners in some language school in Vancouver in the past 15 years has brought together thousands of people to practice English skills by conversing with each other and sharing their insights on important social issues. This helps create deep bond of relationship developed as a source of vitality and in resilience during the challenging time. 
So something our educators could take challenge and initiate in the future is online conversations with students and parents on moral values and necessary topics of social change for building bonds of friendship among students in our country beginning in primary school. The next slide is nine. Another example is a system of cooperation and coordination of students, building relationships with parents and students and through cooperation among themselves. So we have four pictures now, uh, the next one, please. Four pictures with um, different activities that show cooperation between teachers and parents. Slide 10, please. The slide 10, yes, please. Parents with their children who are enrolled in community schools, yes. Um, in the North Sumatra region of Indonesia, conduct in-person lessons to educate children during this pandemic crisis. Next one. Students of a community school in Bangua, Central Africa Republic, study at home. The approach of decentralized schools is opening unexpected doors, says Mr. Mokole. The next one. The teachers at, at a community school in Langatel, Manipur, India, attribute schoolwork. Hello? Yes? Mary, ma'am, if you could please wind up in the next one minute. You are 15 minutes oh. through already. Oh, please, please. Now I need at least two minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay. so we Thank can pass so these photos. We can just, we can just uh, look at these photos which communicate the, the um, um, uh, talk about this communication and interrelatedness. Okay, I just want to come to this other main ideas. So that is um, uh, slide 14 about the building global citizens at uncertain times. What is the role of educators, teachers in fostering good and strong bonds of fellowship? An article published in three years ago by um, Claudia Costin explains further. In addition to acquiring basic cognitive and social emotional skills, a solid global citizenship curriculum should be introduced to the school system even in the developing world and how it connects to a globalized world will be of great value for the students. Okay, next one, 15. Now we have the um, uh, thought about the virtues. Again, this is the main virtues and values. The basis for this reaching out to others in our nation, the big wide world is the values-based education. So this is the truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. I'm just cutting short here because it's only explains about the virtues. And we have the next picture, which is um, uh, the virtues, the gifts of character. There are 52 virtues. And if, if, we, if anyone likes, but it can be shared in the, um, in the chat or maybe later to the participants, please. Yeah, the next one, 17. Um, so thus comes the three-way responsibility for building better and healthier relationships. So for all this value education, for all that I have been speaking about, what is absolutely needed is this three-way relationship um, uh, between, okay, whichever way we want to start, parents, teachers, and student, or stu parents, student, and teacher. So that's very important. Education leaders, principals, teachers, and other leaders, parents, students, all need to cooperate with conviction to bring out a change and take uh, steps to build strong connections among themselves and the outside world, which is the relationship building. So the next one, please. The last one is, to, not the last one, last but one, just please give me another minute. Connection to change and cooperate. So change from self selfishness to broader goals, from narrow-mindedness, being limited to the smallest circle, like my friends, my uh, classmates, my family, my country, towards um, the society and universe. Cooperate with everyone, like teachers, parents, your seniors, and orga organize some um, 
practical plans to bring that change into fruition. Okay, and the last, uh, the next point is grow. Growth is always um, uh, outward, not inward. Therefore, uh, having higher goals beyond oneself, one's own institution, one's own town and even country, this is to say, we have something to give out to reach out to the world there. So especially in this COVID situation, we could even have some connections to other parts of the world through online classes, those who are less opportun opportunate and um, we, as we have got a better um, situation. Okay, the next one is aligning. This is very important. A basic human growth model uh, aligning the previous one. Alignment, we need to know how to relate to people, their surroundings and adapt, the, the more uh, social capabilities. Freedom, um, it means sharing to find and follow their own path, often stepping out of judgments and presentations uh, from themselves and others. The previous slide, please. Personal and social values are essential because without them, we would too easily be led astray by cheap seductions and group pressures. So the next one is the, is this the last model, one. integral education model. You can read it. I think that is uh, very clear. The, also connecting the heart um, and, the, uh, and the people. Okay, so in, in conclusion, I would like to say that whatever be the subject or situation or environment, education should be based on moral virtues. This, this, it's this duty of every teacher, facilitator, and parent. And thank you for giving me the opportunity, dear Dr. Sunita Gandhi, and my dearest Bharti Gandhi, who, where I worked with her, and, uh, uh, and all the team who have been supporting me. Thank you, and for all my thank you, um, dear friends and my supporters and those who have been watching and appreciating. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your presentation. And education, in your case, knows no barriers, knows no boundaries. You have enriched us with your experiences across so many different places. And uh, beginning in pa uh, France, over to China, Kyrgyzstan, and education definitely is borderless. Thank you so much for emphasizing the fact that moral education forms a very integral part of all-round education of a child. Thank you. We now move to the second last speaker of today's session on educating the spirit. This is none other than Chakravati Das from the ISKCON. He's a full-time monk at Sri Sri Radha Rasbihari Temple, ISKCON Juhu. And he will be as a full-time monk with is gone for the past 10 years and as yeah, the community mm. member of ISKCON Juhu yeah. Council Committee and HR Director of ISKCON Juhu present his views on a topic titled Mindful to Mindful. Thank you, and over to Chakravarti Das. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Om Ajnana Timirandasya, Jnananjana Shalakaya, Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmaya Shri. So, Dr. Gandhi, I assume I have 15 minutes, and I'll try to be, you know, brief and finish on time. So mindful to mindful. You know, it's only the, the tone and the modulation which changes, which separates this word. Mindful 
his mind is completely pack but it may not necessarily be productive sometimes if, if you open, open the, the i can hear my voice voice keep going so sometimes if you open your you know cupboard your your locker you see there are so, it's completely pack but you might not be using so many of the thing from past one month from two months from three months so in our consciousness in our mind there are many thoughts like thousands of rivers merging into ocean we have thousands and millions of thoughts whether you are a child of one month or 10 years you are an adult you are an old person thoughts are come you cannot stop thinking so we have to now actually train ourselves obviously under the able guidance where we can think and make our thinking productive for ourselves for people around us for the world and humanity at large our thinking should be productive for everyone it should bring auspiciousness it should bring goodness for everyone so we need to learn to live in present what happens when we dwell too much in the past if you talk with someone about past okay sometimes there are a beautiful memories about the past but most of the time we have seen when we come out with the talks or thoughts of past it brings hard feelings it makes us morose that's why in the past if you are then you are affected with mode of ignorance there are three modes yeah like the like the remote of an air condition as modes fan mode is you meet what whatever different modes are there similarly we are controlled or we function in three modes mode, mode of goodness mode of passion and mode of ignorance the past will bring out more negativity at the same time when you talk about future it's good i mean you need to think about the future otherwise how will we grow how will we strategize how will we plan that's required but at the same time too much thinking about the future will take us to mode of passion which means too much of anxiety for how this will happen how that will happen how will i be able to perform will i be able to protect myself will i be able to safeguard my interest will i be able to earn more profits too much anxiety leads to clogging of thoughts and then you are not you your consciousness becomes very unsettled and there is third mode which is the mode of goodness when you are in present take a little bit of past experience learning think about a little bit of future strategize but stay more in present you cannot be all in past you cannot be all in future and you cannot also be all in present you need all three but at least 60 to 70% should be present as they say the common sense the most uncommon the most rare thing in the world is common sense and why people are lacking that today i've seen people you know who are like my grandfathers they used to take decisions like this and majority of the people now also there are people who take quick decisions not hasty decision i'm talking about decision you know spontaneous but good decisions well thought of because of they are seeing what is now they are present but because today's generation not only today's generation you know going on from quite some time we are thinking too much about future too much creates lot of anxiety and now if you come to a situation where you have to educate a child imagine a child who is 10 years old he is always dwelling in future 
oh i want to become a bollywood star i want to become a hollywood star i want to become a sportsman i want to become a doctor too much and then is not able to focus what's going on you know day dreaming very big concept so he's not able to focus and that's why he is not happy so anyone who can stay more in the present becomes very satisfied serene sort of tranquility you can understand that from his face you look at his face looks so happy so peaceful so serene like a quiet ocean when you are quiet in that way you can think much better you can be more productive you can uh, think more because you are set right now all of you are able to see me hear me and i am able to peacefully talk why because the ground on which we are sitting it is settled immediately suppose there's an earthquake here where i'm sitting the building will start shaking because the earth is shaking what will happen to me will i be able to focus peacefully no so that is why the mind and the consciousness first has to settle down many because i have conducted you know value education contest in more than 300 schools in india this year we went online we went to global all the teachers all the parents all the students have one concern memory concentration take an example this cap of a pen if i put the cap like this it stays why because my hand is settled it's stable so this is the mind or the consciousness of the student and this is the knowledge teacher is giving if teacher gives the knowledge and the students are more in mode of you know goodness more in present then they will absorb it keep it whenever exams come they will use it and because they have absorbed it nicely even though they will use it for exam still the knowledge will be with them and that's how learning takes place that how that's how the concept will sink in deeper in their consciousness and teacher would have made a life long you know impact on the child but imagine a situation where the consciousness the mind is shaking it's too much of thoughts of future and past the knowledge will just be given and fall it's not a memory it's not concentration it's that the kids the adults everyone today in the world is facing same challenge now because i don't have much time how to come to that level let us discuss a solution this is the problem but how to come to that level where we come from you know shift from it has to be a paradigm shift shift from past shift from future to present where you will be the happiest person on the planet you will really enjoy everything how many of us actually go out in the morning and and relish the sunrise how many of us relish the sunset do we have time no it's so beautiful when we see the pictures the sunset the sunrise the full moon it's so amazing whenever there is full moon we stay in a temple and we go for an aarti it's a morning ceremony 4:30 in the morning so when we come it's a full moon day when we when you come in the temple there's a beautiful courtyard and moon shines on the full moon it's so beautiful that makes you happy that makes you more productive so how do we come to that level that is what we need to discuss so i'll take few more minutes talking about four step formula how do we reach it so there in in sanskrit there are three words in sanskrit sambandha abhidya and prayojan i'll explain this sambandha means relationship what is my relationship with the creator what is my relationship with the nature what is nature's relationship with the creator it's a triangle all three the creator the nature 
the soul what is the living what is the na- connection what is relationship and similarly my relationship with every other soul all of you what is my relationship that has to be known and then what is the final goal the prayojan the third step and the way to achieve that is called abhidhya the the process itself so if we understand the relationship if we know what is the goal of life and if we know the process we are a sure shot 100% successful person we will live a successful life and attain the best destination how do we go at there are four steps the most important and the first step is knowledge we need to have knowledge now whether you are one day old you are 10 years old you are 50 years old you are 100 years old you should have knowledge who am i why do i exist what is my connection with my family what is my connection with the world what is my connection with the nature and my connection with the god was there so that knowledge can come in two ways actually knowledge comes from the teacher so my pranams to all the teachers in the world i'm always grateful to all the teachers who have given me knowledge and we should be they gives us knowledge so there are different kinds of knowledge categorized in two broad categories the knowledge related to body and this world which is called material knowledge and there is anti material which is spiritual knowledge. we need both we need to survive in this world so we need material knowledge and also we need to be happy for that we need spiritual knowledge so knowledge is imparted by teacher either we can hear from teacher like i'm speaking you are hearing or we can read the books of teachers so i my life got transformed by reading shrimad bhagavad gita given by the founder acharya of international society for krishna consciousness his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami shri so there's a first step once you get the knowledge then you meditate on it you meditate on the knowledge and you understand you realize go inside if you go inside outside you can do much more you see the ocean ocean can bring out tsunami why because ocean is very deep and calm if we are deep and calm at our consciousness level at our heart in our mind then we can do so many activities because we are deep and calm so after knowledge we need to meditate now many people think what do we meditate on there's a confusion so that's why knowledge is there so the best meditation for this age this is kaliyuga for this age the best meditation given by the best spiritual teachers and the lord himself the creator himself is to chant you vibrate you have a tongue you have a ear you vibrate this sound and hear what is that sound it's hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare and it is it is nothing to do with any religion it has nothing to do with any caste creed color or the nation it's just name of god god is god you can give any name there are unlimited names of god but because he is all attractive he attracts everyone in the world that is why his primary name becomes krishna one who attracts hare is the name of energy ram is the quality is an attribute of god who gives bliss who gives happiness to others so that is why hare krishna and ram so i am chanting i am vibrating this mantra i'm doing this mantra meditation technique every day 2 hours from last 15 years and i have given to others i have seen the result marvelous just superb people have become happy from hippies and prabhupad shila prabhupad went to bhaktivedan swami prabhupad went to america in 1965 there was a hippie movement most of you know hippie movement and he made them into happy just by chanting this hare krishna hare krishna chakravarti krishna, das krishna, krishna, krishna. ji if you could Wrap just up. one minute just one minute yeah thank so you so this you. this mantra if you could vibrate every day in the morning even a child can do that will bring him 
and there has been there has been a, a scientific study i have a thesis done in american university one of the student that how when you chant this mantra you actually immediately become serene you know become tranquil when when you get this mantra you also need a support and the support comes with the food what kind of food we are eating the so food also is categorized in shrimad bhagavad gita i mentioned food is categorized in mode of ignorance mode of passion mode of goodness if you are eating the food which is in the lower modes then your thoughts will go down your consciousness will go down if you eat food which is of high consciousness even food has consciousness it affects your consciousness food like vegetables food like fruits grains milk products they are best and all the nutrients are given to eat that your thought process will change and the fourth is introspection why introspection after all this what is changing in my life is there some change and if change is there go and give it to others so the four steps is introspection and after you do all these four steps you will get best results you will be so happy and then what you want to do people all of the human beings by nature we have one nature when we are happy we want to bless and make everyone happy sarve sukhina bhavantu everyone in the world should be happy and then everyone will cooperate there will be a team spirit and bliss spreading everywhere hare krishna hare krishna chakra thank you dr gandhi thank you for explaining so clearly the concept of mindful to mindful this generation all of us delve too much on the future with no or less focus on the present and you have told us about the four step formula that makes the mind and consciousness settle down thank you so much again hari krishna the last presenter today is sweta pathankar from pune maharashtra india she would be presenting on could you share your topic with us please shweta pathankar ji you are working at the pan level pan india level i would say rather in upgrading the teacher fraternity and your topic is teachers are mind engineers teachers are life directors over yeah, to you is, yeah thank you so much ma'am I'm Shweta Pathankar. Yes, I'm working on a pan-India level, not only pan-India level, globally as well, uplifting the teachers' morale, creating teacher fraternity to teach equally everywhere. It's been a long journey of 26 years, heading currently as a principal of SNBP International School, Pune branch. My topic is the future makers, and I hope my screen is visible. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is, ma'am. Please okay. go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to all the eminent personalities who have gathered in this conference, thirteenth Ed Leadership International Virtual Conference, organized by Gaty. The topic, the future makers, I selected today to speak to all of you with a reason. What are teachers? i always believe teachers are the mind engineers teachers are the life directors why are we calling them mind engineers why are we calling them as life directors the only reason is they are nurturing the young generation they are nurturing those tender minds and heart and they are the ones where the children really follow believe and actually keep faith on so the teachers become the engineers they are the directors and teaching is one profession 
that actually makes all the other professions live, gives the foundation to every other profession. When I come to my next slide, I believe education is global by its nature. When I say that it is global by its nature, I mean its transformative effects of technology have been visible during these times. The paradigm shift from an industrial manual and teacher-driven education sector to a completely shifting to learner-driven, student-centered and engaging education has now become the pivot for everyone to think, reflect, work towards it and form the foundation. So yes, education is really global by nature. I mean this, these are the five fingers. They all are different. These could be the institutions, teachers, different associations. But then they are at a different level of teaching, engaging students, putting them into different, different value systems, discipline. But I believe that as an educator, if we come together, then probably these can be at one leverage. That's what would be more global, more universal. And that's what I am very appreciative about Gaty doing it, pulling in international conferences with their global dream, talking to the underprivileged students and making them come to the same platform can we, the future makers, even be on this platform together, not just being like this, but probably being more like this. So we can have a similarity. We can be divergent, but yet we can be together to empower and nourish the tender minds and hearts. Till now, it has always been what? Then we think how, and then we think why. What is, could be a content, a textbook? How, how to teach that teaching methods? And then we start thinking, why are we doing it? What are the learning outcomes with the children, the next future? Can we really change this? And believe me, this change works. Can we think why first? Then we plan how to go about it. And then can we reflect what exactly is required to do that why and how for the Generation Z. This would change the shift, the paradigm shift of our complete education system. The Generation Z learners how very different than what we were as learners or today what we were, we are as facilitators and educators. They are born with smartphones, tablets and computers. They are Generation Z. They are born in the global age, the Google age, GA. They are social entrepreneurs. They like learning, but which is full of meaning and with purpose. They don't really have any kind of status quo. They are born into an information regulation where artificial intelligence, self-driving and other things and virtual infatuation is there with them. And they are really learning good. They like to make and create. They want to connect, collaborate and share. They have a very big social circle, which is actually global. It's beyond even the thinking where they get connected, to whom they get connected, from where they learn. But this is it. They are Generation Z. Actually, they are not techno savvy. They are just more dependent on technology. They use technology for every single thing. Google Uncle is they are more friendly person than the teacher in the class. 
they do not write long texts. They speak in terms of images, emojis, and their favorite things could be YouTube's and Instagrams. Their attention span is also very less. They like to take information in small bits and chunks. Eight minute is the attention span of this generation's e-learners. And this has been very well proven by various surveys. Even the Finnish schools have been proving it. So my point is, what as leaders, as teachers, are we really ready to accept and teach and facilitate the learning for this generation Z? The question arises, and this will always linger with generations and more smart techno generations coming up, the indigo children's coming up. I have a small little slide which says a story. A mouse was put into a jar filled with cranes. The mouse was so happy. The mouse jumped into it. Everything was available for that mouse. The food, air, nice environment, happy. Slowly the mouse started consuming the rice and it went towards the bottom. After some years, to some months probably, as time passed by, the cranes were over. Now what? The mouse was trapped. The mouse was trapped. Please connect this to us as teachers. Please connect this. So what are we actually up to? Now we were, the mouse was dependent on somebody to feed him. Now the mouse couldn't come out. So are the short-term pleasures as teachers going to lead us with this generation, the future learners we are creating? We are bound with this profession. We are dedicated. The, the foremost role to be played is to create that generation with values, ethics, moral, knowledge, wisdom, everything. So are we really doing it? Or like a mouse, have we got trapped ourselves into the comfort of our traditional knowledge, of the ways we were teaching, or the ways we were learning as students when we were small students? Is this way and mode of survival going to nourish the future generation, or have we got trapped in our own selves? If not, then we need to take the right action at the right time. So my dear teachers, listeners, educators across the globe, we need to empower ourselves, update with various kinds of knowledge and skill, learn different methods of teaching. But as I said, first begin with the why, not with the content or what. Why am I teaching this topic? Why do I need to really do, do this? Understand the need of the generation next and keep learning, 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 reading. That's what will keep you with the pace of this next generation. They need us. I heard one of the speaker in the morning saying, is there something that the children cannot find at a mouse click? Honey, I shrunk the little kids. So I would say the little mouse has shrunken the whole globe. So isn't this something which is really not available to a child who can read at a mouse click? Everything, each and everything, all knowledge is available. But then the child is getting absorbed as a small sponge with every litter, good or bad, into it. So as teachers, we need to develop in them that spirit to take what is required, what is really now the part and why is it required so they themselves know very well, he, okay, this is my part, my chunk to learn and I am really developing and growing. With the blessings, new NEP National Education Policy 2020 is now the game changer. 
it's the last gear of the century. The way NEP has projected the person of a teacher and the person of a learner will really bring a lot of shift and change across the country. Probably India then become becoming one of the leaders of education leading globe. Project-based education, skill-based learning, child-centric learning, more training and emphasis given on teachers, innovative thinking, out-of-the-box skill making, divergent yet very universal is what the policy has been stating. And I really believe it's going to be a game I am very sure we all know STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths. And we really have been adopting it in the last a decade, I suppose. We have been working towards it. There are beliefs that I'm not an engineer. Why am I supposed to do STEM? I am a person of humanities. Why is the STEM on to me with science? because it's integrated, because it's all interdisciplinary, because it's fully, fully about now art integrated curriculum, whether you be a science student to technology, humanities, common anywhere across the trades of education. But this is on the forefront, but I believe it will be more a STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and maths. Because now it's art integrated. And with NEP, a child will be designing the curriculum. With NEP and the policy of education, the teacher, the future teachers taking courses and doing their graduation, post-graduation and acquiring their degrees will simultaneously be learning psychology, will be learning how to put up this knowledge across to the students with the teacher-based curriculum. So they will be training themselves. I till now believe, and I am a firm believer, a beard and beard courses and MED courses are fast food. They are not being training teachers to actually professionally take the course and then be the facilitators for our future generation. So this change has to be there into the BAD curriculums as well. So it will take the paradigm shift. And this is the need of the hour. The change in the system. I the put a teacher's a attitude towards the students and understanding the requirement. Be the change we wish to see. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see. We as teachers need to be the change we really wish to see. That change has to come into us. We need to be the gear ones. We have to pick up Preta ourselves. ma'am. Done. Ma I have to interrupt you. Done. <laughs> so we Thank need to you. put ourselves to the last gear and bring that change. And, and together we can make it. Thank you so much, Sushmita ma'am. That's done. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Together we shall and we will make the change. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And yes, we have to make the teaching learning process both integrated and interdisciplinary. And the NEP 2020 will indeed be a game changer. The little mouse has definitely crowned the world. I love that. Yes. Thank you. We are through with all the seven speakers today's session on educating the spirit. So over to the Ed Leadership Headquarters. Can we take some questions if they are there? Any questions? Well, I think we have already jumped the timeline and we are 20 minutes over time. And in case you have any questions, you can please write to Getty and they would put them through to the, 
the presenters. Thank you so much for this very enriching session. Thank you and Jai Jagat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being patient. And thank you so much to the Gaiti team and Sunita Gandhi, ma'am, for giving an opportunity. It was a pleasure being on your platform. Thank you so much. I second that. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. Hare Krishna to everyone. Have a lovely day. Thank you, you. Thank you. Have a great day to everyone. I'm Basu. And thank you, our very esteemed speakers. Such an enriching session. And before we uh, culminate, this is actually not the conclusion. I would just like to, I came across these lines and I just want to share it with you that to accomplish great things, we need not just act, but also dream. So we have walked along the session, the sixth round table, highlighting the team, theme, educating the spirit. And uh, we have the teacher's presentation coming up to show how all the efforts that we as teachers make within our classrooms to culminate and take a shape. So this presentation is of data-led innovative classroom practices and action research work by the teachers of City International School. And uh, please have a look. But before that, I just want to share this very interesting data with you. Uh, yesterday, 13th Ed Leadership International Roundtable had been attended by nearly 9,000 school heads and educators. Yes, you've heard it right. 9,000 school heads and educators, 50 plus countries. This includes 2,938 registered viewers on Zoom yesterday, 3,200 views on Facebook, 2,600 views on YouTube, and this is the data which I'm telling of yesterday's proceedings. So please spread the word so that more education leaders, policymakers, teachers, education enthusiasts, and experts, NGOs, embassy foundations, and corporates may join the remaining days of deliberation today and two days of leadership. and numeracy it is so encouraging and this is all the support we are getting from you and uh, before the presentation i would again like to thank our sponsors learning a to z s chan ufis learning ratna sagar and of course our media partner digital learning so over to the presentation and then we come back sharp at 225 we we'll log in five minutes before. In fact, I would request you to keep yourself logged in. Uh, quickly uh, grab something and then we are back to another enriching session, 2.30 sharp. Thank you so much. Yes, and please stay for, just stay up for the presentation. We are just there. Good morning. The strength of our student relationship makes the difference in translating our passion for teaching into their passion for learning. A very good afternoon to one and all present in this 13th Ed Leadership Roundtable Conference. I'm Temina Taskeen, science teacher in City International School, Manas City in Ranagar, Lucknow. I have been given the privilege to present my action research in front of all the great leaders and educators and on the topic of e-learning and virtual classroom. Let me share my PPT. So e-learning and virtual classroom is my action research topic. Because of this COVID pandemic, it's been observed that technology has played a major role in our students as well as in the teacher's life. Teaching through technology brings out interest and curiosity to know more about the topic. In this pandemic, we used to take our classes on various platforms like Microsoft Teams, Zoom, etc. Also, we pre-planned the subject topic in the form of pair deck presentations. 
with the help of these periodic presentations it becomes very easy to teach students and to calm their curiosity by adding different images and videos into our presentation say meena ma'am your attention yes, ma please yes ma'am we are not able to see your screen so you need to screen share your presentation thank you i'm sorry i'm sorry it's okay ma'am thank you I hope this is uh, you all can see my uh, presentation. Is that visible to everyone? Yes. 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 Sir. Thank you so much. Now, in my research work, I started with very basic assumption to measure the effect of e-learning tools on the students during the entire online era. The objective was to make classes. interactive and demonstrate the subject matter in a style that would not only appeal but engage and inspire my students towards full attendance and class participation various e tools used in the research were google forms survey hearts and to check their pre test and post test effects i also try to measure the effectiveness of the lesson delivered with the help of these tools it was a very surprising outcome that involving students actively in the process of learning rose the motivation and students actually encouraged their peers which resulted in leveling up the attendance and participation e learning not only provides study materials or e tools for evaluation and assessment but also makes a great impact on child's mind at his has uh, e age with on other hand grooming their personalities and by making them confident i have done my action research on grade 7 students and have provided them the google forms which contain 10 mcqs google form students will come to know about their scores then and there and also which tells in which part the topic of the topic they were weaker and the control of error can be done before post test the outcome of my research clears that children are performing well in their post test when they have been asked to take help of internet the graph shows how much they find e learning interesting hence e learning tools are better help for creating enthusiasm and interest among the students and also shows the impact on strength of the class here are the some evidences which i have attached to my presentation the feedback given by the parents on e learning so i here by conclude e learning is not intended to replace conventional methods and learning in classrooms its aim is to create an augmented learning environment where technology is used to deliver a combined range of teaching and learning techniques aimed at maximizing the individual's participation it has given opportunity to use internet as an effective tool for their learnings thank you so much for any query you can mail me on tamina.taskin@gmail.com thank you so much
Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Today I'm here, Jyotsna. I'm Jyotsna from City International School, Indranagar. Today I'm here to throw a light on my research work, and the topic is pros and cons of online teaching. As we all know, as we all know, COVID has resulted in the school shuts all across the world. Billions of students are out of the classroom who were used to the classroom learning. This pandemic has affected not only the students, but also the teachers and the parents who, who were struggling a lot to teach their children. It is really difficult for all of us to carry on both teaching and learning process effectively. The aim of my intervention is in the early stages of teaching in this pandemic, we face a lot of problems due to lack of interaction with the students. We are unable to solve their queries immediately. We are not able to tease them effectively as we are doing in our physical classes. The expected outcome of my intervention was is we are that after um, after utilizing the after using and applying different teaching aids we can see the different changes in the education it enhances the learning ability and their performance as teaching learning and teaching and learning process is undertaken on the digital platform it reduces the burden of the parents too this the coronavirus is termed as covid-19 has declared was declared as pandemic by World Health Organization officially on March 12, 2020. The effects of online teaching as a coin has two faces. Similarly, the online teaching and learning also has different advantages and disadvantages also. So these are the effects of online teaching in the context with the students, in the context with teachers and in the context with parents. So here are different pro, pros and cons of in the context with these students. Um, we can see that with the widespread of uh, Wi-Fi connection, students uh, can logged in from anywhere in the world. Online classes have immediately eliminated their time and cost as which they require to reach to the school. And now they can use it in the productive work. And there are different uh, disadvantages also as the students have to be self-disciplined and the online classes lack on one-to-one -one teaching means there is a lack of communication between the students and the teachers. And nowadays they are using uh, phones for at least for minimum five to six hours, which is putting a bad adverse effect on their health also. Now here, this is my next one. These are the disadvantages and disadvantage in the context with the teachers teachers are uh, teachers can better organize their classes there are disadvantages also they are students sometimes feel isolated as they are in not in direct contact with the uh, teachers these are the some points some advantages and disadvantages where the in the with the context of the parents parents can develop a bonding with their child um, by in the online teaching, they can monitor and the teaching skills and teachers attentiveness towards their child. They can physically monitor, monitor their child's skill. Uh, at the same time, they, this, uh, they are facing the disadvantages also because uh, students are using the misuse of technology. They are the parents daily routine is uh, interrupting. And this is the pre-test which we have conducted. Uh, I have conducted the pre-test on WhatsApp where they are more dependent on the WhatsApp for, uh, with the, for the, on the parents for the explanation. Later on, when I conducted the post-test, these are the glimpses of my pre-test. And later on, when I conducted the post-test after applying different teaching aids, with the high tech and efficient software, I found that the classroom become more interactive. He, they were, there is a healthy conversation between us and I'm able to solve their queries at, at the same time, which resulted in the better performance and efficient learning. 
these are the few slides where they have shown a better performance and these are the activities which they have done and later on i just conclude this and thus we can conclude that online platform has proved that nothing can stop the knowledge sharing and education process when three direct crucial stakeholders uh, are there that is the students parents and teachers gear themselves to channelize the efforts and learning to of the students in all the situation with adapting to the newer sources so for any query you can contact me on my email id that is jvcsba2306 at the rate gmail.com and now i just want to play a video good morning everyone today i am dushi patel is here to tell you about our ongoing online classes on the classes we are having on zoom are far better than the classes we were having on whatsapp on zoom we have direct interaction with our teachers our teachers are also giving their best to explain us they explain us with a lot of activities videos and many more our teachers are solving our queries in a very creative way i would like to conclude by saying that during our online classes we feel like we are sitting and learning in our offline classes thank you to all the teachers for making learning fun during online classes thank you now i want to wind up end up with this quote if you are not willing to learn no one can help you if you are determined to learn no one can stop you thank you so much thank you jyotsna ma'am is just a reminder to everybody please check the chat chat box for the feedback form the link is there and you shall also be finding the link for the fellowships award too this will be for our giveaway it's the feedback form for round table 6 
I am water to humans. I'm simply just there. I am something they just take for granted. But there's only so much of me and more and more of them every single day. I start as rain in the mountains, flow to the rivers and streams, and end up in the ocean. Then the cycle begins again, and it will take me another 10,000 years to get back to the state I am in now. But to humans, I'm just water. Where will humans find me when there are millions more of them? Where will they find themselves? Will they wage wars over me, just like they do over everything else? That's always an option, but that's not the only option. Nature doesn't need people. People need nature. Mark Twain said, and I quote, the great Mississippi, the majestic, the magnificent Mississippi, rolling its mile wide tide along, shining in the sun. Unquote. I am magic moving, a part of the very earth itself. My waters can't be bound by human-made boundaries as I flow without discriminating between regions and religions. May peace and unity prevail in all the countries of North America. May unity prevail on earth. The love of God towards yourself is like the Amazon River, which flows down to water, a single daisy. The song of the river ends not at the banks, but in the hearts of those who love peace. The soothing music of the flowing waves tickles the souls of the people. It pushes the boundaries, dividing people and aligns them. Uniformity in love, harmony, and peace. May peace and unity prevail in all the countries of South America. May unity prevail on earth. Never did the sun more beautifully steep in its first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Never saw I never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. The path to peace flows like me. The river tames and because it resists nothing, it has won even before it has begun. So surrender yourself to the flow of river of life. May peace and unity prevail in all the countries of Europe. May unity prevail on earth. I am Ganges, the water of immortality, a river with over a hundred names. I am a window into India's culture. I am considered as a mother and a goddess. Myths depict me as a heavenly river. My holy water is used for spiritual causes. People rely on me for birth, rituals, and even death. I am the symbol of peace, unity, purity, trust, life, and brotherhood. May peace and unity prevail in all the countries of Asia. 
May unity prevail on earth. Go with the flow. Immerse yourself in nature. Slow down and meander. Go around the obstacles. Be thoughtful of those downstream. Stay current. The beauty is in the journey. Oh humans, be like me. The river Nile. The world needs healers, helpers and brothers. Rivers never go reverse. So forget the past and focus on building a better present. May peace and unity prevail in all the countries of Africa. May unity prevail on earth. I am your ray and I flow along with darling. You humans need me for survival and I am a symbol of unification. My murmuring sound is the symphony of peace. But remember that it isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. May peace and unity prevail in all the countries of Oceania. May unity prevail on earth. I am water. I am most of this planet. I shape it. Every stream, every cloud, and every raindrop. It all comes back to me, one way or another. Every living thing here needs me. I am the source. Humans, they are no different. I don't owe them a thing. I give, they take. But I can always take back. That's just the way it has always been. It's not their planet anyway. Never was, never will be. But humans, they take more than their share. They poison me. Then they expect me to feed them. Well, it doesn't work that way if humans want to exist in nature. With me and off me. I suggest they listen close and I'm only going to say this once. If nature isn't kept healthy, humans won't survive. May peace and unity prevail on earth. Let's feel the same. Let me help each other. 
down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A plan baked by actions makes your dreams come true. Glad to have you all back joining us to this post-lunch session filled with hopes and dreams that we all share. Once again, I extend our most hospitable, though virtual, welcome to all our delegates after lunch. 
At the 13th Ed Leadership International Roundtable, we create conversations that lead to meaningful change. We also share research and good work in education worldwide. The 13th Ed Leadership is relevant even more in the wake of India's new education policy, which is progressive and forward looking. This year's Ed Leadership is the largest online education event in India with more than 80 most powerful presenters from 50 plus countries sharing their best and next practices. Education needs a new renaissance. Circumstances are impressing upon us to reinvent the teacher within us, to change our expectations from education in many deep and profound ways. Surely we want to link education better to life's purpose, develop deeper and more meaningful relationships, set and meet new standards and aspire to a new normal. Guided by the new education policy, clearly it's a time to reimagine, restructure, and to recreate a new and more meaningful education. I welcome you all to the seventh round table and all encompassing education. We have with us Ma'am Anuja Srivastava, all the way from Ayodhya, who will be chairing the seventh round table she is the CBC teacher trainer, assistant director, Jingle Bell Nursery School Society. She has a wide experience of teaching and administration at almost all levels of school education. She is currently working as the assistant director, Jingle Bell Nursery School Society, Faizabad, Ayodhya. She has done whole school reviews for various educational institutions and is a CBSC teacher trainer. She has, to her credit, several published research papers and has conducted several workshops and leadership programs throughout the country, besides being involved in educational consultancy and school interventions. Over to you, Anuja, ma'am, for this roundtable. Thank you, ma'am, for your introduction. Uh, a very warm good afternoon to Getty and all the eminent educators from all over the world. I take pleasure in introducing the Roundtable 7th theme, that is an all-encompassing education, a very relevant theme for the world indeed, and especially for the educators of today, as it will enable them not only to inculcate the creativity, the research attitude, and knowledge in students, but also identify the uh, talent to stimulate a passion for what suits them most and enhance them. So without taking much of your time, uh, let's move to the session and know about the wonderful thought and work of today's speakers. So our first speaker of Roundtable 7 is Dr. Dr. Ruby Bakshi Khurdi from Switzerland. Dr. Ruby Bakshi Khurdi is a highly acclaimed powerful speaker on emotional intelligence and women empowerment in the global market. He the safety of many national and international awards for successful workshops across the world in United States nations, Geneva, London, Bahrain, Amsterdam, India, Nepal, China, Paris, Portugal, and Prague. Her contribution towards education and society has been recognized by the World Book of Records, UK. She is serving as Honorary Vice President of Global Goodwill Ambassadors Chairperson, All Ladies League, Women Economic Forum, Ambassador Female Wave of Change, and Defense Watches. She was featured on cover page of Elite Business Women magazine 
and Wow India. He has been interviewed on radio, TV, and various magazines as a global inspirational educationist. So over to you, Dr. Ruby. Namaskar, everyone. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. So, namaskar, everyone. Um, it's really, really an honor to be here amongst all of you. I'm really looking forward uh, to tell people about what is emotional intelligence. But first of all, thank you so much, Anuja Shrivastuji, for such a wonderful welcome and such. Uh, I was feeling elated just listening. You know, when you do some things, you just are in the process of doing them. But when someone else is telling your, uh, you know, things that you have been doing, it really feels good that yes, I have done so much, but I still have miles to go and keep doing. You know, so yes, during these unprecedented times of COVID nineteen, you know, it's really something which is. very very important for all of us to understand and make sure that when it is happening like this what needs to be done how it can be better off what can be a nice way to connect with the people and that's why i talk about emotional intelligence covid 19 has been a challenging time but still it taught us lot of things it taught us lot of things how to connect how to collaborate and how to keep on going despite the fact that there are calamities happening all over the world my message for all the people who are here today who are watching us who are in this webinar who will be watching us later on is it's all about social distancing yes we have to be safe we have to be careful practice social distancing but connect emotionally only when you connect emotionally you can understand what all things you can do for the betterment of society for the betterment of first yourself and then do the things which are a needed a needed thing to be done as quickly as possible i'll be sharing my screen with you to give you a little bit of more of an idea what is emotional intelligence and how do we understand the do's and don'ts the drives of emotional intelligence as i said emotional intelligence is something that is you have within you you understand it but what happens is with passage of time we get so engrossed with other things that it just takes a you know uh, it just goes different ways different parameters different things keep on coming up so it is the need of the hour that we first need to understand what is emotional intelligence so that we can work on it right now i can see that there are 200 plus participants over here everyone is buzzing with excitement but i'm sure you will easily identify from these emojis which is one of the best ways to communicate these days is with a feeling we are all emotional beings we can connect with each other on the basis of what is going on in our minds in our brains and that is what is emotions but then we have to control our emotions we have to have an idea we have to have an ideology how we can work on them and that's the science of emotional intelligence the ability to identify and manage your own emotions and understand the emotions of others so only when you are at peace with yourself you will be able to do good things you will be able to do wonderful things for the people this was clearly explained by mr daniel goldman he is known as the father of emotion intelligence because he was the one who actually started emphasizing you can do any kind of work from the people if you are the leader or if you are the manager but if you get them to do it by connecting with them emotionally you will definitely see the wonders you will definitely see the benefits you will get the results which will be really much much better than if you would just be commanding them as a teacher as a manager or as a supervisor later on it was dr travis bradbury who really worked on it who really emphasized on it little bit more in detail in terms of breaking it into two main competencies we are all human beings we are all social beings we have a great mix of these two competencies in each and every one of us 
with passage of time we need to develop these two main competencies personal competency and social competency and if you see each one of us has a clearer idea about how to develop our own self you must have seen lot of people are doing yoga these days talking about mindfulness talking about how to be at peace with yourself these are all small things which are moving towards more bigger and meaningful future the need of the hour is to connect with yourself have that confidence that yes i can do it because it's always us we are always doubting our own credibility especially as teachers you know you are the torch bearers you are the people who are building the future leaders so it's very important for you to inculcate the right kind of mindset inculcate the right kind of characteristics in our budding leaders of tomorrow so that they are confident so that they feel mentally and socially stable it's very very common we see sometimes whatever we are doing we always want others approval for that is it okay am i looking good is it fine so if we don't have to always look for others approval i would encourage you to use the chat windows if there is anything that you are resonating with please use chat windows to write what you feel what you are going through because only when you communicate only when you spit out whatever is going on within you you are able to develop better you are able to understand better so self awareness is first you being at peace with yourself and thereafter you are trying to manage it for better purposes and that's one of the main roles of all the teachers especially during pandemic when the whole world was going through this strange phase of dilemma strange phase of confusion anger you know it were the teachers who were like the ray of hope clinging together and world became a smaller place i sitting in switzerland got connected with so many people from the teaching fraternity all over the world and we were discussing amongst each other what is the best way to guide our students to be connected with our students so that they don't feel that something is missing yes in the beginning when everyone was kind of you know struggling we were not knowing which is the best way to connect so it's normal it's very very normal the need of the hour is to see how we can inculcate and go for the betterment of overall thing thereafter we started looking for something better and moving on to social awareness once we are at peace once we know what is good what is for the betterment we have to empathize with the people who are around us and that's what we are doing exactly right now thank you to dr sunita gandhi for initiating this program and creating a social awareness on a larger scale you are empathizing with the people you are empathizing with the global world what can we do by sharing the expertise of people from all over so we are trying to have like a inspirational leadership only when you know the best practices followed in a particular part of the world you can be doing those in the rest of the world so this era is about meaningful collaborations meaningful teamwork and of course building bonds bonds in any way whatever way you feel whatever way you feel it's a right way to connect it's a right way to organize just do it don't think because what happens is when we take too much time in thinking when we take too much time in understanding is it okay not okay should i do this should i not maybe you miss the train so i know we are all from from lucknow most of us are from lucknow i'm very proud that even i am from lucknow so we don't have to be in the pehle aap train <laughs> it's fine we are respectful we give priority to the other people but don't take too much time act it's the hour of acting pehle aap is good when you are giving respect you are showing your hospitality for the other person but when the whole world is going through pandemic the need of the hour is coming together and taking action doing something which will really bring about the desired change and as the torch bearers for our students it is important that teachers have to be really very well connected because you are the one who are going to be inculcating the right kind of skills for our future leaders 
so it's very very important that whatever you do whatever things you are understanding whatever things you are trying to inculcate in the people have a good mix of personal competency and social competency only when you have a great mix of these two criteria these two competencies you will be able to develop our children in a much responsible manner managing emotional crises is something you know which we all go through when everything is great you know we are happy stomach are filled pet bhare hue hain har koi khush rehta hai but the moment we have hunger we have limited resources problem starts happening at that point of time it's during those phases we go through the first three stages that you see clearly disbelief anger sadness because you don't know what to do kya kar sakte hain how can we go about how can we bring about a change most of us go in the self denial stage most of us show our frustration by spitting out anger we all went through this phase in february 2020 the whole world was going through this phase what we see here the first three oh hey hi it was during that time it was during at that time that we thought about it has to be over it will be over we shall definitely overcome this obstacle just as we have done in the past only when we have a good command over our own self it's during march 2020 i conceptualized this theory it is 3e theory i call it 3e theory because it is something which is only which is solely in your hands practicing anything lies solely in your hands it's like you know you have on one side you have your brain on the other side you have your heart so when you take a decision you take a decision both with your heart as well as with your brain you have to connect and at the same time do not just go with your gut feeling keep your eyes and ears open theek se dekhiye theek se samjhiye and only then you will be able to empathize and practice it so i call it dr ruby's 3e theory which is something i felt instant connection with all over the people i i appeared in the newspapers as well as in tv i had a good interview with uh, tv channels who said what does this theory 3e theory stand about what can we do to make it a plus plus so the 3e theory stands for the number one educate what you all are doing all you dignitaries from all over the world are educating new skills educating the life skills i'm just not talking about the degrees in terms of education the academic education i'm talking about overall kinds of skills that you are inculcating in our present generation as well as the people like us we are also in the process of educating ourselves we are also in the process of educating our mindset don't think that now i have a degree in bachelor's masters you are up there no the need is to keep on improving your skills keep on educating yourself so that you also evolve as a person we need to bring about a change because only if we come out of our comfort zone yes very well said sunita ji only when you come out of your comfort zone you can bring about the desired change it's a must as long as we are in the premises we are okay but we are not evolving so educate yourself learn new skills be open learn from your students maybe they know certain things much much better they are more you know aware because of social media you know use the social media in the best possible way there's always the bad side but try to always see the positive side because that will make you more self sufficient the second e stands for empathize we need to empathize sit in the shoes step in the shoes of the people around us only when we empathize we'll be able to understand what best can be done right now when we are all having these virtual classes try to distribute the assignments try to distribute the workload in such a way that people i am talking about all learners all over the world whether it's children primary education secondary higher education or even adults like us who are undergoing training all the times to make it better empathize try to understand how it feels 
sitting in front of your screens for eight to 10 hours continuously and thereafter doing the assignments as well. So distribute the work in such a way so that students don't think of it as a burden. Bring out the new things, maybe connect with them using games. I use a lot of gamification in my classes so that they don't think that they're studying or it is like a burden for them. Try to make them self-sufficient because that will make them feel happy and powerful. So that's my third E, empower. We have to have a good understanding on these three E's. When you empower your students, when you empower your learners, you are connecting with them. You have already built a connection. With the connection, they will work more. They will be motivated to work more. They'll be motivated to do extra leap. And this is only possible if you are in a process of constantly giving the best for your people, whether it's your students or your employees. So the need of the hour is to connect and work on these three E's. Only when you connect and work on these three E's with this educate, empathize and empower. It's really going to reap the benefits. It's really going to increase the productivity. And this is the need of the hour and emphasizing more and more on this because the more we work on it, the better it is for everyone because you're connecting with them and at the same time working on it on a consistent basis. I'm soon going to come out with my book. I'm publishing a book soon where I'm going to be talking about in detail about all these things, how we can help our global fraternity of education to make classes much better, to make the virtual learning much fun, not that a compulsion, but something where they can understand and work more. You can find my videos where they can be, you know, training themselves and understanding themselves better the students, it's for everyone. You can watch the videos and understand my talks on emotional intelligence or connect with me if any of the parents or any of the students want to connect and know more how they can do, what they can do. Please don't hesitate. I'm always there because I always prefer only when we connect, only when we show the right kind of approach to the people, we evolve as people. The need of the hour is... Three E's, and of course, very well said, Swati Bakshi ji, E for enjoyment. <laughs> Thank you. I will definitely put that as well on a side note, that E is also a must, which I do through gamification. Only when students or learners have a bit of fun and enjoyment, teaching becomes fun, teaching becomes, it's like a two-way process. You enjoy as a teacher, and students enjoy listening to you. I proudly say that, you know, in my classes, I have 100% attendance. I'm very proud as a professor, right, teaching human resources management, marketing, and luxury. My teachers, as well as my students, they love being in my class. Why I say my teachers? Because sometimes we have external people who come and sit in our classes to see how we are doing. So it's not about only when you are a principal, as most of you dignitaries who are here, our principals or head of departments or, you know, uh, directors of colleges, you feel you are up there. Never think you are up there because once you feel that, you lose motivation, you lose the challenge, the thrill in life. So the need of the hour is connect emotionally, build relationships. Only when you connect emotionally, you will see the desired change in your students. They will develop, they will have fun. And at the same time, they will evolve as mature people. Because only a person who is mentally and emotionally more stable, he or she will definitely bring about the change. I'll definitely, once my book is published, I'll get in touch with ma'am, with all of you. It will be published so you can always go and read and have a look at the ebook as well. Because it's the need of the hour is to have new ideas, how you can connect. Because only when you connect, you see the magic happening. In my TEDx talk also, I said, EI over AI, emotional intelligence over artificial intelligence. Even though the world needs artificial intelligence, but we have to have a balance between emotions and what we can do with technology. So you have to use technology to evolve, to be better, but do not misuse it. Connect emotionally, 
and the saga will be stronger and much much powerful yes thank you so much swati thank you thank you abdullah ji everyone definitely it's 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 all about caring sharing and collaborating only when you have an idea don't keep it to yourself or don't think i don't have to share because others will be better no if an idea is there evolve it and evolvement only happens like i got this fourth e uh, from swati ji i am going to try that i can see how i can fit in over there because only when you have the fun only when you have the enjoyment of doing what you are doing students are going to be very happy they will definitely enjoy and make the virtual classroom much better place so it's the need of the hour is connect emotionally use your emotional intelligence all teachers do not show power do not show the expertise of i know hum jante hain aap follow karo no you have to connect with your students because only when you connect your students are going to love you your students are going to appreciate you and evolve more towards making a fuller circle they will more make more efforts they'll come up with brighter ideas so try to give them more tasks which evolve going through the information not memorizing the information because the more you give them tasks where you are empowering them where you are giving them the ideas believe me guys they are really going to enjoy and you will see the difference so my appeal to everyone is just connect emotionally with your students not as teachers only but as friends as mentors as their guides as a brother or sister whatever relationship you feel is comfortable develop it go for it and you will see the difference that any pandemic covid 19 or anything will just pass away because you have developed the connection you have developed the session with your students or with your learners anything can become much much better so here is appealing all the teachers to do your best give your best collaborate with each other whatever one person knows person b can share with other person and then the world will really become like a big family you know world is definitely becoming like a big family where we are sharing connecting and making sure that everyone is happy i'll definitely share in my chat window i'll definitely share my um, links where you can connect with me it will be really a pleasure to connect with you all and whatever we can do together it's always a win win thank you so much thank you so much kt for giving this fabulous opportunity i'm really looking forward to hear everyone and make the best of it thank you thank you so much thank you dr ruby it was such a wonderful session we enjoyed every bit of it and especially the point that you spoke about the emotional connect and its importance and also how emotional connect and building relationship will help us develop and evolve as a more mature person that is really important because that is something which will which will help us keep on going in spite of whatever happens in the world and one will feel more empowered and keep on evolving in that way or i also loved your uh, thought on the ai competencies and the four core skills of for regulating self social self management and social skills too and uh, the uh, your uh, practicing uh, three e theory of uh, dr ruby that was really wonderful so all the three points the educate empathize empower or uh, all these uh, three e's and then the fourth one added by miss uh, miss swati bakshi on enjoyment <laughs> i think that they all together will actually really help in moving ahead in this uh, direction um the thought of keeping emotional intelligence over artificial intelligence that is also something that you know we must uh, start exploring more that was a wonderful thought and something that really uh, really every educator should start thinking about <laughs> <laughs> and anuja you should see the the my tedx talk which became really very powerful and successful 2 years ago where uh-huh. it became like a tagline ei over ai everyone in the audience started shouting ei <laughs> over ai because yeah. it's a need you know like jitna yeah. you connect emotionally you will definitely make a impact to have a stronger impact 
you definitely need to connect because then people will remember you you say i'm yeah. seeing lot of people are writing pehle aap pehle aap or anything you know anything ei over ai or 3e theory you know these are some things which you will always remember we did this during the conference so it's just to create an impact you have to connect emotionally and the rewards will follow yeah definitely we definitely reap lots of benefits from this and as you said it not only it will help in reaping benefits but also increase productivity in a big way so definitely definitely yeah. so thanks a lot for such an inspiring and engaging talk and yes we are eagerly waiting for your book thank you thank, thank you so you. much i need your support all of you it's my first yeah, yeah. book and i'm really looking forward uh, to make you know a successful uh, connection with the people because it's a need of the hour and it's definitely going to help lot of people in our teaching fraternity to have a good virtual classroom thank you thank you so thank much thank you dr ruby once again uh, i request all the participants to keep uh, noting down their questions and keep putting it on the chat so that we can take it up with the speakers at the end of the session so now moving to our next presentation so the next uh, speaker of ours is hana ragnarster daughter from iceland uh, who is uh, into teacher training and is going to speak about the uh, iceland teacher training uh, about a holistic approach to student learning and uh, uh, she is a professor at the school of education university of iceland she completed a ba degree in anthropology and history from the university of iceland in 1984 an msc degree in anthropology from the london school of economics and political science in 1986 and a doctor philos in education from the university of oslo in 2007 her research has mainly focused on immigrants and refugees uh, whether they are children adults and families in the icelandic society and schools the multicultural education and school reform so over to hana uh, good afternoon may, may i just interfere yes please so sorry <laughs> okay i just want to say that um, hana it's absolutely delightful to see you uh, here uh, with us in india uh, hana has been a partner with me in iceland where we set out to test a new pedagogy and uh, uh, the pedagogy of competing with yourself not others hana is a professor at the university as you have already mentioned um, so beautifully but uh, she is also a um, teacher educator uh in iceland and iceland uh, as, as has this uh, beautiful college for teacher education where she is uh, running a research program as well as teacher training uh, program so i'm really delighted to have you hana and just wanted to say a personal welcome to you so, so thank you so much for being here with us sorry, sorry. <laughs> no no not at all uh welcome hana thank you thank you so much thank you dear uh Sunita Dr Sunita Ganti for inviting me and thank you for this wonderful program it's really wonderful to be with you all uh, and thank you to all the team who has made this possible you know talking from uh, the other side of the world and it actually works i'm always surprised <laughs> and thank you also um, Dr Kurti for a very inspiring talk it was really wonderful to hear from you Uh, I will now try to share my screen. Uh, I hope it works. Is it okay? Can you see the slides? Okay, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I will start. Um, I'm going to today to be talking about. Um, like a general educational policy in Iceland but also how this feeds into and is implemented in teacher training and uh, how this affects individual teachers and and students um, and this is uh, something that uh, I I want to say is also inspired by uh, Dr Sunita Ganti because we can still see her influences in Iceland uh, after so many years 
So let me just tell you a little bit about the context. Uh, this is, of course, a, a very different context uh, from yours in Lucknow. Uh, it's a small society. I'm not sure how, how familiar you are with Icelandic society. It's a very small population, uh, 360,000. Uh, we have the majority official language Icelandic uh, and sign language since 2011. And in recent decades, we've seen very uh, rapidly growing ethnic, linguistic and religious diversity. So now uh, around 13.5% of the population are recent migrants to Iceland. And to this small population, we have around 100 heritage languages spoken. So this is quite a lot. And uh, I can say almost every class in Iceland today has uh, a variety of heritage languages and recent arrivers. So this is a, a challenge in a way, but also a wonderful opportunity, I would say. Uh, and this is a very uh, brief uh, introduction of the education system. Uh, you can see that uh, the compulsory education is uh, from age six uh, to 16. So every child uh, should go to compulsory schools and they are uh, mostly um, public schools. Only a very few private schools uh, are, are operating. And then we have preschool education from uh, around one years up to six and uh, over 90% of children uh, attend preschool. So I will be mostly talking about the compulsory school level today and, and uh, teacher training for that level, although we have teacher training for all levels in uh, our university. Um, now the inclusive education policy are sort of uh, uh, all over uh, encompassing in Iceland. So the compulsory schools must educate all children in an effective manner. And according to law, all children are titled to this appropriate education in their schools, uh, both academic, vocational and artistic. And the local authorities are required to offer appropriate study to, uh, opportunities to all children, regardless of their uh, physical and mental capabilities, emotional or social situation, uh, language linguistic development. And this applies to all children, as you can see, children with or without disabilities, long-term illnesses, exceptionally intelligent children, and children with mental disabilities, children from remote communities, and children from ethnic, linguistic, or cultural minorities. So in fact, we have in Iceland a very, very few sp special school or specialized school for children. We have this uh, inclusive school in all uh, communities in Iceland. Um, and a compulsory school in the pupils municipality or local community is in fact an inclusive school uh, where the educational and social requirements of each pupil are met with emphasis on respect for human values and social justice. So, and we can see that the attitude of the school is, is characterized by respect for the rights of all pupils to participate in the learning community of the school. And this is regardless of their attainment or status. And I will tell you a little bit more later on how, uh, uh, what sort of approaches are um, in place regarding this uh, uh, wide diversity of pupils. Uh, it's uh, important, of course, to show respect for the diversity and different needs of the students, the abilities and characteristics and so on. And uh, an effort is made to eliminate all forms of discrimination and disintegration at school. And this is, of course, an, an ongoing task all the time. Um, <clears throat> so everyone has these equal uh, equivalent study opportunities, of course and the education needs to be appropriate for each individual. Uh, and of course, the challenge is to offer good education for everyone when the student population is so diverse. Uh, a very important part of the policy is that pupils should enjoy their childhood. They should uh, have a, a refuge in the school. They should feel safe, have an opportunity to develop, use their abilities, enjoy the childhood. So childhood uh, uh, play is not only for the very young children, it's considered important throughout uh, the life of the children. Uh, and childhood and youth is considered as important periods in the life of each individual. So play is emphasized uh, 
throughout the compulsory schools. Uh, if I go back to the national curriculum guides, uh, you can see there that the main objective of the preschool, compulsory school and upper secondary school is to encourage the general education of the citizens. So it's quite a broad approach there. Uh, and schools should also make an effort to operate according to the stages and needs of children and youth. So again, um, the, the uh, emphasis on each child's uh, needs and each child's uh, sort of situation and uh, the diversity of children. Uh, and the educational work is to encourage their active participation in democratic society. And this applies both within and outside the school. And there's a lot of uh, emphasis on democracy and democratic participation of, of all children. And in the policy uh, since 2011, uh, we have uh, six fundamental pillars on which the curriculum guidelines are based. And here you can see these six pillars. Uh, these are literacy, sustainability, democracy and human rights, equality, health and welfare and creativity. And these fundamental pillars uh, should uh, feed into and be implemented in all education, in all subjects in the compulsory schools, as on the other two levels, preschool and upper secondary school. Uh, they are interrelated and interdependent, these fundamental pillars. Uh, there's an echo there. By referring to the pillars, a clear overview of educational work can be obtained. Uh, and they are based on the idea that active democracy is unobtainable without literacy of the diverse symbolism and communication systems of society. So teachers are expected to implement uh, all these pillars, as I said, in their everyday teaching in all subjects. Uh, teacher professionalism is, of course, very much emphasized in teacher training and also in, in uh, the educational policy and curricula uh, based on their special vocational education, knowledge, attitudes and work ethic. Uh, of course, this concerns pupils, their education and welfare. Uh, and it's also emphasized that teachers are not only responsible for imparting knowledge to the pupils, but also giving them an opportunity to acquire knowledge and skills, encouraging their joy of working, nurturing creative thinking. Uh, so this is something that, that is implemented in teacher training, uh, which is now altogether five years to a master's level. And these uh, emphasis are uh, in place throughout the, the whole uh, teacher training five years. Um, now, teaching and teaching methods, uh, a diversity of teaching methods are emphasized throughout the teacher training. Uh, and the, the thought that teaching aims to assist pupils with <laughs> attitude and thus obtain the competence that is the objective of education. Uh, and uh, apart from diverse teaching methods, team teaching is now considered. Uh, uh, essential. So what we see now happening both in teaching training and also in schools is uh, team teaching across uh, different classes. So we may see two or three classes uh, at the same age uh, being taught together by three or more teachers. So this is something that has, has developed in, in the recent years. Uh, and just to touch upon the subject areas in the compulsory school curricula that are also uh, emphasized in teacher education are these um, uh, eight main areas. As you can see, uh, the Icelandic, Icelandic as a second language or Icelandic sign language. Then we have mathematics. Then we have the foreign languages, which are now English first and then Danish or the other Nordic languages. Uh, in, in this, we also have the um, sort of uh, appreciation and acknowledgement of the different heritage languages that the students bring. <clears throat> and now there uh, are, are um, ways of developing uh, evaluation tools to evaluate the different heritage languages that the children bring. And as I said earlier, 
Uh, we have up to 100 languages, different heritage languages in Iceland. Uh, the fourth is arts and crafts, and then we have uh, natural sciences, uh, physical education, the social sciences, uh, different parts of these. Uh, and then we have the information and communication technology. Uh, now, uh, within all these uh, areas, general policy, then we have the fundamental pillars, which I introduced earlier. And then we have the strategic change. So all of these are implemented in uh, teacher training. Uh, and in everyday <clears throat> uh, teaching in the compulsory school. Uh, and the aim for the student teachers in our teaching training programs is to acquire theoretical and practical basis to be able to apply professionalism and flexibility in teaching. Uh, as I said earlier, emphasis on these individual uh, differences and individualized learning of diverse student populations and all courses built on the fundamental pillars of education, which I introduced earlier. Uh, I want to, to end this uh, by <clears throat> talking about the recent developments. Uh, when we think about this inclusive education, the fundamental pillars, and then we have the subjects that the teachers need to uh, uh, implement these uh, broad policies into, and the pillars. Uh, we also have, have uh, in Iceland developed ways of taking into account the growing diversity of the Icelandic society. Because as I said, it is uh, quite a challenge to, to uh, every day be uh, teaching children that, that many of them are recent arrivers in Iceland and they have diverse heritage languages and diverse uh, experiences of their own education uh, in on other countries. So, so what is now being done is like the systematic evaluation of all newcomers. And this is available now in 40 different languages. So this is a tool to systematically evaluate the academic status and educational needs of recently arrived children. And I think this will uh, certainly help uh, recently arrived children um, or the teachers to, uh, to evaluate what they bring, what they know, what they have already learned uh, and also the, the uh, st status of their own heritage language. So it will be a different uh, way of, of starting to teach these recent drivers. Then we also have uh, guidelines for the support of mother tongues, is, uh, heritage languages that I'm talking about, and the active bilingualism in school and after school programs, because uh, it is now emphasized that we should really actively uh, practice plurilingualism in the schools. Uh, so Icelandic as, as the main uh, societal uh, and school language uh, will also have to give way to different uh, other languages. And uh, now it's, it's both an opportunity and challenge to, to uh, address these, all these languages and how to build on them, how to use them uh, for the children's benefits. And we also have a policy for the integration of students of diverse backgrounds being developed, which also will uh, emphasize culturally responsive teaching, where we are building on the different cultures and different experiences and languages that the students bring, uh, and thus uh, giving them a stronger and firmer basis uh, when they uh, start school in a new country. Uh, so just to conclude, <clears throat> uh, as I said, there are many opportunities, also challenges, but I, I would look at these mostly as opportunities. Uh, there are opportunities in, in team teaching and diverse teaching methods, also including emotional and multiple intelligences. Uh, these are holistic, holistic and wide perspectives uh, and diverse teaching methods. Uh, challenges, of course, are these very diverse student population, both uh, in terms of uh, uh, disabilities, abilities, intelligences, uh, different languages, different backgrounds. But this is, of course, uh, the, the inclusive school uh, includes all these uh, aspects. Uh, 
and all these experiences and, and uh, abilities of children. Um, but uh, I think uh, the multiple heritage languages, the background, the diversity of students are a wonderful opportunity uh, uh, of learning from each other, of uh, building on uh, each other's uh, uh, perspectives, experiences, uh, cultures, etc. I want to end with this uh, and I hope for, for a peaceful coexistence and uh, building on everyone's uh, strengths uh, in the compulsory school. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for the most, for a, the most engaging and informative session. And uh, you so beautifully explained about the well-evolved education system of I and Smith. And Beautifully, you threw light on the inclusive education policies, the national curriculum guidelines, the teacher professionalism, the subject areas in the school curriculum, and having an inclusive school instead of a special school. I really loved your thought on how people should actually enjoy their childhood. Feel Thank safe. You. I have opportunity to develop and the importance that you gave to the play is something very, very significant, which all of us need to understand. Also, the six fundamental pillars of education, that is also something that we really need to keep thinking about, revisiting every time we take up any activity or add on something in our curriculum, because they are so important uh, for the holistic development of the child. And uh, also one uh, very interesting thing in your presentation was about the teacher professionalism that you talked about, that, you, uh, that over there, you see to it that the teachers, they acquire the knowledge, the skills, and also a positive attitude. And how you emphasize on individual differences and you build up the individualized learning. That this is also something that, um, will help us to reach to the last child. And then uh, the new things that are coming up in the, the curriculum, the systematic evalu evaluation of all the newcomers in 40 different languages, I think that will help to reach out to so many. And also the guidelines that you're giving for the support of the mother tongue and plural linguism, that is also going to really help people in a very big way. So uh, thanks, Hannah, once again for a very informative session and helping us get a peep into the beautiful education system in Iceland. Thank you so much once thank again. Thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I will be continuing to listen to your wonderful presentations. Thank you. OK. So um, I would like to invite our next speaker of the day. That is Dr. Abhinav Mathur. Uh, Dr. Abhinav Mathur is, is an ex effective communicator and a team player. He is multilingual and has worked in Asia, China, Europe, and USA. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering from IIT Delhi and a business degree from IIM Lucknow, both of which are amongst the most prestigious organizations in India. Currently, he is directing the establishment of uh, African Content Center D2C business around online video and music monetization business on YouTube, iTunes, Daily Motions, and similar channels. Previously led a vibrant and young mobile gaming app development company, which is one of the largest and most profitable publishers and has around 50 million downloads of their application across App Store. So I welcome Dr. Abhinav Mathur to take over from here. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Anuja. Uh, I'm here as uh, the founder of Million Sparks Foundation. Uh, I hope you're able to hear me well. Yeah, very well. OK. So uh, you know, I'm here as the founder of Million Sparks Foundation, which I founded along with my wife, who is also a PhD from IIT Delhi. OK. 
okay somebody's unmuted his mic i was very surprised and you know what's happening so uh, essentially uh, you know we are focused on uh, enabling the lifelong learning and continuous capacity building of teachers and focused on you know trying to be a little more ambitious than most of the education systems have been so today you know guided by the previous two speakers who have spoken about emotional intelligence and you know on inclusive education i would like to focus on you know the role of the teacher in actually establishing a sustainable world uh, but you know before i do that i would like to you know spend a couple of minutes explaining to you what we have been doing in the pandemic and what is our approach so we have built a application called chocolate within which we have basically three buckets we provide trainings to teachers through this application and completely on the application there is no physical element on it the second thing that we do is we provide referenceable lesson plans literally a teacher can come and say that i want to teach in english maths to seventh grade students teach uh, you know i want to teach fractions and you know within which i want to teach multiplication of fractions at that granularity we have lesson plans which the teacher can consume and you know take an effective class so that's the second thing uh, that is present on the app and the third thing is that we have a very personalized social learning network on which daily some you know we populate something like 25 30 different bite sized posts which give another perspective so this could be you know uh, uh, inputs around best practices for other teachers it could be around sustainable development goals it could be gender equality there could be puzzles activities the teacher can do for themselves and inside the classroom so there is a variety of content which comes onto the platform on a daily basis broadening the knowledge of the teacher and you know uh, this is something that we have been doing we have 6 lakh teachers on the platform across india and we have some you know from international locations as well like you know ma'am pointed out or rujaji pointed out uh, we have uh, you know teachers from africa we have teachers from the you know north america and so on so forth as well uh, so what uh, what we have been doing is we have been going to states and offering our platform to them saying that why don't you come onto our platform and you know enable your trainings for teachers and these trainings have been uh, sort of accepted widely like i said 6 lakh teachers on the platform we must have done close to 20 lakh trainings in the you know 2 million trainings in the past 2 or 3 years of our existence we were fortunate to receive a receive a 1.2 million dollar google grant uh, you know and build this out over the past 2 to 3 years and then we have been scaling this further uh during the pandemic uh, you know we we started to focus a lot on creating content for teachers so they can remotely uh, you know keep the students engaged uh, you know we had trainings on how do you make videos online what are the various tools and which tools could be used and all of this was on a smartphone and majority of these teachers are government school teachers uh, affordable private school teachers with a few also from the slightly more elite schools as well but the focus has been largely on the low income and the affordable private school segment and the government school segment so this is what we did <coughs> uh, <clears throat> what we also realized <clears throat> at the very start of the pandemic that it is very telling on uh, you know students in the sense that there is a lot of i would say stress which the children are going through because they are not in schools they are you know sort of at home uh they will be sub subjected to a lot of stress in fact a lot of stress that the parents would be feeling would also be translated onto them so we did a you know sort of a, a study and a partnership with several organizations to actually come up with a mental health training and uh, you know the objective being can be uh, you know sort of educate at least dispel the myths around mental health ensure that this becomes an acceptable thing and that teachers should be able to look after their own mental health and be prepared to actually take care of their students mental health as well so that's broadly what we did during this time and we must have trained close to you know or offered more than 8 lakh trainings during this time uh, in the states of goa uh, delhi haryana chatisgarh uh, odisha and a few in uttar pradesh as well but uttar pradesh is not that much of a focus at this point in time unfortunately uh, you know it's it's a very very large state and we don't we didn't have the resources 
I am not telling that way. So, at this juncture, you know, start to talk about a little from a future, you know, from a more directional and a vision perspective as to how do we see teachers and how we see the the contributions that you can make not only to your students' learning outcomes but for a larger cause. And I would like to, you know, uh, you know, project uh, a deck at this point in time. Just give me a second. Can you see this slide? Can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Yes, we yes, can. Sir. yes, sir. Excellent. So essentially, you know, the way I see education is beyond just, you know, just for, uh, you know, foundational literacy and numeracy, which is hygiene at this point in time. I personally believe that education has a larger role to play to advance humanity by solving the world's hardest problems and these hardest problems are typically I'm trying to change the, yeah these hardest problems are typically represented by the sustainable development goals uh, and if you look at it most of these sustainable development goals are not seen you know though they are very very interlinked but i don't see that the reflection of these sustainable development goals have started to happen in education while there is a sustainable development goal which focuses largely on education and it says that we need to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. One of our misgivings uh, with education is that while we do say that we have to promote this inclusiveness, equitability and ensure that lifelong learning opportunities should exist for everybody, but unfortunately for teachers themselves, I don't think this lifelong learning opportunities exist or they are even taken very seriously by majority of the community. I'm not saying that there will be, uh, you know, th there will be something like 10 to 20% of the teachers who will be focused on their own lifelong learning. But I don't think as a society, we encourage that. And given the fact that, you know, most of teachers are coming from the very education system, we are trying to improve. You know, we have to acknowledge that there are gaps in the teaching community as well. And we have to focus on those as well and ensure that there is lifelong learning opportunities for teachers. Now, it's one of the hardest problems to solve, and this has been acknowledged by everybody. And education has a bearing on each and every single sustainable development goal, including climate change. And from where I see, most of edu educational in initiatives have a very narrow approach and are not ambitious. And I personally believe that with the technology, and especially the circumstances that exist at this point in time, with regards to you know the, the pandemic coming in and nearly every teacher coming onto an online platform, I think the opportunity right now is very, very significant and we can become much more ambitious with regards to the use of technology to not only ensure foundational literacy and numeracy, but also other things. Uh, at our while, you know, when we look at our own work, I'm sorry, I'll just go back a little. Yeah. When we look at our work, we strongly believe that education is actually at the center of all the sustainable development goals. If we were to consider, there are close to 2 billion children which are in schools globally and close to 300 million children in India alone. And most of the 70 million teachers across the world and 10 million teachers that teach in schools in India do not really understand enough about these hard problems or their roles in solving of these. We strongly believe that each teacher should be enabled to regularly explain these to every single child in an age appropriate and level appropriate manner. And there should be sensitivity towards each of these sustainable development goals. You know, when we, when we, when we look at our role inside that and each child needs to contextually understand their role, their family's role and their community's role in solving and ensuring sustainability of the sustainable development goals. Now, we talk about, you know, air pollution, we talk about water pollution, but fact of the matter is, and the pandemic has also shown us that majority of these problems are just because we are, you know, sort of spoiling these things. And, you know, our existence today has become very caustic to the world itself. And our belief is if these 2 billion children, and forget about the 2 billion children globally, I'm just saying the 300 million children in India, if they were to enter the mainstream, 
without an exposure to sustainable development goals what they mean what their individual roles at whatever levels they are is these problems are not going to get solved and many of the problems will require local solutions without this exposure these local solutions will not get found so that's the other thing and there are opportunities to actually talk about you know these sustainable development goals even through the curriculum itself so we very strongly think that there is a need and this need is way past its you know sort of last date i would say when we have to start to inculcate inside the curriculum itself so that it's so seamless that the child gets exposed to it without really feeling that there is such a thing happening uh <clears throat> research has proven time and again that teachers are the single most important factor in a child's life and learning outcomes and fact of the matter is that if you look at a class of 50 and if we were to just focus on foundational literacy and numeracy also maybe only 5 to 10% maybe 20% in rare cases classrooms will have students where they are very very focused on academics most of the students are there because that is where their parents are sending them or the parents want them to study children want to really enjoy or they they are curious but the way education is structured i don't think students will themselves take it so therefore the role of the teacher is extremely important and there is a research which has been done by john hattie who synthesized close to 1000 research reviews across 50000 students and found this that the greatest influence on students progression in learning is having a highly expert inspired and passionate teacher and school leaders working together to maximize the effect of their student on a, on all students in their care we we very strongly believe that teachers change the world one student at a time when you look at the macros facing macro problems facing education there is skin inequality and there is skill uncertainty and i like to explain what i mean by that there is a 100 year gap essentially what is there is that the best of what today's education systems have to offer is not delivered equally to the rich children owing to a gap in teacher skills and they need to be upgraded and each existing teacher really fill this gap and they need to be leapfrog and the skills for the future you know we 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 all know that a child getting born today will enter the workforce in 2045 and there is absolutely no certainty on what skills will be required for this child to enter and succeed in the workforce and if you look at it if i have to hire a you know sort of a chauffeur even today you know we will ask the person can you go can you do you know how to run a you know use a smartphone can you use google uh, maps to reach places and so on and so forth what are we talking about you know what will happen or what will be the expectation in 2045 so education systems they really need to reorient and teachers capacity has to be built towards this broad set of skills and unless and until teachers capacity is there their own understanding is there i don't think they will be able to translate or transfer these to the 300 million children who need this so that they can be successful tomorrow in the future workforce so there are skills like social emotional cognitive character physical academic and the appreciation of sustainable development goals as well so every student and the teacher is in the world must have a great teacher and what we are trying to do is impact the learning outcomes of a billion students by capacitating 70 million children by 2030 and we have reached around you know like i said <clears throat> we are in six states we have 6 lakh teachers on the platform who are impacting close to 30 million children year on year and like i said we have essentially uh, you know these three things we have trainings on the platform which are multi grade multi level scholastic and co scholastic which are offered officially in partnership with government schools etc the teachers get certified and these certifications are usable for their promotions or for their uh, state awards etc we have teacher tools specific subject specific edible resources which i have explained to you and then there is a teacher community which is social personalized peer to peer micro learning network so that's what we do and would be happy to answer any questions but i would like to leave you all with this message given the fact that most of you are from the teaching community that you know it's it's not enough just to give foundational literacy and numeracy because those skills are hygiene today they are expected that every single child has them today and i'm sure many of you are sort of going beyond that 
and you know inculcating many more skills and i would encourage you to also understand sustainable development goals in depth and try to ensure that you give that uh, responsibility to your students as well and make them feel responsible towards sustainability you know of of earth literally and uh, uh, you know would be happy to answer any questions that you might have for me now or later on thanks thank you so much thank you dr abhinav it was a wonderful session and we enjoyed every bit of it uh, we would definitely like to know more about the chocolate app that you have and so whenever the time permits we would like to know much more about it sure uh, also it was really nice to know that there are about uh, 6 lakh teachers from india and many more from abroad also who are getting connected with you so that itself is a testimony to the success of your app and uh, the in uh, the pandemic and so many people would have benefited from that um one uh, very interesting thing in your presentation was also about the mental health training and how you try to dispel the myths around it which in turn helps the teachers and the students in the process and also i feel that uh, um as you say that it's important for everyone to understand about the sustainable development goals so i i feel that uh, it should also be taken up in the curriculum of uh, of our schools from the very beginning so that children from a, an early age start understanding about what sustainability is all about and gradually understand about the goals and start uh, empowering themselves with the skills and the attitude and knowledge uh, required for it so that is actually going to bring a sea change in the world so also um, uh, the way you stress that it's important to ensure inclusiveness and equitable quality education and uh, and also promote lifelong learning opportunities for all so that is also a very very significant thought and uh, keeping education at the center of the sustainability development goal is something really really significant that's is something that um, uh that actually is but uh, the way um, it is being handled and the way people actually see to it and are working in that direction that uh, requires more effort i believe also um, the importance of teacher being an important factor in a child's life and learning outcome is another important thing that we as teachers need to understand so out and out i felt that uh, your session was really informative and i'm sure everyone would have really enjoyed it too so thanks a lot for sparing your time and uh, letting us know how you are doing thank you dr thank you thank you very much Good. thank you so now uh, i would like to move on to our next speaker So the next speaker of the day is uh, Mr. Sandeep Rao. Uh, uh, Mr. Sandeep Rao is the director of Little Jenny Montessori Bangalore and co-founder of Little Jenny Hub. He has a vast experience in the preschool and daycare industry. He runs a successful and unique brand of preschools, offering a unique dispensation and schooling to children in the one to six year bracket. so welcome sandeep sir and we thank would you. definitely like to hear more from you so over to you thank you thank you uh, mrs anuja thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to talk on this platform and uh, good afternoon to all the distinguished uh, speakers and guests from all over the world uh, wherever you are uh, good afternoon from me and everybody here uh the topic given to me uh today is uh the way forward in the preschool and daycare industry uh i don't know how many of you uh uh in the uh today here present here are uh, running preschools or daycares in your cities uh but let me tell you one thing the the pandemic has really affected the preschool uh bracket 
more than probably any other bracket uh, of uh, of education. Uh, that's because uh, every other, uh, be it primary, secondary, high school, or college uh, category of uh, students, uh, have an option of online classes. Okay, but for preschools, it is uh, you know it's very tough to convince a parent that there is an option of online because the children are so small. And I myself don't think the children who are two or three uh, should be online, uh, taking classes online, right? So it's been very, very tough the last 10 months or so for all of us. I would like to, uh, you know, brief uh, all of you and uh, update your knowledge about exactly what the situation is right now uh, uh, in the preschool industry. Okay, so let me uh, let me just start my presentation, uh, and please pay attention uh, so that you can be updated. Right. So this is my topic today: the way forward in the preschool education industry today. And let me brief you with the statistics. Let me update you with the with how big the preschool uh, industry is in India. Okay, there are over 50,000 preschools who also double up as daycares or after school care centers in India, approximately. And uh, 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 the industry is uh, $3.4 billion uh, dollar big, uh, US dollar big, $3.4 billion US dollar big. That's how big it is. And uh, uh, it educates over 20 crore of our little ones here in India. That's a very high number, considering India is 135 crore big, out of which 20 crore are the little ones in the age bracket of one to six. So the 20 crore odd children are basically uh, uh, doing nothing much. And this is the present situation in our country, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, all preschools are shut, like all other schools are shut, but preschools, uh, many of them don't even uh, have the option to go online because there are not many buyers for that. Many, most parents don't want an online option as opposed to parents of secondary students or high school students or college students where education is going on for them through the online mode. So only a minority of the schools are operating online and the majority of two to five year olds have not enrolled this year. They have skipped this year uh, because they believe it's not a viable option to opt, to opt for online education or any other form of education that we might have, uh, which is not face-to-face -face physical education. So the education in uh, for the preschoolers are, for most of them, are in the pause mode and some precious time, a precious year has been lost for the majority. Daycare uh, revenues are zero. There is no daycare open anywhere in the country. And parents who are probably working, who are going to work, many of them do go to offices now, have no option to leave their children anywhere. They have to find a different uh, means. When they are at work, they have to find different option. Okay, the majority of schools right across the board have incurred preschools, have incurred huge, huge losses. And many, many, many of them are up for sale. And the owners have decided enough is enough. We can't bear these huge overheads. The rent is a huge chunk of the overheads that preschools pay. Uh, and, uh, you know, as long as the pandemic is there, uh, there's nothing much that's going to change. Uh, 
and lakhs and lakhs of teachers, education staff, and people associated with teaching and daycare are out of work, have lost their jobs. Thousands and thousands and lakhs of them are have just been laid off because preschools themselves are struggling to stay afloat. So that is the present situation right now in India. Uh, thanks to no fault of the preschools, uh, none of us, be it in preschools or any other industry, have done anything wrong to deserve this. It's just the, the way the wind is blown. But unfortunately, we've been the biggest hit because the option of online classes is not very viable for a majority of parents. Moving on. What, how are the kids coping? What are they doing now? Not all the kids are taking a year off. A minority of them have resorted to other ways apart from physical schooling of uh, learning in this year. Uh, the first way of the kids are coping is through the online uh, mode which everybody else has adopted. Uh, so the older kids, the LKG kids, the four plus kids, four and five year olds, and the ones who can afford, the parents who can afford a laptop or a tab are opting for online education. Many of them are also opting for homeschooling, home tutoring, as we call it, which means that instead of uh, sending uh, kids to schools like they used to pre-COVID, they are now getting a teacher home, a qualified teacher comes from a school, comes to their house at a specified time and tutors the kid, tutors the child. And it happens periodically. It could be daily for an hour, hour and a half, or it could be twice a week, thrice a week or whatever a frequency that the school and the parent mutually decide upon. Or in some cases, there is no qualified teacher, but the parent himself or herself that is sitting with the child, spending time and teaching the child so that there's some education happening in these tough times. But like I said earlier, the majority of them have just opted out because it's not a, a requisite or a prerequisite that the child must do, say, nursery class to get into LKG. If a child misses a class, that's perfectly fine. So the ones uh, that I say in first standard, which is primary schooling, first standard, second standard, have to finish that class, have to pass out of first standard to go to second standard. It's not so in the preschool industry. A child can not do a class and still go to the next class. So preschooling, the preschool uh, industry, uh, parents now believe that since the pand pandemic is on and we don't want, we can't send our kids to schools, we will just opt out this year. So for the majority of schools, there is no business. There is nothing happening, no daycare, no schooling. And we merely have to pay the huge rents and the overheads that come with it. Okay, so that's the industry today and that's the way it is. Okay, so what is the way forward? That's my topic today. How do we move forward, right? Now, let's say this pandemic goes on for more time. What is the way forward? Now, see, in any business, we have to cater to what is the need. In today's world, every parent is scared of sending a child to school, even if schools open up. It is a factor. It is a health hazard is there, so they will not. Even if a school opens up during these pandemic times, they will not send the child to school. Okay, because they are very worried about the safety. They don't mind losing a year if need be, but they will not send the child to school during these pandemic times. Right? So right now, these are the options available. 
okay they can opt for online education like many have in urban areas they can opt for home tutoring wherein a qualified teacher comes into your house uh and tutors your kid uh following the safety precautions a tutor comes to teach your little child uh periodically so many days a week and carries on because physical schooling is not possible and many like i said have just opted to wait for regular school to start they are merely not doing either of the two the first two but merely losing out on precious time waiting for school to start whenever it may whenever the pandemic clears up and whenever government decides to open these preschools but nothing will change the main fundamental uh, way of preschooling which is the regular physical schooling nothing for children between the age of 1 and 6 nothing can top the regular physical schooling that was in place until the pandemic struck so my what i want to say uh, today is most of them are struggling many many of them many of the preschools are struggling waiting for uh, schools to start and there is no time frame uh, that the school will start on this day or something so what we need to realize is as long as the this it is status quo we need to be in business we need to ensure that you can get past these tough times and that's only possible when you cater to what the demand is now so the demand today is for education through another medium because regular schooling is not available so the only two mediums available are the virtual medium the virtual medium is available okay and this virtual medium uh, must have a very effective online education model and it must be holistic in approach you cannot have only curriculum teaching that goes on in the virtual medium now our school is known our pre school is known for having a very holistic approach by holistic i mean that at this age of the child which is between 2 and 6 you must have uh some sort of physical activity you must have curriculum as well and you must have entertainment as well so our classes which we have which we are quite uh successful which the parents have really really loved is because it encompasses a lot of components now we when the pandemic struck we waited a while two months three months hoping it will start we had uh you know we also thought that it would end up fast and things would open up real quickly but we realized later towards the end of may or june that it won't happen that quickly so we came up with a very very uh successful model an online model which with which we offer uh not just curriculum but also we have uh, the model offering uh, physical uh, education we have yoga classes we have zumba classes as a part of our regular classes we have we start with a prayer we have storytelling sessions uh we have rhyme sessions we have a speak about activity we even have a magic show every day so all this year since the start of june we've had an online model that's been a big hit with all parents children love to come back to class little children see you're talking of children who are 3 or 4 years old 5 years old 
you can't do regular online teaching like it is done for an eight standard or a 15 year old or a 14 year old child with the child knows that he's here for studies there's going to be notes uh, to be taken down and it's only curriculum and only teaching you cannot do that sort of teaching with a four year old so you must have a model that gives entertainment that uh, gives the ch uh, a child a chance of uh, you know uh, physical development apart from cognitive development emotional development social develop in social interaction as well so in a class the class starts with a variety of activities we have a prayer like i mentioned we have a lot of activities that form a class right so with this kind of model we've been successful the parents have been very happy saying look we never imagined that we would ever be in a situation like this and come out of this situation and a child would be uh, you know in something like this which has been very very developmental so all these storytelling sessions really keep the children these magic shows the rhyme session see kids who are 3 4 love the rhyme session they love to sing rhymes they really do and we have zumba activities we have yoga sessions we have all these things as a part of regular classes i think the majority of the preschools who are shut you know i have known i have a lot of friends who tell me in the preschool industry who say look this it's you know we have, we have no admissions and you know the online is not working and so on it's because they've never really uh, thought beyond curriculum you know just teaching the little child what uh, from the books you know they've never really thought beyond that they must have thought as to what is the best way in these present the situation has changed your playground has changed you no longer can have that sort of physical schooling where you have 4 hours right a child from 9 to 1 is at school you have 4 hours to do a variety of activities but then you can do a lot of them online i think the the thing that they did they sold the uh, they, they sold their education model as online education which was absolutely wrong now we call them virtual engagement classes vec right like i said from day one i think this from day one we've received nothing but positive responses positive uh, feedback from the parents because of what all we conceptualize it's all encompassing when we thought of these various activities we had uh, i remember we had uh, art and craft lessons you know lots of these things we used to have you know on a periodic basis have different different sorts of classes which kept them engaged in fact i think we did more <laughs> during these online uh, bc sessions than we did in regular schooling many of the parents even came back to us and said look this is this is really good you know i never thought this would be this good and frankly our child i think has learned more this year than he did last year so one thing you must have for all those who are preschool owners who are listening if i can if my uh, words could ever uh, help solve any of your problems you must have a holistic approach not just to online teaching for kids who are between 3 or say 4 and 6 which is the lkg ukg children they are slightly older they can sit in a virtual class now for those parents despite whatever we've done who still are not convinced that look i look uh, online virtual classes are not for me i wouldn't want that we have another model for them okay we have the homeschooling model right now with the homeschooling model you our teachers would come to your house and teach your child okay and they would fall they would follow covid protocols they would come at a specified time and teach your child because that's the next best thing you're not interested in the virtual classes despite whatever uh, feedback that the other parents have given you the home schooling model should work for you because that's all you can offer you can do this or you can do online or you can prefer to not have your child learning anything right one very important statistic i told <coughs> all parents is that look it's at this young age when 90% of the child's brain growth happens beyond 7 there's only 10% of the brain that grows 90% is already grown the mental development happens 90% of it happens before the age of 7 so if you're missing a year 
if you plan to you know sit out and not do anything you are you are going backwards not having nevertheless you have to re repeat the year that is there you have to come back and your child has to do that year all over again you losing a year but more so the child is doing nothing at home you have to engage your child the child has to be engaged at this uh, age with a variety of activities cognitive development there must be social interaction there must be emotional uh, you know growth there must be physical growth that's why i said all these components have to be addressed in your online classes right the second option i want to talk about is the home schooling which we which i think is very good where our school will offer teachers coming to your house and teaching and that is uh, for those who are not interested in the online option see nothing can beat the regular schooling okay what we try to do is get as many as possible for the online classes and many were convinced for those who were not who didn't want the online option we went to them with the home schooling option and uh you know that was the next best option which was uh which which really worked fine for them apart from these two options there's just no other option but to wait for school to start so for us for us preschools uh owners like me who have not just one but many preschools paying your rents paying your teachers paying all your bills is a huge ask when there's absolutely uh you know your business has come down to almost zero so these times i would say all i would tell all preschool owners who are there was part of this uh, uh conference we must have something like this until the pandemic lasts yes of course the main way of education is physical schooling where they come to our school but it's not possible right now so rather than being in this covid mode that covid mode and telling yourself that look nothing is working oh god we we have no business we have huge rents to pay the, the, you know we, we we there's no way, uh, revenue coming in you must think of ways to get revenue coming in with what is the demand of the hour that is how a true businessman would think a business person would look at the present situation and say look what do i offer best better than my competitors in this given moment what can i offer best so obviously the, this uh, the school won't start that's pretty obvious you can sit and think and think and pray forever but it won't start right now right so you can offer two online virtual classes and homeschooling so i think everybody out there must look to do these two what we do is we have teachers who uh, who work here for the virtual classes and we have another set of teachers who are on uh, uh, duty going to the homes of uh, parents and who will tutor the kids at home so all of us all of us preschool owners must have these two uh, uh, platforms available that's the only way you can get through this pandemic okay it's still tough because see nobody is used to this kind see when you when you offer this to parents they say, oh what is this i mean i am not interested i'll wait many of them are willing to wait actually surprisingly so they despite your uh, you know uh, whatever cautionary words they still think look it's just the year it's fine or whatever it is we'll wait till uh, till the pandemic goes away but for many who want their children to progress these two platforms are very very strong and this is the way of getting in revenue right we all need to survive never mind making you know huge huge money during this time the thing is you must survive to last when this goes away it will go away sometime and when you want to when regular schooling resumes you must be there because there's no revenue coming and you can't survive for long i've known a uh, i have like i said i'm in this business i knew a person who has 14 schools 14 schools and he he had no option but to shut down many of them again he didn't think out of the box he didn't address the the needs of the r if you just keep waiting waiting not doing anything and not offering any different model then you you will not survive you need to do something different so we came up with something that is uh, i would say sorry, revolutionary sorry sandeep sir for interrupting uh, yes, we are really enjoying your session but we are running out of time and there are other speakers lined up for the day sure so i'll just I take a minute
I'll just yeah. take one minute. Is that fine? That, I'll just that wrap will up. Be wonderful. That will be wonderful. Thank I'll you. I'll just wrap up. Thank you so much. Uh, finally, I would like to say to all the the reason I came on this uh, platform is just let all other preschoolers, uh, preschool owners know that during these times you have to have an effective online model, and you have to have an offline model. It is only until the pandemic lasts. Of course, after that, it's back to regular schooling. I would think. So for those who are struggling for answers, you must rack your brains and find out how and effectively present to your parents that look, this is what we're going to do. This is the way we're going to take your children forward in these troubling times. I'm sure many, many will take up your offer because all of them want their children learning something. Rarely will you find a parent say, "Look, I'm not interested." They will, they will somehow agree, uh, even if it sounds kind of different. But in the end, if you deliver. well if after a month or two they find some great progress they will be satisfied with that so thank you very much for your time i hope my words have helped at least some of you uh with some ideas to survive this pandemic and hopefully there are better days ahead i think uh, we are at the end of uh, what is a very troubled time for all of us hopefully in the next 3 4 5 months things will get back to normal thank you for the opportunity uh mrs anuja thanks everybody for listening to me thank you thanks to sir sandeep rao thank, thank you for the insightful session and also making us once again go through the challenges that all of us are facing in this pandemic situation i know it's a really sad state everywhere um as you said that the place schools have literally brought the education in a pause mode huh? absolutely the, yes. and the precious time uh, is kind of lost forever and the daycare revenues have gone down to zero so it is actually a very uh, sad state but uh, the interesting thing in your in the session was the kind of positivity that you brought in that in spite of the challenges that are there um you have actually not given up and you have fought yeah. with all kinds of challenges that have come up and you have come up with an entirely new model which can work even in these challenging times like yes, uh, yes. yeah the online education model that you spoke about and the home tutoring model in which you send the qualified teachers uh, to the parents and to the homes mm-hmm. of the children so i'm sure that would uh, definitely be helping them in coming out of the situation and not actually bringing their education to a pause mode so yeah. uh, So the may, may I just say one final thing, Mrs. Amuja? I yeah, just yeah. want to, you know, give a final yeah. message to yeah. see yeah. as an entrepreneur. See, we've invested big time in our schools. We put up so much money mm-hmm. and so much effort. You can't just give up. Yeah. You must always find a solution to what is troubling your business and what is now the changed, uh, you know, uh, I would say dynamics. now physical schooling is not possible so what other way you must you, you must the entrepreneur must be of such a metal mm-hmm. that he must know now what can i offer in this model which will solve the uh, problems today what can i come up with how can i get revenues in how can i satisfy my uh, my customers you must have been in that mode all the time if you think things will happen by themselves they never happen as they say in hindi uh, uh, You know, uh, काम होता नहीं काम करवाना पड़ता है थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच यू शेयर वंडरफुल इन साइट बट वी आर रनिंग बिहाइंड टाइम एंड आई लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट मैम मैडम चेयरपर्सन टू कैंडली प्रोसीड विद नेक्स्ट स्पीकर थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल अपॉन मिस अंजु आरा फ्रॉम हैदराबाद he is uh, working uh, with in india kindle the glory of success in youngsters in charge as well as a vice principal of st adams group of schools especially trained adolescent counseling uh, called sfa he is a motivational speaker and an academician her strategic thinking vision innovative ideas always leave a great impact on everyone her positive attitude as an educational leader will always inspire people to do the same so i invite anju mara bam to kindly take over a very happy evening uh, to everyone and uh, before i start my session thank you thanks a lot uh, for giving me this opportunity 
some people uh, want it to happen. Some wish it would happen. Others make it happen. When you sow seeds uh, in a garden, plants doesn't grow automatically by an accident or by luck. You cultivate the plants so you get a better yield. Similarly, the attributes which are required to be successful, they originate in habits. Day by day, slowly, slowly, they progress. So let us canvas uh, some of the attributes. Manage stress. Now these days, uh, most of us were in stress, trying to understand what is happening around us, uh, the sudden pandemic and uh, the lagging behind of the education system. So uh, let us first understand uh, what is happening. Let us first understand under stress, what happens under stress. It happens always, you know, uh, the root cause of the stress. The root cause of the stress is the different hormones which are generated, which are uh, given in the human bloodstream. The major players are the cortisol and adrenaline hormone. These hormones, they trigger the fight and flight response in the, in, for the, any external stimuli. And these stress, it can even uh, kill uh, brain cells, not even killing of the brain cells, it can even uh, sink into the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain which is responsible for memory and thinking. So the uh, right moment, the right account of the stress, it will increase the uh, being successful. You know, there are not all the stress, all the stress is not bad. The, there are two kinds of stress like uh, use stress and distress. A term use stress, it is referring to the positive stress and the term distress, it refers to the negative stress. So let uh, me say you about the characteristics of use stress. Characteristics of use stress are like it motivates, it focuses our energy. And this use stress is very short term. Uh, it is perceived within us. We can cope this stress. We feel excited during the stress, but this excitement is entirely positive. It improves the performance also. Now, what can be the characteristics of distress? This uh, distress, it causes anxiety. It causes concern. It can be short term. It can be long term. It is also, you know, we can perceive this stress either outside and it hinders our coping abilities. We feel very unpleasant when we get this distress. And this distress, it decreases our performance. These uh, stress, you know, we cannot uh, ignore stress because it won't go by its own and it is not possible to overcome the stress at once. There are certain uh, tricks uh, which we have to take. There are certain tips which will make us overcome this stress. The first thing is you have to identify your stressor. The thing which is causing you stress, the thing which is giving you stress, you have to identify the stressor. Physical exercise. Uh, physical exercise, it removes all the extra energy which is given by the stress. And uh, the more important thing is, don't ever bottle up your feelings, express out, express out the feelings and develop the practice of taking deep diaphragmatic breaths. And the researchers have shown that these breaths, it calms the soul, even it uh, calms the body. The more uh, important thing, find a quiet place, speak to a person, by speaking with him or her, it calms your mind. Some of the researchers, they showed that um, these, uh, speaking with a friend, these kinds of friendship, it uh, increases the immunity and also it decreases the mortality rate. Once you are overcome the stress, now the next step for being successful is being patient and being confident. So believe in your power. You know, this power can make you, this power can break you. It can heal your soul. It can even damage your soul. 
uh, these uh, confidence uh, will make us to take the adversities as the opportunity and uh, the self confidence is nothing but the feeling of trust in ourselves in our abilities in our judgment and see a clear relation between our self confidence and patience is if say patience is self confidence and self confidence is the stepping stone to success then patience is an important virtue we develop and learn in cycles like the growth rings of a tree might be you have seen every year there comes a growth ring in a tree that is a process it 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 uh, takes place in a very slow manner it is a process so we are we are also not different we learn step by step with patience we have to plan and then execute the plan you know certain like how we can manage stress similarly some of the tricks are there or some of the tips are there which we can inculcate in us which increases the self confidence and patience you know uh, the small tips which can help us to just to go on our endeavors and be successful in all our endeavors when impatience surfaces slow stop if you are in a habit of doing uh, things in a very hurriedly manner please slow down practice thinking before you speak and this comes when you think uh, like uh, situations uh, should doesn't matter to you don't matter the situation doesn't matter to you see don't focus on paristhiti focus on your inside that is focus on your manasthiti once manasthiti theek hogi na paristhiti automatic theek ho jayegi the reason uh, sometimes you know you keep all your efforts but even though you don't get that percentage of success which you were expecting for this can be the uh, because you have left some of the pieces of the puzzles now the things which can enhance your self confidence are even um, you can just make a note what are all the abilities your talents by reading that uh, you it enhances your will power you can just write down what all your achievements are these also will increase your self confidence always develop a uh, positive attitude i always uh, follow three p's formula three p's formula is practice patience and you will progress always if you practice patience are only with self confidence and with uh, all the managing of the distress definitely you are going to progress now we have uh, overcome our stress what the situations give us we have patience we have self confidence now how to move forward on your way the second thing which most of us avoid is taking risk you know like a child trying to walk trying the learning to walk he falls down the child falls down many times but again gets up you know the, the child doesn't think oh my god if i fall down how no that sense is not there in the child that is secondary but like a child taking risk in the process of learning to walk we need to take action first and then modify the actions according to the feedback we get they do not have uh, a boundary that this is my limit i don't go beyond it that the risk takers don't don't limit is shocked to see to hear the voice so risk takers are more likely to be successful because they do not limit themselves they are willing to put all their energy where every one other person is hesitant to do that think over what is this see this is uh, my belief this is my uh, definition about taking about uh, describing what is risk is a person busy being busy in the life from morning till the night that person works 
uh, and then comes back to the home and spends a life with the family. But by the end of the day, that person is not happy, not peaceful. this person is happy and if this person want to do something new want to make himself or herself happy want to uh, do something new but he doesn't do it why thinking risk hai they think it does it is a risk so my definition is now let us think about uh, being alive and being dead see a person who is uh, ready who is ready to do anything by taking the risk that person is alive now to grow old it doesn't matter you can sit and you can grow old but when one person grows old like when you grow old you ask yourself when did you die the answer will be i died when i was young because that time the risk was not taken i died when i was young because i have taken the life as it comes i just have uh, went on with the time without taking any kinds of risk but take risk on your own capabilities now uh, one of the wise man uh, told opportunity does not comes gift wrapped you must take risk it is safe to say the life's greatest lessons come when we shift our focus out of our comfort zone we grow tremendously when we take the road less traveled it is not like what others are doing let us just follow them let us take the risk and take that road which we like and that even though it is less traveled creating our own trail making our own choices and freeing ourselves from the biggest question what if what if i do this what will happen if i do this just overcome that question mark zuckerberg once uh, uh, he was addressing a group of young people he told that in this world which is changing tremendously the only risk the only strategy that is guaranteed to fail is not taking risk great risk can reap great rewards see a uh, stress management going with the patience and the confidence and then uh, coming up uh, for taking risk no what these all uh, things all the virtues depend only on well only on one quality that is drive the passion the will power uh, now mark spets one out of all the times in 1968 olympic games uh, which were held in mexico he have won three gold medals in 1972 munich games he have won seven gold medals so one of the reporter he just rushed towards the uh, mr spets and asked him mr spets must be a lucky day for you you know what was the answer of mr spets he told i did not get lucky from 1968 to 72 i trained myself for four years let me say eight hours per day he have trained himself he was in the water this is the will power this is the passion you know this will power it is not an uh, like innate trait that comes which we are born with or without it is a complex uh, mind body process and of course it adds energy to the body to it motivates us you know this will power when it it will be a super power if designed through emotional experience the emotional experiences give you a drive because it has feelings extreme emotions will always be remembered the situations when uh, someone expired or when the situation when you were very happy the situation when you were suddenly met with an accident and so these are remembered because they have feelings in them similarly associate will power with the feelings and definitely it will create a drive for you and uh, so uh, like as just now ma'am told that we are running off shortage of time let me cut short my presentation uh, let us have that courage to begin and let us have seek beginning courage it's okay but many people doesn't have courage to continue 
what we deserve we get it so i end my session by this टूटने लगे हौसले तो याद रखना टूटने लगे हौसले तो ये याद रखना बिना मेहनत के तख्त ताज नहीं मिलते टूटने लगे हौसले तो ये याद रखना बिना मेहनत के तख्त ताज नहीं मिलते झूठ लेते हैं अंधेरों में मंजिल अपनी झूठ लेते हैं अंधेरों में मंजिल अपनी क्योंकि हम एजुकेटर्स रोशनी के मोहताज नहीं होते वी फाइंड अवर ओन वे and so thank you i thank everyone for listening me very patiently and um, thanks a lot for the gate education for giving this opportunity thank you thanks anju mara ma'am for the amazing and the insightful session that we uh, we had with you um we really enjoyed the way you told about stress management the use stress and how we can actually come out of it and your the focus on manasthiti instead of paristhiti how that brings a difference in one's life so that was really insightful and your formula of practice patience and progress will definitely take all of us ahead and um, uh, we really enjoyed the way you told us about the drive and the importance of drive in our life how to catch on to the opportunities that comes to us and how the passion and the will power is something that really takes us ahead so thank you ma'am for the wonderful session and uh, we hope to hear from you in the near future too thank you so much it's my pleasure so now moving on to the last speaker of the day uh, so the last speaker is mr rajendra jain from nellore andhra pradesh he has done a lot of work in memory techniques memory sports study skills founder uh he is also into i memory learning systems and has um, been an awardee for i memory school awardee national memory so welcome mr rajendra jain and i welcome you to uh, the session kindly we take over from here thank you anuja ma'am i am audible to everyone yeah thank you so much so good evening everyone uh first of all i'm very much thankful to the founder of global education sir uh, sunita gandhi who has created really a wonderful platform for us for all of us during this pandemic period today our session is all about first of all i would like to introduce myself my name is rajender jain i'm a grand master in memory and the founder of i memory learning systems i memory school in andhra pradesh so been uh, last 10 years since i have been participated in uh, so many memory competitions national and international also finally i became grand master in 2013 in london and now i am a coach for indian participants so i have developed my own learning systems which is helpful in uh, memory sports as well as in education also today so today my topic is on all about memory sports memory techniques and how to use them into the education also both the topics we will cover so so let us share the presentation is it clear to everyone can anyone answer please yes sir yeah okay thank you so much so so today's topic is about memory sports and memory techniques uh our country is a very less familiar with memory sports actually and very few places it happens and uh, i recommend i prefer that this memory sport should be in every school of india because it's very very useful it will create some new energy and interesting part for students as well as for teachers also and, and the techniques are very useful to learn so uh in this uh, memory sports there are 10 different kinds of events i will uh, cut short them because we are already running out of time so in this 10 events they will ask us about how to remember numbers there is a numbers memorization test random words 
test binary digits names and faces spoken numbers they will make you to listen they will make us to listen to the numbers and uh, we need to remember the same sequence of numbers historic dates speed cards 15 minutes numbers images and random cards so before i start let let, I, let me clarify you uh this is all about memorization but don't think that it is only about mugging the information or like that no it is not about mugging the information it is about visualizing creatively with the technique with the with a particular proper technique then only it can be happen i would like to show you some examples so this is the numbers paper this is a question paper which will be asked in the competition they are row wise 40 digits they are random numbers see and they will give us 5 minutes of time in that 5 minutes of time you need to remember the sequence from row 1 first digit to last digit as many as you can so in 5 minutes you may not believe it people are remembering 500 digits more than 500 digits also possible generally it's very hard as hard for us to remember 10 digits a mobile number is very hard for us to remember right but if you know the technique you can remember as many as numbers as you can it's all depend on your gray matter how fast you can be so this is the question paper they will give us 5 minutes to remember and then immediately there will be an answer paper like this and you need to fill up the same numbers which you saw like this and any one number is wrong suppose so the whole row will be wrong they will give zero score so like that there will be a numbers memorization competition and then this is the world record somebody from italy andrea musli 572 digits he have memorized correctly correct numbers and this is binary digits since the computer code binary numbers they will be jumbled 1001 numbers in a row there are 30 in a row and you need to remember the same sequence once again same like that and the scoring also will be same and in this the world record is 1251 digits that is from mongolia and kutai and now this is words memorization this is very interesting for uh, students as well as for teachers also in a column there will be 20 words so like that they will give one two papers and they will give 5 minutes only you need to remember the same sequence of words as well as spellings also perfect spelling if it is there is a single word spelling letter spelling mistake they will cut half a mark and if there is one word is completely wrong they will reduce the score as 10 only suppose if you write everything is correctly as 20 20 words are correct then the score will be 20 out of 20 and if it is wrong of one word any one word the score will be 10 only so like that they will give the score and again i am telling you this is not about mugging the information with a just a memory it is not memory the word is memory only but there is uh, behind this there is a technique to remember it so it is not about 20 40 or 60 in 5 minutes you can remember 1000 words also continuously if you know the proper technique then it is then only it is possible so it is very very useful for the students also to make them to remember some new words like this and they will it will it will create a lot of interest and enthusiasm also this is the answer paper once the memorization part is over after 5 minutes they will take the paper and in the recall sheet you need to write the same word in the same place if you miss any one single place there will be negative marking this is how this competition happens and then in the 5 minutes 145 words has been remembered this is a world record from mongolia once again that is miss yanja went to solve and now the interesting part historic dates they will give the uh, dates and year i mean day, year and the uh, incident happened these are all fictional dates they are not real now so you need to remember that's the idea only that's it in which year what happened see generally dog climbs the tree it won't happen so it's a fictional dates they are not real dates you need to remember the year and the sentence whatever it is written so in the answer paper they will jumble all the sentences whatever incident happened and you need to write the correct date for this incident if you write correct four digits correct you will get full score as one if you make any one single mistake there will be no scoring 
So in this, the world record is in five minutes, 148 dates has been remembered by Pratik Yadav. He's from India. And names and faces. See, there are different names, different faces. He can, they may ask from globally any face to any country and any name also. There will be no relation for name and the face. And in the answer paper, they will jumble all the faces and you need to write the same particular word which has been seen in the question paper. See, uh, here you can see his name is Jens Ivano. He's in the third row, fourth person. And now here he is at a uh, top, first row, first person. So they will jumble the faces. You need to find his name with correct spelling. So here also again, one not five names in five minutes, one not five names in five minutes. That is from England, Katy Karmore. So images memorization. This is interesting for the younger kids. In a row, there will be five images. You need to remember the same sequence. Which one is first, which one is second, which one is third. So in the answer paper, Recall sheet, you need to write the sequence of the images. One, two, three, four, five, like that. You need to put the sequence numbers. And uh, 455 images in five minutes is a world record by Andrea Mosley again from Italy. And now cards memorization. This is a fantastic uh, memorization. You, it, it may seem like just like a magic, but no, it's a pure systematic memory power only. It can be happen. In a deck of cards, 52 cards will be there. They will jumble all the cards and you need to memorize them in the same sequence. And in another deck of cards, they will give another fresh deck of cards. You need to recall them with the same sequence. So I would like to show this video, uh, but I will forward uh, it because of running out of time. Uh, sorry, uh, Rajin Siji. Uh, we are actually enjoying your session, but if you can wrap up in another one or two minutes. We'll yeah, we will make it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, so 52 cards can be memorized. Uh, it's been memorized in 12 seconds by one second in Mongolia. Mongolian spoken numbers is nothing but hearing the sounds and you need to remember them. And then now, now how to use these techniques in education also. So these techniques are very, very useful in education like the applications which we are, I'm using already since 10 years is uh, by remembering the number values, new words and their meanings. This is a very difficult task for students, but it is very easy to remember. Names and places of new people, how to remember them. Historic dates, in a history book, if you are having 100 dates, it's very easy to remember if you know the number system. Scientific names and plants, names of plants and animals. Periodic table of elements, there are 180 elements so far. So you can remember all of them with, uh, with the atomic weight also, atomic number, atomic weight also. Country and capitals, there are 236 more than countries. You can remember them all. Presidents and prime ministers since independence. GMAT vocabulary. So many students used to call me how to remember GMAT, GMAT vocabulary words. And Indian penal codes, 530 penal codes are there. Chemical formulas, chemistry, etc. And you can use according to your usage and your uh, way of advantage and how you want to make it. So these are the memory techniques we can use them. And the last is the memory maps, I memory maps and speed reading. These two are very useful for the high school level students. Generally in a classroom, the, the biggest task is for the students, the bigger task is uh, focus. A uh, teacher will teach the lesson. After that, there will be question and answers and then there will be an exam. But a student really not ready for the annual exam preparation because they are not organizing the information of the lesson. Sir, I humbly request you to wind up now. Yeah. So these maps are very much useful. You can uh, make a 30 pages of lesson into one page. Like that, I memory maps are very useful. As well as speed reading. She is Annie Jones, world's best speed reader. If you know the technique of reading, it will be useful in revision part. So that is how these all techniques are useful. And uh, these are, this is a Rubik's Cube. We have introduced Rubik's Cube in our school. So now and then weekly once we used to do competitions with the students so that it will make research them and uh, it will create interest in schooling. And uh, this is all about the 
the t- memory techniques and the memory sports thank you sir thank you thank you rajesh and jayanti yeah. we, we were really enjoying all the the memory sports and the interesting games that you were telling us about and definitely we would like to have a longer session in which we can understand about each and every technique that you are you were talking about yeah and ma'am one more, one more thing if any of you want to introduce you introduce this uh memory competitions in your school well, let us know because in in india every year we are going to do organize the national level memory championships everywhere so sometimes in mumbai sometimes in andhra pradesh now and then in gujarat also we are doing so if anybody is interested to do it in your school also we can make it that's wonderful so in the end uh, i would like to thank all the esteemed speakers for their out of box thinking the amazing work being done by them uh, and getty for providing us a platform in which we can actually share and learn from each other i'm sure we'll be able to influence the educational systems of our respective institutions and bring in a change in the quality of the education and more and more children can benefit from that thank you thank you each one of you for coming here uh, and being a part of the gati education leadership conference round table 7 thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank you rajinder sir thank you thank you very much ma'am anuja shivasam to chair the seventh round table and thank you to all our keynote speakers who shared their thoughts on an all encompassing education and now we request all our participants to kindly fill up the feedback form and upon filling up the feedback form you all earn a certificate getty fellowships and awards are uh, a big way to say thanks to all of you so we invite you all to write down your ideas for change and commit to carry them out of the conference within your schools and contexts we take a very short break a tea break and uh, in the meanwhile we present before you a beautiful a video a beautiful presentation to you all and then we proceed further to the eighth round table to be chaired by none other than mr roshan gandhi Look around 
around you. Everything changes. Everything on this earth is in a continuous state of evolving, refining, improving, adapting, enhancing, and changing. You were not put on this earth to remain stagnant. You are meant to be in a state of continuous metamorphosis. The swan is a symbol of grace, beauty, love, music, and poetry. As summer fades to a nostalgic memory, embrace the thrill of transformation. Just as the swan shifts to meet the new laws of nature, you can write your own journey. You can bend your habits, stretch your goals, and shift your thinking to become the next best version of yourself. and gentlemen now i take uh, this as an honor to invite here at this platform none other than the youth icon the 
personality to whom all the young generation people look upon, Mr. Roshan Gandhi, the CEO of City Montessori School, to chair this eight round table, navigating the future technology and education. Mr. Roshan Gandhi leads transformation across City Montessori Schools, the world's largest city school with 57,000 students. A graduate from the University of Oxford with an MBA in educational leadership from University College London, he has also worked in and continues to consult for various education technology companies. Mr. Roshan is a frequent speaker at educational conferences in India and internationally, and often publishes on educational topics. Welcome, Mr. Roshan Gandhi, and over to you to conduct and chair this eight round table with the speakers of the day. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much to Dr. Sunita Gandhi and the entire Ed Leadership team for very kindly inviting me today as a chairperson. And it looks like we've got a very exciting session ahead just now. So we've got a session uh, entitled Navigating the Future, Technology and Education. So we've got some expert panelists who will be uh, expressing their views today on uh, the future of education, specifically in relation to technology and the role that technology will play uh, in education going forward. Um, I think the format that we'll follow for this session is uh, we'll, we'll go one by one uh, to each of the speakers and I'd request each speaker to speak uh, for about 15 minutes. I would start by introducing each speaker and then at the end we would have about 15 minutes of time after all the speakers have uh, spoken for a question and answer session. Uh, so I'll moderate that and feel free to address your questions to uh, any panelist or to do open questions. Um, and then I will uh, just do a little bit of summing up and then we'll wrap up uh, the day there. So without further ado, uh, I think we'll make a start. So I'll do the formal introductions uh, as each one speaks, uh, but just for now, I'll, I'll list the speakers. We have Neelam Parmar, Charity Limboro, uh, Just Meet Sani, Lali John, Jennifer Nye and Tazin Jamal Siddiqui. And uh, Jennifer Nye uh, unfortunately could not be with us in the end today, uh, but she has very kindly sent a video message, which we will begin the session with. So briefly, I'll just introduce uh, Jennifer Nye. She's uh, from USA Digital Literacy, a Teaching Today researcher uh, into curriculum instruction and literacy, and is the Director of Professional Learning Services at Learning A to Z. As an experienced educator and literacy literacy specialist, Jennifer believes in the expertise of the teacher and the power of literacy. In her role as Director of Professional Learning Services at Learning A to Z, Jennifer's mission is to empower educators with the knowledge, resources, and research that can help every student reach his or her fullest potential. She is currently earning her PhD in cu Curriculum Instruction and Literacy from Kent State University. Uh, so I would request the Ed Leadership team to please present the video which she has kindly sent. Hello from the US to all the 2021 Getty Ed Leadership Conference attendees. I trust that the phenomenal ideas and knowledge being presented by all the distinguished presenters is inspiring the teacher within you all. My name is Jennifer Nye and I'm the Director of International Academics and Curriculum at Learning E to Z. While I'd hope to attend the conference live, I'm honored at the opportunity to speak to you all through this recording and sincerely thank the Global Education and Training Institute for the opportunity. Today, I'm excited to speak with you about digital literacy. Digital literacy is not only an incredibly important topic in today's educational landscape, evidenced by its inclusion in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and India's 2020 ed national education policy, but also that this topic aligns with the theme of this conference, the power of change. To get us thinking about change in digital literacy, I invite you to take a moment to reflect on what literacy means to you. What did it mean to you as a young student? 
what does it mean to you now? For me, as a student, and also even when I began my teaching career about 20 years ago, I viewed literacy as reading a print-based text and comprehending it enough to answer a set of questions my teacher gave me. For me, writing was putting pencil to paper for the purpose of drafting a text-based essay or perhaps writing a note to a friend. Did anybody else think of literacy in those terms? While those conceptions are certainly relevant today, they kind of serve as an oversimplified view of literacy, especially in our technology-mediated world. That view of literacy does not account for how literacy has changed, nor does it consider the many layers and purposes of literacy in today's ever-changing world. Let's look at a few examples to see what I mean. As we look at these examples, I would like you to reflect on the purpose of these examples. What skills were needed to carry out these examples? How important are these examples in today's world? Is an individual at a deficit if they cannot participate or demonstrate proficiency in these types of examples? Let's check it out. So let's look at this first example. It probably looks very familiar to you. This was actually a screenshot of a text message communication between my youngest daughter and myself. What I want you to, or hopefully what you do notice about this example is the non-linear format of the text. So notice that we communicated with her beginning the text message then I responded, and then she responded with three different texts. Instead of me responding again, however, notice that I responded with a sticker to this picture. The text was not in written from left to right, top to bottom necessarily. Also, did you notice how we conveyed meaning or what we were intending to communicate through emoticons, pictures, and even a little sticker. All right, so is that literacy? What was the purpose of this? Did we communicate effectively and efficiently? Did we write? Did we read? Is this literacy? Let's look at another example. This probably also looks quite familiar to you. I took a screenshot of a communication in Instagram posted by Learning A to Z. So what do you notice in here? One of the first things I notice is again, the text is not linear. I also notice again, a use of images. And most importantly in this one, I notice how this communication this writing, this receiving of the message through reading can be shared widely. This was not like the text message that was just between my daughter and I, because what Learning A to Z did was use a particular hashtag. Individuals that responded on this social media post included others who will now see this message. Again, is this literacy? Was this literacy 20 years ago? Is this literacy today? All right, third example. Again, probably something that looks very familiar to us all. We've got a Google Doc snapshot here. What do you notice in this one that is happening in real time? Notice this screenshot of Jack, who you can tell is right in that moment of responding to something that was written on this page. However, notice that Jen responded at a different time. She responded asynchronously, yet she's using writing, yet she's communicating, and others are reading it. Notice also how many voices are included in this. 
This is not just Jack writing in isolation. This is Jack and Jen collaborating in their writing. Is this literacy? And let's look at one more. Take a moment to read those headlines for me. Hopefully those headlines are giving you a little chuckle. Is this relevant in today's world? What skills do we need when we encounter these types of texts? Is this an important part of literacy as we know it today? Hopefully that with each of those examples, you saw that we drew upon our traditional understanding of literacy, which is reading and writing. But hopefully you also noticed that extended set of features and tools and competencies related to reading and authorship. Hopefully it is stretching your view of what literacy is and can be for our students. It is these noticings that I hope lead us to our understanding of what digital literacy is. So let's talk about that for a moment. What actually is digital literacy? If you Google that term or you read some research articles on this topic, you might find that it is defined a little bit differently everywhere. The definition that I like to use was published by the American Library Association. And it states that digital literacy is the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, create, and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. So if I unpack that definition, it makes me really consider both the traditional aspects of literacy, but also the meaningful use of information and communication technologies in ways that is high level and ways that is also communicative and also collaborative. So in other words, Think of digital literacy as involving the knowledge and use of digital tools and skills and combining that or using that to engage in high level thinking through active and collaborative reading and writing experiences. Now, as you consider that definition and as you think about those examples that we just looked at, is that the type of literacy that we as adults are often engaging in in our lives? Is it the type of literacy that oftentimes our students might be engaging in outside of their classroom? And most importantly, is it the type of literacy that we need to be proficient in our jobs and careers of today and in the future. I argue that it most certainly is, which validates our focus on this topic and our consideration for how do we incorporate this then into our classrooms. Now, fortunately, ladies and gentlemen, there's a great deal of research on the topic of digital literacy. And this research is phenomenal in order to guide our understanding and our practices. For example, I'd like to draw on the work of Denise Johnson because in her book, she suggests that there are multiple skills, strategies, and dispositions that we should teach our students. For example, we should be teaching our students how to collaborate effectively. We should be teaching them how to then communicate and to synthesize that information. We should teach them to have a critical stance on much of what they read and to reflect on that and decide how they can communicate that to others. Now you might be looking at this list and saying, well, I do all of that in my classroom. I've been doing that for a long time. And absolutely, we have been doing those types of skills and building those strategies in our students for a long time. The difference is, is that we need to think about and consider how we can take and build those skills and strategies in our students so that they can participate in our classroom in a range of experiences 
that are meaningful and authentic and allow them to leverage information and communication technologies as a valued form of literacy. Let me tell you a quick story. I was talking to a teacher recently and we were talking about this very topic. And she told me that for her, technology has been disruptive to literacy. She doesn't like how it has caused students to write in shorter sentences, she believed. She didn't like the support mechanisms that were built into tools like spell check. She had a couple other really valid reasons as to why she felt technology actually negatively disrupted her students' literacy progress and also what she felt was important to teach. But after we talked about, again, the importance of valuing and using these types of technologies in our classroom for simply because it's the type of literacy our students will engage in in their jobs and careers, she had a little bit of a shift. And that shift was also in that one thing wasn't more important than the other. The traditional forms of literacy, um, reading and writing were still absolutely important and critical, but that it was okay to also incorporate the digital literacy aspects into her classroom. It was that balance that she needed. So what I would like to do now is I'd like to give you three ideas for how you might consider incorporating digital literacy into your classroom. These ideas are designed to be very flexible. They're designed to incorporate a lot of what you're already doing in your classroom, but really just building upon how you can meaningfully use those information and communication technologies so that students can take it to the next level and so that they can collaborate and they can use more evaluative and analysis skills. So one of the ideas is surrounding digital citizenship, which is actually a part of digital literacy. How do I act, behave in a digital environment? So one of the things that you might consider doing in your classroom is locating textbooks or um, children's literature, or anything that you use that focuses on topics related to digital citizenship. In uh, Learning A Disease program RAS Plus, I have a sample of three that I really like. Cyberbullying, Sadie's Incredible Essay that focuses on plagiarism, and Dungeons and Downloads, which talks about internet safety. So most likely you're using picture books or text in your classroom. This is just one opportunity to choose text that focus on these topics related to digital citizenship. Now, after you use those books in your classroom and your students have read them or they've listened to you read them out loud, you can encourage them to synthesize their learnings and create a digital book, storyboard, or comics that visually depict their interpretations of digital citizenship. Remember, encourage and value your students' use of nonlinear text. So meaning it does not have to be written as we would be writing an essay on a piece of paper. They can be creative and move around on the page. They can include imagery, they can include embedded links or even videos. And I listed here on the screen a couple of different programs that you might want to explore. As I mentioned, um, the books that I referenced on this example come from RAS Plus, our, um, our ELL edition. You might also want to check out Writing City, which is a program that allows students to write and create um, on a digital platform. And then if you're interested in trying out the digital storyboards or comics that students can create, check out storyboardthat.com and writecomics.com. All right, so another example that you might want to consider is to engage your students in a project-based learning experience that requires students to collaboratively and critically evaluate sources to solve problems. 
So first of all, I really love project-based learning because it does require students to be evaluative. So they can look at sources in programs, they can look at sources across the internet, in their library, but we're requiring them to evaluate those sources. What you might want to do, even just to spice it up a little bit, is see if you can throw in some sources that are not valid. For example, fake news, because we want students the opportunity to evaluate those and make sure that they're just not assuming that if it's on paper or if it's on the internet, that it's true. We want them to be evaluative of that and really look at it critically. So after students go through the process of looking at sources and evaluating them in order to attempt to solve a problem, and in this example, I just listed how can communities use technology to solve the problem of disappearing coral reefs. What you might wanna do is take it another step forward. You might wanna encourage students to draft and publish a collaborative blog that describes how they would solve their problem. So again, we're just trying to incorporate all of our traditional conceptions of reading and writing, but also that of digital literacy. Your same objectives are being met, except students are extending their learning and they're more engaged in collabor collaboration using information and communication technology. So just as a couple examples, you might wanna check out um, examples you come from RAS Plus, but then for students to communicate collaboratively, both synchronously and asynchronously, and then to perhaps turn that collaboration into a student-friendly blog post, you might wanna check out Google Docs or these blogging form, uh, platforms called EduBlogs, Weebly, and KidBlog.org. All right, one other final example is, has to do with poetry. And most likely we're all at some point teaching poetry to our students, which is so very important. After you have students explore whatever type of poetry you're focused on, or perhaps it's a variety, instead of always having them maybe recreate a poem on their own using pencil or paper, or even just a, um, word processing software, why don't you try to have them create poetry through text? I like to call it texting poetry. You might find it called visual poetry. But what you're doing is you're giving students the opportunity to still create poetry and be creative, but you're valuing and allowing them to use features associated with texting. So that might be the LOL, or that might be some of those acronyms. It might also be, as you can see in the picture, uh, some of the images. There are lots of free resources online that students can create fake, uh, fake texts like you're seeing on the screen. So do a search for those, see which ones might be appropriate for your school um, or your students. But again, it's a fun way to value the type of literacy that they're often engaging in outside of your classroom but yet you're still meeting your same learning objectives and reaching your same learning outcome. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that these examples and our really brief talk on digital literacy is a springboard to you considering how it can be incorporated into your classroom. Remember, digital literacy builds on what we've always valued in reading and writing but it extends this to include the use of communication and information technologies for high level collaborative and communitive learning experiences. Incorporating digital literacy in your classroom is motivating to your students. It creates a sense of authenticity and it prepares them most importantly for the type of literacy they will engage in with their job and careers. Most likely, it's the type of literacy they're already engaging with outside of our classrooms. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope that you are walking away with some new information. And again, thank you so much for inviting me to 
hopefully get you excited about digital literacy. And I wish you a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Well, thank you very much in absentia to Jennifer Nye. And the great thing about a digital conference is that you wouldn't know whether she's there or not, felt like she was. Uh, thank you to Jennifer Nye for, I think, helping us all reflect on what literacy really means in the modern digital age uh, and encouraging us to actually uh, allow and encourage students to you know, approach literacy perspective. Um, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Neelam Parmar. Uh, Dr. Neelam currently works as Director of Educational Technology, Digital Learning and Innovation. Uh, she uh, draws on her research and practical experiences of working with technology and regularly presents around the UK and internationally on the role of edtech in digital education providing strategy roadmaps and CPD programs for digital blended and hybrid learning approaches. She's the author of Digital Literacy in the Primary Series and Digital Parenting Book. Uh, she's an award-winning professional international researcher, author, thought leader, and speaker on effective technology, pedagogy, and curriculum integration within education, and is currently uh, engaged with the uh, Department for Education EdTech Leadership Group, uh, EdTech Impact Workshops, and the Women EdTech Movement. Uh, and on a personal note, I can say I've um, I, I've I, I've seen uh, the wonderful materials uh, that Dr. Neelam has has made, and in fact, it, it's it's almost like a benchmark for us because a few years ago I had a a review of those materials with great excitement, <laughs> wanting to sort of incorporate them in our schools. Uh, and we we realized that you know there's a lot of scaffolding work that we have to do to get us into that age. Uh, so I think. Uh, you know, we're, we're aiming to be able to get to a point where Neelam is, is leading. Uh, so it's very exciting, the kind of work that Neelam is doing. So please, Neelam, go ahead. Thank you, Roshan. And so good to see you, even if it's only on Zoom. Yes. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, I, I'm going to share my screen so we can take it from here. But um, what I thought I'd say as well is thank you for that fantastic introduction. And I forget uh, the work we've done together. To, to bring us to this stage. And I'm sure that as we carry on now in this remote learning environment, um, we're just gonna be inventing and recreating. So let me share my screen and we can take it from there. Um, I mean, if you can't see, are you able to see my presentation? Yeah? Yes, it's visible now. Roshan, can you see it? Yeah, okay. Um, so I have a slightly different agenda today and I hope I don't diverge too much, but I was very happy to see that and hear that the previous conversation was all about digital literacy because it's so key at the moment as we know it. It's probably more important that our students and our children learn have these digital literacy skills they need uh, just so that we can keep them safe. We're now in a position where we've thrown them into the deep end and they are having to survive sometimes alone in this online environment. And if they don't have the safe digital knowledge, skills, awareness during this time, and how to use the tools as well within an educational uh, set setting, it makes it so difficult for them. Their education is disrupted, they cannot carry on. Uh, parents get frustrated, teachers don't know how to, to uh, facilitate conversations. So, so happy to hear that digital literacy is still um, so important. Now. I am going to focus around the topic that we've put out, navigating the future, technology and education, and probably focus on the word of change and how change leads to new learning, particularly that, um, that quote and post we put out. Before I say that though, yes, I do work at Ashford School and I've been part of the United Learning Schools and been supporting them in terms of digital education, but I also have some news for you and I might as well go live today while I'm here. Mm. Um, I shall now be moving on to new pastures and we'll be working with our school in Asia. Um, so I will soon be relocating to Asia in Hong Kong and we will hopefully be closer to each other so we won't have this terrible time distance and time lag. Uh, so I thought I'd let you know that as well. Um, okay, so let's have a look at it. Power of change. I mean, it's no surprise in March, the world 
was temporarily closed. And this was literally global uh, to the point that we needed, nobody knew what to do. Everything had stopped and change had to happen. And of course, to some, when you look at, think about change, there is a lot of resistance to change. People don't like change. I have to say though, um, there was a different mindset in Asia, perhaps with the Indian community as well, to some extent where change is the way of life. You have to accommodate, you have to move with the times. Um, it's slightly different when you have a legacy of systems, legacy of behaviors, legacy of patterns that you don't want to move away from, but the world closed and education had to carry on. So what do we do? And that's when we had to bring in and look at new transformational learning opportunities. School closed, stay at home, and therefore changes had to be made. Now, obviously, this topic is about looking at it from a technology and a digital education side of things. But as it says, that the effect of change is, is all uh, the effect. What is it? Change is it ultimately is the result of all true learning. And I think that would be quite rightly true uh, for ed the education sector, for the teachers, for the students, and for the parents. I mean, never have we had a time where parents are actually educating their own children in, the, in, the, in a more formalized sense, or to the fact that actually students might be educating their teachers, and even sometimes their parents, or even their grandparents, because they've got to get the information across so they can carry on their education. And even now to the point where education was so badly disrupted that uh, schools had to find new ways of teaching. And when um, it was impossible or even unforgivable, unforgivable to think about bringing technology into education, now we know it's a, it's a non-negotiable, it's a, it's a game changer. So what, what's come to light since March and now is the use of technology is non-negotiable. It's, um, it's the only way we could have we have carried on learning and, and educating ourselves. And um, those schools that have all those advocates who had probably put it down in the past few months and said, no, we, sh yes, we shouldn't be looking at technology. Um, it's damaging our children to that extent, or you know, there's really no um, outcomes generated by the use of tech. This is a time when we can now come back, the advocates of technology can come in front and say, we told you so. You know, if you had only done this a few years ago, you wouldn't be in this position where you're isolated, you're alienated and you're suffering or you're trying to catch up with the rest of the world. There was something there. It perhaps was considered more of a luxury. And if you were lucky to have played with it, good for you. But for those, and, I, and this is not just to the outside market, even in the UK, those who refuse to accept that there was some value to technology have now struggled. And so I'm now trying to play catch up. And what I'm going to share with you in the next few slides are some of the things that we're doing here in the UK, some of the areas where there were challenges and issues, and then what we've done to overcome them. And I think it might be useful for you and the teachers in the community. So in terms of digital education, what were some of the schools doing before we even went in this whole lockdown, before COVID even hit us? Well, most of us had some sort of online platform. <clears throat> Either we had a LMS, virtual learning system, or a learning management system, or we had some sort of online platforms that were not necessarily school-based, school-hosted either. They were very much hosted in the cloud, which again, you'll know, will make a huge difference um, because schools are closed. So who's going to go into school and start managing all these servers? And they cost so much. The other thing we consider are pupil devices. Now, while there are some schools that are still running with phones and particularly parents use a WhatsApp, we know from experience that it's not necessarily the best experience learning experience we can give to our student. There's so much more we need them to see and we need to keep them engaged for eight to 10 hours. Is it actually feasible and safe for our children to sit there and look at a small screen for so long? So pupil devices is another thing. And so for that effect, the government in England, and we've been quite lucky, have actually pulled, pushed out an initiative where they have offered Google Chrome books um, to all those children who fall in the pupil premium, those who, uh, those who tend to be in the low and disadvantaged areas, not across the board, of course. Staff digital skills, and again, this is highly key uh, because at the end of the day, it's the teaching staff who are gonna be delivering the curriculum, who are gonna be delivering that teaching experience for the students. So again, those schools that have been able to use some systems, teach the uh, teachers how to use those systems, where to store their work, how to deliver an effective lesson, have been so successful in this implementation. In fact, some schools within 48 hours or 24 hours, click the switch, we're online instantly, and we're good to go. 
But of course, others were just not prepared for this. Um, you, they may have had the systems, but the staff didn't know what to do and how to deliver an effective online lesson. So these are some of the areas that, you know, the top three, which have been, and four actually, have been major gaps in design. Then there's, the, I won't talk about digital literacy skills, I'm sure you've heard enough, remote curriculum. So we all need to deliver a standard curriculum so our children can pass at the end of the day and sit their exams. We have the same issues in the UK. And in fact, you must have heard about the catastrophe of the whole GCSE and A-level exams and being cancelled and then working with a teacher performance results, etc. cetera. Um, but what we found is the curriculum was not necessarily adaptable in an online environment either. So how could we get the children engaged in our learning materials where we were not reading off the screen, we were not pushing our documents, but we were actually keeping them engaged and motivated in an eight hour school day. So we had to almost adapt our curriculum to meet that online environment and also give them the skills they need rather than just memorize and put it back down on paper uh, because it's very easy for them to cheat. I mean. It's impossible for to hold a really tightly regulated exam online exam condition. Um, <clears throat> just today, or my, my son is sitting some assessments, and uh, he's sitting in a room with their laptop, and I'm outside, and we've got two devices, one watching him and one in front of me at my Mac, as I am here in front of you. I mean, how difficult it is actually to put a VGA connection to my laptop, have a TV in front of me and watch the screen and, and me sitting there in front giving him the answers, miming it. It's not difficult. Now, if I can think of that, the children can think of 10 other solutions of how they can actually um, cheat in this environment. So one of the biggest concerns has been that no matter how many online quizzes and text and assignments we hand to our students, they'll find a way to collaborate and make sure they get 100%. So I won't go on anymore about that. So working in that curriculum where it's not only assessment based, then we've had to cater to what we call the digital well-being and communities because of what's happening with us sitting in homes, isolated environments, our students' mental well health. Um, so all of this were gaps in design, but what would then be put together would make a holistic digital education. So I won't, I won't go too much about this, but the things we identified was, we need to consider devices. We need to look at our internet services. Again, there are some remote places here in the UK where um, we don't have the type of interactivity or speed that you would need. Therefore, how are we gonna make lessons offline? Uh, meeting the core curriculum, looking at feedback. Uh, feedback doesn't just mean annotating on a book and, and taking a photo. It's using emojis, it's using post, it's, um, it's going verbal feedback, it's giving written feedback, it's giving annotation feedback, it's picking up the phone call and speaking to the parent as well. So suddenly our feedback systems were all, were massive. We weren't working through just one vehicle as we did before. So with all that in mind, um, you know, so many different models came into being. And I don't know where, each of your schools are in this or whoever's on this call. But we started from no tech, whereas you know, uh, teachers were printing out materials, for making folders and books, and then delivering them to parents or them to buy their books and working off textbooks. And we found that this was good, but not good enough. In fact, it probably is, you know, you would cons the, the argument around this is, well, I don't need a teacher, I can do this myself. So you've just put down a situation for a child and a parent to say, I know no longer need to send my child to school. It's not relevant. Or we would have what we have here in England, we have BBC Radio or BBC TV, and they take in the initiative or commercialized organizations taking the initiative to teach our students because the teachers are not doing their job. So no tech. And I think if schools found themselves in this position, they are in danger. They are in danger of uh, um, of, of outsourcing education to a, another commercialized organization or to the government or to where, whoever. Then there's low tech where we have things like phone access, upload of worksheets, text to speech streaming on emails. Again, good, but not good enough because there isn't any sort of interacti interactivity happening and you're leaving it up to the parent and the child to manage the distribution of emails, documents. And what happens when they need to print and there's no printer at home either? So, you know, there's a lot of areas that question marks and we've left the problems to the family and to the parents. That's not what we do in school. We fix most of our problems and then we give the, send them home with homework to do. That's 10% of the whole equation. What we've done in this environment is given them 90% of the problems and they're offering our 10% of our resource. So it didn't work. It wasn't very successful. Schools that were in this position knew that they could not carry on as they were and therefore had to look at a different means of teaching. It was what we call the asynchronous and the synchronous teaching patterns, where you either record yourselves 
using my Office 365 PowerPoint or whatever tools you have, and then sending it off to the learner. Now, again, when you're recording yourself, how much is enough? If you're looking at young children, you don't want to give them more than seven to 10 minutes. They can't assimilate that much information. And, um, and then we offer it to them so they can go back and watch it again. All this synchronous is what we're doing now, a very live session. And we're doing that one-to-one -one conversation. And again, how much is enough? So I often play the 70-30. My favorite is 80-20, but I think in this situation, it's a 70-30 role. Um, you know, connect with your child in the beginning, get the registration, say hello, show your faces if you can. Uh, many children don't want to show their faces. And in the UK, after the age of 16, they don't have to. And you can't even fight them because that's a law. Um, then if, 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 if internet is an issue, then give that asynchronous sort of material so they can listen to the video and they can go over it many times. Then offer them the, the, the information they need, the quizzes, the assessments, and then reconnect. Because it's very easy to lose your child. So I could turn off my video now and you don't even know if I'm sitting here anymore, unless of course something else is on. So it's so easy to lose someone because there's always something better to do. And you're in your home environment, the TV's next to you, your phone's next to you, why sit here? So in the UK, we had three different sort of models. Um, we have the, of course, classroom model, which is which no longer exists because we're now again on our third lockdown. But that's another conversation. Let's not get into that. Then there is the, um, I can see Russian smiling. Then we have the blended learning model, where at one point we had children in the classroom and we had to provide a environment where they were also at home. So we had some majority of students was in school somewhere in China or Russia. So we had different time zones. And then we had to cater to students who didn't want to come to school because they were vulnerable. So it was giving that teacher the accessibility to work on a computer. We have an Office 365 environment, run their live sessions, go into video live, get all the students in there, teach, but they're teaching in the classroom to the students. So you can't forget the children and the students. Then also be able to deliver to those in China, Russia, wherever they are in the world and to those in the 21st uh, who are vulnerable and who are facing some internet issues at home. So it is a very interesting sort of environment, but we found that Office, with working with Office 365 teams, we were able to collect all the files in one area, drop all our asynchronous videos in stream, and yet at the same time, push out um, our assessments as we see fit, which were then going happening in the background. The other option, which I helped create was the hybrid learning model. Now, because we've had, um, many, the biggest population here that uh, many students who wanted alternative provision, they were very scared. So like I said, this whole, there's a huge impact on our mental well-being, and even with young children now, refuse to come to school, don't want to come to school, or their parents were vulnerable, or their grandparents are vulnerable. We delivered what we call a hybrid learning model, four days um, at home and one day in school. We helped launch that in, in, in London, where we have a school that the student can actually be home four days, and one day come to school so they can get involved in lab work, they can get involved in physical activity, um, sports and drama, etc. And it's actually worked really well for some students. It may not always work across many schools, but it's probably added more workload to the teacher, but not that much more in the sense that, again, you work on the blended learning environment, you teach your class, but you have to keep your um, video open at the same time. So you're teaching two students, one in school, one out of school, and then bring that child in one day a week. So it's quite a successful model. And then alternatively, there's the online model where everything is online. Now we know this is not gonna work so well with younger ones because there's so much pressure on parents. Um, it works better with the older children, particularly in GCSEs uh, and A-levels, year 10 onwards. Again, that depends on the um, motivation of the, of the learner, whether they wanna have self-independent learning, whether they're happy to carry on as they are, whether they're conscientious children. So it's not very easy to do. However, you might want to look at um, the Oak Academy in, in England, which is purely online, which has all the videos, all the assessment. Again, it's free. And that's what we deliver to students who are not able to get any education. This is becoming quite a popular model. And um, schools, groups of schools, uh, such as what the one I'm going to join, yours, Inspired Gems, are now creating hubs where we have an online platform and students can get into that platform and learn. So teachers are supporting each other as well. You don't need to produce the same material over and over again if you have more than five schools together. Okay, so in terms of then teaching, uh, we found, because we've been in for so long and we were, we were highly rich embedded tech schools, um, getting online and, and teaching in this fashion was not the problem. It was, okay, now how do we make it uh, so effective that the 
student is learning and it's not only just a student apology, but it's also the parent. No matter what you think, you're not educating one child, you're educating an entire family in the background. So what's good, my lesson plan needs to be so good that one, it works, it works for my student and I'm not gonna get any complaints later. It needs to be relevant and meaningful to the curriculum. So I'm not introducing new material because it's easy to do online, but I'm going to carry on where we were last left off. So build on prior learning progression and minimal, I'm just going to drop that, and minimal support from home and parents. Now that's quite key because otherwise that doesn't become an online environment. It, um, it just becomes the same. You're trying to mirror what you're doing in a classroom at, at home and, and that's not possible. So a typical learning experience and a very good learning experience for a student online is, for, is to first start out with reviewing or considering your prior understanding of the topic. So I teach computing to year seven, eight and nine. And um, let's just see what we're, we're running on. We're working on um, some coding in, in, of an app, an app development. And before each class, we go through the little content that we touched on last. And again, if I have to, I'll go through all the instructions as quickly as I can. Then I give direct instructions. So I connect with my students, take some registration. We talk about their project, the new information that's coming through. And sometimes I also offer a little clip on the side guided practice. Now, because it's such an intense subject, but I can model it, I don't offer more than 10, maximum 15 minutes. More than that, you've lost the learner. So I give what we're doing in terms of the new knowledge that we're gonna be using that in that um, lesson. Then I tell them, okay, now it's either time to go ahead and do your own work as an independent activity, or I give them an assessment if necessary via forms and Office 365, which again is automatically graded. So I don't have to worry about that. And at the end of the class, we check for understanding or form. Okay. What's really key is that I'm offering feedback, marking and assessment and constant there's, when I use the um, conversation box in teams, again, the conversation that we have here, um, in Zoom itself, I've made it very clear to the students that it's not there to spam. It's not there for me to promote your social life. It is there to um, ask for you to ask me questions or make really valuable comments, but it's not there to, to exploit. So feedback marking assessment comes in the form of conversations, emojis, um, annotated, verbal, verbal feedback is more effective. And then we follow up with observation, self-reflection and development. How can I refine this better? So when we work with our teachers, we often tell them, start with this plan. This is the three things you really need to do. And then depending on what you're doing, follow the plan. And then that way the students know what to expect. The parents know what to expect. You know how you're writing your plan. Now, I think I'm going over time, so I'll, I'll try to reduce it. Sorry. Um, I, I do think this is very important for teachers to know and for schools to know, because the OECD is now extending their way of thinking. And like I said, if we don't take ownership of our schools and our way of teaching, it will soon be commercialized. It will soon be outsourced. And we don't want to do that. But these are the various sort of ways that people are looking at, either extending schooling, going to hybrid modes, taking it all online, creating learning hubs, joining other schools, you know, uh, sending it, uh, pushing it out to uh, bigger organizations who can, who can make use the technology as a key driver. So for, your, for our own sanity, for us to be teachers, for us to upskill, develop ourselves, we really need to jump on the bandwagon and start educating ourselves. And there's a loads of free, free things out there. There's Future Learn, where you can get some free guides on how to be a better teacher. Um, I deliver more courses on how to be a better teacher here in the UK. If you can join those courses at my time, perfect. Um, you know, go on, uh, there's a lot of, lot of CPD. And if you ever needed that, we can push it out to you. But I'm going to end on this last slide that, you know, despite your best laid plans, the future likes to surprise us. We thought it was over. We thought we would have hit another lockdown, but we're here again. And so we really need to be ready to adapt to it. So the only way to adapt to it is to, is to predict your future. The way to predict your future is to create it. And that's how I'd like to end it. That if you want to make sure that you're sustainable, you're going to move forward, you've got the skills you need, you can continue educating your students, your children, because this is our responsibility as educators, then we need to create our future. We need to reinvent ourselves. And on that note, I will stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Neelam, for I think really comprehensively breaking down pretty much everything about the, the switch to online learning in all sorts of different contexts with all the different kinds of situations that different schools face and really breaking down the, the, the teaching process uh, and how it translates 
uh, online in different ways. And, and you know, I think the, the huge amount of, uh, of, of learning and experimentation that, that you've done across many, many schools uh, and, and influenced across the UK, which you've really condensed for us uh, very comprehensively. So, so thank you very, very much, uh, Neelam, for that. Uh, and without further ado, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Char Charity Limboro. Uh, so Charity is a teacher trainer in the Department of Educational Management Policy and Curriculum Studies at Kenyatta University and is an independent consultant. She has a PhD in Curriculum Studies from Kenyatta University uh, and a Master's and Bachelor's of Education from the University of Nairobi. Uh, she's an educationist with over 25 years of teaching experience at the high school and university sectors uh, in Kenya. She's a seasoned researcher and expert in monitoring and evaluation with a credible track record of scholarship. She has presented conference papers locally and internationally, and her areas of interest include teacher education, inequalities in education, IT, gender, girls' education, education for sustainable development, quality education, and learning outcomes. So uh, quite an interesting range there. And uh, Charity, we look forward to hearing from you now. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for those kind words. All protocols of served. I wish to most sincerely appreciate Dr. Sunita Gathi for the invitation. And also special thanks goes to the conveners who have made this great gathering a success. I feel most humbled to be part of this great virtual congregation that is deliberating on urgent issues of education. I will start sharing my screen now. Um. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. So my presentation is on on technology integration in teacher education. And this comes up and it's, it's a timely presentation given that um, in the current new normal, then we need the use of technology today than before. My presentation will be anchored on the four of the five bullet points. One, I shall go through the rationale or why integrate technology in teacher education. Then I will move to what is the evidence? Are the teachers integrating technology in their teaching learning processes? This will be followed by barriers to technology integration, conclusion and recommendation. Uh, I begin by, in, by defining technology integration as a well-coordinated use of digital devices and cloud computing as tools for problem solving, deeper learning and understanding. When it comes to the digital devices, I have in mind the use of desktop, laptop, tablets, mobile phone, as well as the 
input devices such as the keyboards, mice, scanners, as well as the storage devices such as the flash drives and output devices such as the, the, the printers. When it comes to the, the cloud computing, cloud computing technology allows the user access to storage files, software, and the servers through their internet connecting devices. Meaning, if you have the digital tools, then you can be able to connect them to the internet, you can be able to access the information in, on the internet, as opposed to just relying on the information that is on the, on the hard disk. This means that learners who have knowledge on how to use uh, cloud computing, then they will be able to access the information or the data that is stored in the internet for their own use. And this way they will be able to learn how to solve problems, how to discover things and the comprehension will be higher. Another rationale for integration of technology in teacher education, we are aligned to the fact that we are in the digital era whereby the requirement or the world of work requires human resources or human resource that it is skilled in the use of technology. Remember with the technology, we have a global village. We have become a global village. And the courtesy to technology, most people are working even outside the country in the comfort zone of their houses. Another benefit of technology is the fact that integrating technology in learning teaching processes enables the learner to gain the 21st century skills. That is collaboration, which my, the, my, the earlier presenter mentioned, communication, creativity, critical thinking, and, uh, and solving problems. They do this because they learn by, by, by doing. In addition, the current or the 21st technological explosion has really a profound effect on teaching and learning processes. Gone are the days when teachers and the students used to rely purely on print media, textbooks, hand copies, materials. Currently, information is easily accessible by the click of a button. In addition, digital devices such as the mobile phones are affordable across the social divides. You will find the mobile phones, smartphones in the hands of a majority of the youth, even in developing countries like Kenya. And this which means that uh, then this provides a fertile ground to integrate technology to enhance learning. When you look around, you're going to realize that uh, the students or the youth, they are extremely tech savvy. You will find them most of the time glued on the digital devices, they are either on YouTube or any other social media platform. And this means then still education, we are missing an opportunity to enhance learning. And admittedly, we must say that uh, things have changed. And remember change in education is always for better. We cannot continue doing the same things and expecting better results. If we want to improve the learning outcomes for the children, then gone are the days when the pupils, children, learners, students would sit in a classroom passively to receive all class learning from a teacher. 
things have really changed and education should not be left behind. Teachers should be equipped with the right skills to be able to integrate technology in the classroom so as to facilitate students learning better. Out there, empirical evidence shows that uh, when technology is used well, it makes learning more meaningful and fun. In addition, it, makes, it improves the learner's engagement. They discover more. They learn by doing. They are not passive. They retain the knowledge and the content re uh, retention is high because they are searching for the information themselves. Looking at it on how ICT has benefited education and will continue to benefit education, you note that ICT ended education has the potential to develop student decision-making and problem-solving skills, data processing, and the communication capabilities as noted by Whitworth and Benson 202. All this, what I'm gearing into is to actually situate why then we need to integrate technology in teacher education. The major reason is the fact that the teacher is given the responsibility of guiding students in the learning and, and learning processes. Where the teacher acts as a facilitator, and uh, it has been used even yesterday, that uh, any great, the, any education of a country, any education of any country, education of any country is only as good as its teachers. This means that uh, the skills that the teachers have, the skills, and the pedagogical content, the teaching methodologies, it's a make or break to our education, to our education today. Affects how much students learn. Remember also teachers act as the role models for the young learners. And actually, apart from the parents, most of the children, the learners, the only any other person they have a close contact with and they look up to for guidance is the teacher. And therefore, if the teacher is this make or break in the lives of a use information. Having looked at the rationale or the importance, and uh, it's indisputable that, to move away from being traditional mm -hmm. teachers, teachers who perceived themselves as the source of knowledge, and the learners sitting passively to receive information from the teachers, moving to the constructivists, theory where teachers are facilitators and they guide the learners to learn, then we are saying that the change is now. Teachers cannot be left behind. They need the right skills, they need the, the right skills and knowledge in technology so that they can support effective learning.
evidence, the research evidence indicates that um, many governments globally, at the global level, they have heavily invested in ICT and the teacher professional development programs, they are available, although not necessarily, maybe on technology integration. However, despite the investment on ICT infrastructure, teachers are well, are poorly equipped to integrate, uh, to integrate technology in the teaching learning processes. Evidence out there shows that um, whereas in some countries, whereas in some schools, some, there is evidence of classrooms with the successful technology integ integration, there is in equal measure other schools where they are missing this opportunity for developing and supporting learning of the 21st century learning skills. This is more so in developing, in developing countries. A survey that was conducted in 2011 found that teachers rated the importance of integrating technology tools into their instructions higher than the reported use of the same tools. In other words, teachers would say, well, I don't use these tools, but at the same time, they take a cognizant of the fact that integrating technological tools into the learning process is critical, is key, and it can really support effective learning. In the same study, when the teachers were asked to define what is technology integration, their responses indicated that they perceived integration more of enhancing conventional instructional goals or using technology for its own sake as opposed to adopting new instructional goals involving new activities. What this means is um, that their definition of in, 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 in technology integration bordered on the use of maybe PowerPoint presentation during a class or the use of whiteboards to deliver the lessons, which is not really technology integration because technology integration entails the learners themselves having the knowledge to mine the information, to mine data from the internet for their own consumption. But if the teachers then do not have that knowledge, then they are not going to support the learners get the same knowledge. Another scholar, Owens 2020, 2010, stated that technology becomes an effective learning tool when teachers have sufficient knowledge and are familiar in using it. This way, the teachers will be empowered to cascade the same information that they have, the same learning to the, to the students. And at the same wavelength, looking at a report by Pittman and Gaines 2015, it states that, or it noted that, the, the task of integrating technology into classroom instruction in a meaningful and state-of-the-art way remains challenging currently. And we shall be looking at the barriers to that. And the, I quote from that report, from that book, that uh, there is a general agreement among leaders in the field of education technology that due to a variety of barriers, teachers often fail to capitalize on education potential offered by the technology resources. And that is very key. Even in the schools there, where there will be the infrastructure, where there would be adequate technology, then those resources will remain unutilized 
in as long as the teachers do not have the know-how, the know-how. Charity, we shall Charity, not jump I'm so sorry in. to interrupt. Um, if I could just request you to wrap up in the next minute or two, I'd be very grateful. Yes, please, two minutes, yes. There's barriers to technology are categorized under two, the internal and external factors. These are looks like very commonplace, but for the developed, developing countries, these are really issues. For in structure, in terms of, in, uh, in terms of the software and hardware are challenge. Inadequate technology, even in the cases where there's the technology, internet and the, 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 the infrastructure is there, still teachers are not using it because they do not have the knowledge. Then there is, of course, the lack of adequate training on the part of the teachers. The internal factors related to the teachers' low self-efficacy and the teachers' perception, research evidence indicates that teachers who, who have low self-efficacy may perceive or are intimidated by technology. They think it's complicated. They cannot therefore use it. If they also have their own beliefs and attitudes, like maybe the, the children are way ahead of them, the learners are way of them, then they are not also going to use it to, for effective learning. And then a recent study by Louis found that teachers who have high self-efficacy, who use, who use uh, technology in their own private lives, then they are likely to use it in the classroom. And also, according to AMHA 2014, teachers with the more traditional beliefs, including technology, as I mentioned, just going to with um, PowerPoint presentation to the classes or using games just to drill the students to pass examination. But those with the constructivist beliefs, they tend to use technology in a more integrated way to support the students. In conclusion, I would say that um, the technology is indispensable. We need it more than before. And the teacher's scale in technology integration are needed like, before, like yesterday. So given that majority of the students lack the skills to integrate technology and also, the problem with inadequate resources in most developing countries, this has an implication of quality education. It's right to conclude that then pre-service and in-service teacher programs need to inc incorporate uh, technology integration in the curriculum. And as a concluding remark, I would say that um, change begins with a great teacher and the successful education systems have teachers who are equipped with what they need to teach. In recommendation, then, I recommend that technology should be an integral, an integral part of teacher preparation programs and the governments across the world, although in developing areas, in developing countries, they are way ahead, but in developing countries, they need to make sure that teachers are well-trained and they have the supporting infrastructure. In addition, there needs to be a rethinking about the use of mobile phones, which are available and in the hands of majority of the children in countries like Kenya, where the schools have not embraced use of mobile phones in the school. They see them as destructive, and actually they do not allow the learners to go to schools with them. And it's more serious in boarding schools where using or one being a child being found with a mobile phone can even be, be, be punished. And not only to be punished, or could also be, be, be banned from going to school for a week or so. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Charity, for a really interesting talk, uh, giving an overview of the importance of tech integration in teacher education and, and really uh, showing us the range of, of academic literature that's out there uh, in support of, of the importance of this. Really interesting presentation. Uh, and without further ado, um, we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, that's uh, Jasmeet Sani, uh, who will be speaking on the challenges of online teaching. She's the principal of Baby International School 
Uh, she has 20 years of teaching experience, teaching science and English in secondary and higher secondary classes, uh, and has been working as a principal in senior secondary schools for the past 21 years. Uh, and she is originally from Dehradun, which is, of course, as we know, a hub of learning in India. So please, uh, just meet ma'am, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, it's indeed a privilege to be speaker today at the 13th Ed Leadership International Virtual Conference, which is and being ma'am, ma'am, sorry, if, if I may request you to please try to wrap up in about 12 minutes, if possible. Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. So uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be speaking at this uh, virtual international conference, which has been organized by Getty. And today, as my topic is uh, to speak on the challenges of online teaching. So uh, in fact, today we've been hearing to the listeners since morning in the conference, and I think much has been talked about this. And as we all know that this was a situation which was declared by WHO, the pandemic situation, back in March 2020. When all of a sudden we had the COVID-19, it had been announced that uh, we were attacked by it and the corona was there and we were all in dilemmas. The schools were shut down across, I would say, approx 188 nations and about 1.2 billion children, they were out of their classrooms. The schools were shut down and there was a global learning crisis. That is how we would term it. And in this situation, you know, this situation which arose, it was a situation which was not by choice that uh, we were prepared for it. It was something we were not at all prepared. And everyone, whether it was uh, the mentors, the principals, the teachers, the students, the parents, you know, all, they were so confused, so worried. Now, what is going to happen? When everything got shut down all at once, especially the schools, the children who used to go out, they were missing going to the schools and the teachers, they were also at homes and everybody was planning that how to actually take the education to the children while they were confined to their homes. So definitely this was very challenging. And before I just start off to uh, speak uh, on this topic, I would definitely like to quote the famous words which once uh, Reverend APJ Abdul Kalam said that uh, you remember that you're born with wings. So don't crawl. Use your wings and learn to fly and fly. Yes, that's very important. Most of the times we forget that we are all born with wings. When any problem comes, we just, uh, I would say, we get dejected, we are crestfallen, and we just don't know what's going to happen next. So this was definitely a situation which we all came across back in March 2020. But yes, Everybody got together, the mentors, the principals, and the education. I mean, everybody was uh, associated with the education field as to what was now to be done. So there were many challenges. And the starting challenge, I would say, was because if I would say that, uh, of course, it was a, a paradigm was definitely shifting to the e-learning. Because e-learning is not something which was new for us. Because if we talk about even a situation pre-COVID also, Already the schools were putting in a lot of uh, funds into getting the technology into the schools, whether it was uh, for managing their offices or even, you know, they were providing the smart classes to the children. So digital content was being delivered to the students even while when they were going regularly to the schools. But one thing which was, I mean, very challenging was that there was this emotional connect you know, this, uh, you know, connect between the student and the teacher, which is very important, integral of giving the learning. You know, it's not only about imparting education, it's about bringing about a learning also. So this basic connect, this emotional connect was absolutely drawn out. And it was definitely challenging that how to now actually go about it and how to make this learning process, though online, but at the same time to make it effective and worthwhile for the children who were confined at their homes. So at this time, as I just said, this emotional connection was missing. This was, of course, there. The other problem which came up was that the lack of motivation was there. Because when the children are coming to school, you know, it's a regular routine. They're getting up, they're getting ready, they're coming to the schools. And once, you know, the teacher comes in, it's the body language of the teacher. The entire persona of the teacher 
it gives a feel to the child that yes, now it is all about academics. My teacher is here, now my class is beginning and now I have to study. So that feel was missing. So when this feel was missing, it was definitely uh, very challenging to how to bring about that motivation among the children. So teachers, they had to devise different means that how they could go about giving this. So the first platform, I mean, which was, uh, I think, used almost by every school was the WhatsApp. As we know, WhatsApp groups were formed and uh, the recording was done of the lectures and these videos were shared through the WhatsApp. But then there were a lot of refrains with this system. So then the second thing came up that was the live sessions were devised then. And there were a lot of digital platforms like we had the Zoom, then we had the Google Beat. So these were some of the commonly used platforms which most of the schools they assessed to see to it that the children uh, what they were just missing out by not coming to the schools that was the connect between the student and the teacher was maintained to an extent so to some extent we were able to do it but at the same time you know at uh, when it is you know even if it is a live session say for example it is in a zoom we can't uh, ensure that every child is sitting attentively as a child would normally sit in a classroom and listen to the teacher they can mute their microphones they can switch off their cameras and uh, you don't even know what the child is doing behind the screen so you know all these things were there so is the child actually listening to you or not listening even you could not ensure them so this indiscipline factor was also there when this online teaching was going on this was there then how to then the next challenge came how to go about their assignments how to conduct the exams then of course lack of motivation was there because you know when the students they come to the school they have that uh, peer interaction Interaction. That is very important. They have an interaction with the teacher. They have interaction with the peer. That environment is there. So all that they were not getting. So that was also the reason which was giving rise to this little bit of procrastination also we would say on part of the students if they were given some task by the teachers. They were trying to come out with excuses that ma'am we could not understand. Please explain it to us again. Or uh, my net connectivity was not right. Something like that. Whatever excuses they could come up with. And even the parents we saw so their interference was also on the rise because especially if I talk about the younger group of children, the kindergarten and the primary level children, they are the children initially, they were not able to take these online sessions without the help of the parents. So parents were sitting there to assess them, but rather resisting what was happening was they were fingering and they were telling the teacher, you're not teaching properly or sometimes they were even trying to solve the questions for the children with the teacher expected that the child should be doing on their own. So these were some of the challenges which were coming in. And the biggest uh, thing which would uh, which challenge which came up, I think it was with at least 27% uh, of children in every school that they did not have the assess to internet. That was there. Like either it was that they were residing in the rural areas or sometimes they were not from a very good, uh, I would say, income group that their parents could not afford the smartphones for them or if them the smartphones were there uh, in those areas and net connectivity was not good. So all these problems were coming. So it was the biggest challenge for every school that at least when we talk about RTE, that is a right to compuls uh, compulsory education, free and compulsory education for all children. So amidst that it was necessary for every school to make arrangements that this group which was bereft of the uh, access to internet also were provided with some digital platforms that they could at least uh, get their academics and they were not bereft of that so all these challenges were basically coming in and uh, you know even the teachers uh, when they were giving the exams also like uh, we started with google form that was one platform which was mostly adopted by most of the schools to give the examination so there of course there was no authenticity the children were using i mean uh, the google to i mean even just uh, uh, search the answers or sometimes they were assisted by their parents guardians or i mean their elder brothers and sisters so there was no authenticity also of what all exams we were taking and all this was i mean uh, in a mess i would say so how to streamline these things how to go about making this online teaching very systematic these were some of the 
challenges which I think every teacher, every school they faced. So you know, this was uh, the I would the circle. It went like this. It was the teacher, it was the parent, and it was a student. So as uh, some of our speakers also said that earlier, what was happening was that the school was doing the major part of the learning. Ninety percent was from the school side, say for example, and ten percent was from the parent side. But now it was just vice versa. It was ten percent what we could do, and ninety percent it was what the students and their parents had to do. So you know, all this was there. so that is why the equation was getting disturbed but i would definitely say that our teachers have been the real corona warriors they have came up to the forefront they have mastered their skills they have really uh, developed their skills and whatever flaws they had like they were not comfortable initially with i would say the icts because the use of icts of course as we know has come up though it was earlier there but everybody was not very comfortable with it but now i think everybody is a uh, ict master i would say it or if not a master they're at least striving to uh, reach to that level of mastery so all these challenges we were facing but i would say that it is uh, something which is uh, not something which we can't come out of it and the teachers as i was just saying that they were the warriors so they left no stone unturned to come out of the situation give a very comfortable learning experience to our children so uh, i would just request for one uh, presentation to be played and then of course uh, i will discuss in this that how we can overcome these challenges so first let's have that presentation i would request uh, the technical team to please play it for me <laughs> well very rightly said if it doesn't challenge you then how can you change so to bring about any change it is very important that we have to take in the challenge and as we just saw in the presentation to overcome these challenges of online teaching the ball lies in the court of the teachers they have to be motivational uh, and they have to bring out the best from the students and how to bring about this motivation that is very important the teachers uh, to bring about this motivation you know they have to not only think about have to use uh, any digital platform for a couple of hours so their mental health their physical health was also going down so the teachers we motivated the teachers to talk about health as well and for this we even included some sessions which related to physical fitness and even the teachers in turn were also doing this they were motivating the children not to come in stress to think about what nutrition they were taking they had to eat well they had to sleep well and they had to do some physical fitness also so this was one motivation from the children side uh, teacher side i would say this was one motivation the other motivation with the teachers can always give is that even if any child is not understanding the lessons they can always call up the teachers then we had given the facility of video call is always there the students can call up the teachers and they get can get their problems sorted out so this was one of the motivation which the teachers were giving and definitely they will be giving in future also the other thing was Ask that me, um, i could just give you a one one minute notice please okay yeah. okay okay fine fine uh so i will just try to wrap up uh, very fast so this was one thing which uh, oh, we were telling to the teachers and teachers have been I'm doing it, how to make assignments uh, also very creative that was also one thing that was uh, told to the teachers and teachers have been doing it and to uh, tell the children that it is self discipline is very important children have to remember that even if the teachers are not watching them they have to take care that whatever is being taught to them they really follow it very nicely and still if any problems are coming in the lessons teachers are always there for them so basically what i have to say here is that the teacher is the big 
you know, uh, I would say the change maker, she can make a difference. So definitely, uh, I would like to just wrap up my talk by just uh, asking you to play one song, which is a very motivational song for the teachers, I think, which is going to sum up what exactly I've been trying to say till now. So let's have that song before we just wind up. May, may I request that we, um, we, if we have time at the very end, we play the song then at, at the end of the session. If, if uh, we it's don't a play very the song. brief one. If you can just have it, I think it'll uh, suit the situation. <laughs> you can just have it. Okay, all right. Okay. I'll, I'll leave it with the host. Yeah. Okay, okay. This song is for those who inspire us today Who always lend a helping hand to help show us the way This song is for those who see their students through The tough times in their lives For that we say thank you You have made a difference You have shaped our minds you have changed the world, one child at a time. You have always been there in everything you do. I hope that you're as proud of me as I am proud of you. This song is for those who heard the silent cries, who stepped in to wipe the tears from the children's eyes. For those who gave us a safe place to grow A place for us to call our home forever we will know that You have made a difference You have shaped our minds You have changed the world One child at a time You have always been there In everything you do I hope that you're as proud of me as I am proud of you. This song is for those who taught us right from wrong. Who taught us much more than their craft to help our minds grow strong. This song is for those who guide us through and through. So that we can make a life for that we say thank you. You have shaped our minds You have changed the world One child at a time You have always been there In everything you do I hope that you're as proud of me As I am proud of you As I look back on my life And to the path within my reach I hope I can change the life of those that I teach. I can make a difference. All I do is try. Try to see a different world through the children's eyes. And I will always be there in everything I do. I hope that you're as proud of me as I am proud of you. In everything I do, I hope that you're as proud of me as I am proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Getty, for giving me this opportunity to speak on this platform. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jasmeet, ma'am. And I think, judging by the comments, made the right decision to allow the song to be played. Everyone absolutely loved it. A lot of requests thank for you, you to share the link. Thank so you. please do share it. And thanks for the great presentation. Yeah, um, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, that's uh, Lali John, um, who's from uh, he's over 30 years of experience in the school education sector, uh, 15 years in mainstream education, uh, classroom teaching, research, and e-learning content, and 15 years experience in the publishing industry. Uh, predominantly at the Oxford University Press and currently the group publishing head at the S. Chand Group. Um, so, uh, Lali, uh, please do go ahead. Thank you for your kind words, uh, Mr. Roshangandi. I hope I'm uh, audible. Yes. Yeah. All right, great. So I'd like to start with namaste to you and to everybody. I know it's been a long day, so I'll try to zippy through it. But uh, what I'm excited about is that uh, 
uh, I've been looking at all the deliberations yesterday and today. And I think most importantly, um, what I've come to realize is everybody uses content, but not necessarily is everyone using it. So I thought I'll just share my screen and get started about something which I'm sure is going to be useful to each of you. So there you are. Is, is this clear? Great. So um, I want to talk about something which connects this roundtable eight. And uh, we talked about technology and we talked about education. And I think what connects both of them is content. So I want to just talk about the role of content in the education ecosystem. Now, if you would just allow me to go or uh, take you to the other side, really, content is anything that adds value to the reader's life. And that's so true. Um, Bill Gates, he kind of coined this word that content is king. But without strategy, content is just stuff. And the world has enough stuff. So what I really believe is this, that the content really is a conduit which literally gets the bulb glowing for learners and for readers. So I'll talk a little bit about the content for school education. You know, when I meet a lot of people, some of the things that they ask me is, how do you create quality content? How do you know what learners want? How do you know what teachers want? And I thought these are the three frequently asked questions that I should discuss with you very, very briefly, because I think all the participants, majority, are in the field of education in some format or the other. And I would like to take the example of the organization that I presently am the publishing head of, is Chan Publishing. And um, for us, creating content and creating quality content is something that um, you know we kind of thrive on because as Chan is a company which has been uh, in the publishing arena, in the Indian publishing arena for uh, 80 years now. And I think it's one of the oldest Indian publishing houses. So to create quality content, I'll just in a nutshell, or rather in a tiny nutshell, if there is a word such as that, I'd like to tell you what we do. So before we even begin creating something, we study what we are up against. And that is a competition study that we do. And once we know what we are up against, we uh, kind of formulate a storyboard, so to speak, of the manuscript. We talk to teachers of reputed schools, um, we, uh, especially teachers who have a lot of experience, uh, you know, and uh, along with the editorial team, we kind of develop the manuscript. And once it comes to the editorial desk, then magic happens. The manuscript turns into a book. Of course, it's not as rosy as what I'm telling you now. It pretty much looks like this. This is what my editorial team looks like on any given day. They're laden with books. But at the end of it is when the manuscript, after it's been edited and after the content has been cleaned up, it goes in for printing. And then that's how each of you get the book. So tens and thousands copies of the book that rolls out of the printing presses. Now, having said this, the question that people often ask is, how do you know what the students want? And I think as a good content provider, if we understand where the student comes from or where the learner comes from, it helps you create books. So the learner, when we see, comes to school with minimum understanding and knowledge, comes from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, is at a different level and capability from the others in the same class, needs a different approach of handling by the teacher, has pressures of peers, parents, and society to manage. So what do we do? How, how does content help? So if we understand where the learner comes from, we create textbooks that are pedagogically sound and up to date. And we take care of the difficulty levels of the content and vocabulary is very carefully mapped out. We do understand that one size doesn't fit all. So we try to ensure that the books cater to different learning styles of the students. And so variety in exercises and activities ensure this. With most of our books, multimedia resources are provided for the multi-sensory learner of today. And due importance is given to the aesthetic appeal of the books. Who doesn't like a good book? And especially children, they love it. So we think of textbooks as tools, whether it is printed books or whether it is eBooks. 
tools that are designed to empower the person using them. Coming to the third question, how do we know what the teacher wants? It's very simple. We understand so very well that a teacher is a mentor, a guide, a friend, and a parent. Needs to use different approaches to handle the different types of learners. Requires tools to enable the quality of delivery and needs additional support to fulfill all the learning outcomes and has challenges internally and externally to meet and overcome. So this is what we do to take care of the requirements of teachers. So we realize all too well that without the empowerment of the teaching fraternity, comprehensive learning cannot be achieved in a classroom. Thus, we put in a great deal of effort to make 360 degree teacher empowerment possible. And this includes offerings such as teachers resource kits, lesson plans, answer keys, worksheets, animations, test generators, and in the pandemic, a dedicated e-resource portal for teachers. I will talk a little bit about it in uh, the slides that's going to come in. So we not only create new tools and resources, but also support teachers to make the most of the content we create with everything from product knowledge to lesson planning to training workshop. And all of this requires that the content that's created is absolutely spot on. So I wanted to just talk about, you know, everyone talks about four C's. I just wanted to say that at S. John Publishing, the four C's of what we do, it may be slightly different from what we hear otherwise. The first is content quality. And this is just a snapshot of some of the titles that we've created across kindergarten to 12. And uh, as you can see, the covers are beautiful. And let me assure you, the books inside is as beautiful. And this is something we're absolutely proud of, is consistency. I want to give two examples of consistency. We've been publishing the iconic Ren and Martin grammar in India since 1973, which means consistently for 48 years, we've been managing to innovate and keep this absolutely alive in the market. The second series that I want to talk about very briefly is something all Indian teachers know about, the Lakmir Singh Science Series, a science series that sells over 100,000 copies of each book each year. And Keeping it going and moving in this dynamic market scenario is not easy. And this has been in the market for now, I think about 40 years. And the latest thing we're giving along with it is virtual reality content for children, for classes six to 10, for every chapter, for every book. And that's one of the ways in which we've kept ourselves consistent. So that's two C's. The third C is creativity. Now you'd wonder what is creativity in a publishing arena? Well. We identify gap areas. We identify market requirements, what schools require. I'll just give you again, just two examples. One, a lot of schools use the NCERT books and a lot of people come back saying they want additional practice. So this is creativity from us. For the books that you use, there are practice books. And as you can see across subject areas, which you know takes care of the entire gamut of subjects. The second is something that we are absolutely thrilled about. It's called the monthly term book. And this is something that we all talk about, that we need to uh, you know, uh, reduce the load on children in terms of the books. So we decided why not have the children carry just one book at a time? Seems like a great creative idea to us. So we created monthly term book series for classes one to five. And this series has eight books per class because effectively there are eight months you know, where effective teaching happens. And having said that, it covers all the subjects that schools need, English, mathematics, science, social studies. So uh, we feel that this is something that is very creative and a lot of our users are absolutely thrilled using this. And coming to the last C is commitment. Commitment to our students by creating what they require. And today's students or learners, what I call them as push button kids, I think they need something which, you know, um, aligns with them. And so we have a virtual reality app as well as a My, Steer, uh, My Study Gear app, which is totally for students. And of course, our wonderful teachers who kind of drive the entire uh, teaching learning in the class. So e-resources for to uh, teachers, um, we created a dedicated web portal for teachers to facilitate blended learning during the pandemic. And 
we realized that teachers had to move overnight from traditional teaching tools to juggling with gadgets and software. So having discussed with all of our teachers is one thing that was top on everybody's list. Please keep it simple. And that's exactly what we did. We created something, a portal that only requires one to log in, go to any video enabled offering and simply share one screen, pretty much like what I'm doing right now. And a virtual classroom was ready in a few steps. So the teacher would flip the page, zoom a page, highlight text, show an animation, have students do an interactivity, teach as if they were face-to-face -face in the classroom. And the portal has also been designed in such a way that when schools reopen, one can continue to use this portal as a room in Zoom, where some students are in the classroom for the lesson, while the remaining students may be at home seeing the same lesson virtually. So these are some of the things that are, you know, content related. But, you know, I have been in the arena of education for about 35 years, first as a teacher and then now as a publisher. And I think this is the best place to give you some food for thought. And let me just start off with, everyone knows this, that education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. Said Nelson Mandela, and I think we agree. But you know something? This is something we need to think about, that our system of education has an unspoken irony. The institution with the greatest potential impact in the future is arguably the one most shaped by taken for granted ideas from the past. You don't believe me? Here it is. You know what's coming, right? A classroom from the year 1916 looks like this. So does a classroom from the year 2016. And I'm sure you'll tell me that, you know, we're all technologically advanced as compared to uh, the classroom in 1916. So I have something to ask you here as well, or to tell you. Uh, way back in the year 2000, I was part of uh, Educom, the company I think in India, which pretty much laid the seeds to e-learning in school. And I've been tracking what's happening in this arena since then. And this is what I think that edtech continues to be a challenge in schools, in a majority of schools. And I feel that the majority of education technology innovations offer very narrow modification within existing educational processes and programs. Most educational technologies remain existing within conventional education system. The same system of classes and lessons, the same hierarchy of teacher and student relationship, the same system of assessment and tests. So what I find is what's really happening in most classrooms today is that in the name of technology, chalk and talk is being replaced by screen and talk. And so foundational principles of the existing education system remains untouched and unchallenged by these technological innovations. So EdTech continues to be a challenge because the human side is yet to be redesigned. Without the changed human side or changed mindset, Etech innovations will always be found lacking, if not incapable, of meeting the needs of learners and teachers. I think this is something that we need to think about. I'm now going to say something which I think is stirring a hornet's nest. I say that we don't really have an education system. What we have is an examination system. Transfer of information, storage of information, and representation of information akin to a pen drive, and I interact with a lot of children. And the truth is, after 18 years, most children come out of school lost, unclear, and unprepared to face the world around them. So this is something to think about too. And I can't help but quote Alvin Toffler when he says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And we talk a lot about the four C's. I just want to talk about just that critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creation of content is important. But we cannot teach children to be creative by giving them standard tests, tasks as a basis of the learning process. But we do that, right? We cannot teach children to be collaborative and work with each other by addressing them individually or putting them by putting them in competition against each other. But we do that too. 
We cannot teach children to be lifelong learners, able to set and achieve their learning goals if we deprive them of self-exploration or if we punish them for perceived failures, but we do that too. So isn't it therefore time for us in the education arena to first unlearn and relearn before moving on to help children do the same? This is something to think about too. So it basically boils down to the fact that learning is experience, everything else is just information. And the best example I can give to establish this fact is to take you back to your childhood and just take you back to how did you learn how to ride a bicycle? It kind of looked like this, I guess, to most of you at least. Please tell me who's in the driver's seat, the learner. So what if instead of this, you were given something like this and you had to learn how to ride a bike. You think you would ever do this? There's something to think about. And so I'll close with something that I have experienced when I was a teacher is that the day you're willing to veer off the lesson plan, follow a kid's lead and learn with your students is the day you really become a teacher. And so navigating the future of learning is a leap of imagination that will help us to rethink education as a vehicle to help shape the society we want to create through learning how to learn together. It means embracing the extraordinary challenges of unprecedented rise in global demand for education with a response fit for the future, not the past. It also means finding ways to support the growing network of teacher innovators like Dr. Jagdish Gandhi, Dr. Bharti Gandhi, and Dr. Sunita Gandhi, who are moving from the front of the room, delivering prepackaged content to the middle of the room, learning with and from their students. And so I'll quickly end by saying that I have great hopes from all of our participants, all the educators who are a part of this conference, because I'm waiting to create content which aligns with the new thinking and the new mindset that we need to have in the arena of learning. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Lali John, for that uh, very interesting presentation on the content creation process and uh, sharing a lot of very valuable insights for all the participants. Uh, last but not the least, uh, we have Tazeen Jamal Siddiqui. Um, the bio is a very long list of accolades, the, the bio that I've got here. So I won't read out the whole thing, but please know uh, that uh, Tazeen Ma'am is extremely accomplished. Uh, she also has created her own theory uh, called the Tazeen Taxology, uh, which has its own course as well. Um, and is, has been an advisor in Finland uh, and in many other places as well, and is a global Nelson Mandela Leadership Award winner. Uh, so I won't read out the rest, but please go ahead. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much and a very good evening to all. Well, I'm extremely happy to be here and I extend my gratitude to all of you, Dr. Gandhi and everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity to interact with you all. So before I start, I want to congratulate each one of you for winning this COVID-19 phase with uh, great strength, with courage, happiness, and positivity. So congratulations, all of you. If we are here smiling, sharing knowledge, that means we are already a winner of this COVID-19 phase. Now, starting with learning, uh, well, can someone help me out with my presentation? Uh, can you share my PPT? Uh, oh, thank you very much. So friends, today I will be discussing on learning. But before that, uh, <clears throat> can we have a next slide? <clears throat> May I please have the next slide? Okay. Now, when we talk about learning, learning is ignited when we inculcate positivity at heart, will and vision to perseverance in mind and courage to sustain that positivity that leads to learning. 
so i would say learning is positivity plus passion plus imagination plus hope is equal to learning so learning comes in when you imagine with freedom when you create your thoughts to something unique to something innovative and that's where learning begins so lifelong learning starts with the understanding of the concept when through the implementation of the right methodology we at times say that uh, you know some children are slow learners or some children are not understanding your concept my friends it's not always the child who the slow learner at times we are unable to cater the right methodology you know to understand that child because each child is a different learner some are audio learners some are kinesthetic learners right so there are different kind of learning you know we say there is online learning there is offline learning blended learning and <clears throat> i include one more learning that is offbeat learning so online offline blended learning and offbeat learning now offbeat learning uh, must be sounding little unique now this i coined it for the children who are adhd or who has some issue in understanding the concept they learn through different methodology and that is an offbeat learning where they learn it in a different way now we have been a winner in this covid-19 phase because uh, though uh, this uh, this pandemic phase affected our education system but still this online learning opened opened the doors for us to sustain the knowledge to help children to gain knowledge in this phase too may i please have the next slide so in this online learning phase the government has taken great initiative and i congratulate government of india for this for taking such great initiatives where number one is diksha infrastructure for knowledge sharing national platform for school education access through tv channels swayam prabha dta channels are meant to support and reach who do not have access to interact there are 32 channels available and 92 courses have been started with 1.5 crore students already enrolled my friends all these initiatives have helped us sustain our knowledge open schools and pre service education online mooc courses for 9 to 12th grade radio broadcasting is being used for children in remote areas known as shiksha vani of cbsc 289 community radio stations have also been used to broadcast e textbooks can be accessed by e pathshala with web portal and mobile app more than 6000 digital books including 377 ebooks for grade 1 to 12 are available around 3500 pieces of audio and visual content of ncrt are available in the public domain in various languages <laughs> my friends online learning have done amazing and the government initiatives have helped us so that we have knowledge to our children and we do it so that children are not uh, you know uh, are not close to knowledge but they are open to knowledge even if they are unable to come to schools but they can gain knowledge through it may I please have now online learning benefits now since we are going through this online phase what are its benefits so my friends one and the first and the most important benefit is online learning leads to digital leadership now what is digital leadership when you are teaching a child when you are giving projects to children or when you are teaching them every child is independent to get into you know that topic to understand that topic independently to learn everything independently so this is given a great leadership in kids which i call digital leadership 
where the child is able to understand everything on their own. They're able to communicate with the teacher with absolutely new technology, which maybe they were not so aware of. Now they are able to uh, get aware with the technology. They are doing their uh, great work. They are even uh, you know, giving assignments online. They're giving the examinations online. And that's what make it amazing. And the, this, you know, this has helped our children to become digital leaders, which is amazing because this is going to help them to lead the world. Second is educators, technological training and development. Now this online learning has given a great platform and a great learning to the teachers because many teachers who, who did not understand this phase, this uh, technology or this, uh, this knowledge of computers and everything, they have now been trained and this has been added to their knowledge and their training that they're able to do everything by their own. They're able to teach online, they're able to do corrections online and this has led to the technological advancement and also uh, it has led to the transformation of self. You know, this COVID-19 phase has done one positive aspect that every individual has been transformed. They have learned and they have created a, a, new, a new person in them. You know, they have learned a skill to add on to their knowledge, to add on their, to their profile. And the fourth important online learning benefit is tracking coordinating and leading. Now, this has helped teachers to understand every child because now every child can be there online and the, and the, and the teachers are able to track their work individually. They're able to coordinate. The children are able to coordinate and they, with the help of children, at times when the teachers are learning technology. So the coordination of the teacher and student relationship is getting technologically better because even the teachers if sometimes are unable to uh, you know do something the children are guiding them that madam do this way so this coordination has given a, a, a new relationship of this uh, teacher taught relationship where both have come at the same page the teacher and student have come on the same page and they're learning with each other and they're coordinating with each other and leading this whole online learning in an amazing way. So these four benefits have been great. Now, now with these uh, great things that happened with this online learning, definitely, you know, uh, with everything, we have some good points and some not, uh, you know, some different points. So let me come up with a few challenges that uh, we are facing with this online learning. Number one is lack of horizontal learning. My friends, there are two kinds of learning. One is vertical learning, which is taught by the teacher to students. Second is horizontal learning, where the students teach their own peer group, which is called peer learning. So lack of horizontal learning is a challenge in online learning because when, when students are in class, they interact with their peer group, what, what their friends are unable to understand, they're able to correct them, they're able to, you know, help them out. So this, this little challenge of horizontal learning uh, is a bit reduced in online learning. Second point, please. Uh, yes, and second most important thing is empathy is slightly reduced uh, without the physical connect. Because when student is sad, what does a student do? They just come to the teacher, they hug the teacher, they share their worries to the teacher, maybe something with that went wrong in their homes or something went wrong uh, you know, on the way. They would just come and hug the teacher and express themselves. Or the teacher would take the children out, sitting under the tree and telling stories. So that physical connect help in building up empathy, help in you know, increasing the emotional quotient of the child. So one, uh, just one challenge that I feel, uh, an important uh, uh, challenge that we are facing today is that the empathy and the physical connect is reduced. That leads to uh, a reduced emotional quotient where the child is unable to physically connect the teacher 
a look into the eyes and eyes in, of the teacher and speak or just go and hug or uh, just show their new tiffin box or do everything that the child uh, you know likes to do so this is one uh, another challenge that empathy is slightly reduced with this challenge and the next one is reduce connect with nature to feel touch and watch reduces the practical decision making so my friends when the child is in the playground the child explore multiple things you know when the child is able to touch feel like if you are teaching about the soil the, the you know the child would go touch the soil feel it and understand what kind of soil it is or what you know which color of flower is it how soft are the petals so the touch and feel the physical connect with the nature you know is very important for building the practical decision making approach so the practical decision making thought process is immensely increased when the when the child is uh, connected with the nature oh tazin you've just gone on mute You, you've gone on mute, Tazin. Yeah. I, I, am I audible now? Mute. Yes. Yeah. You're on mute, Tazin. Uh, I hope I'm audible now. How are you audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, uh, was there something that uh, you were unable to hear? Okay. The children would connect through the nature. Can you can we proceed from there? All right. Good. Okay. So I was saying that it's important for the students to connect with nature because. Uh, i mean not just students even we adults we feel you know we feel amazing when we go to the garden or we sit under the tree because that's how we feel because you know you know the multiple intelligences or the emotions that we have are satisfied and we feel great when we are exposed to nature where we can see multiple things at a time we can feel the calmness there right so this is one challenge that we are facing in today's learning second is it affects the expressing of emotions now this point is very important that how a child expresses emotions is very important now in this pandemic phase we teach the child not to touch uh, the other person to maintain some distance to do this to do that now all these things are very important guidelines but Uh, you know somewhere we are also uh, you know making the child uh, less expressive with that because here when the child wins he would go and hug his friend or give a high five to his friend and say yes we did it but now the child is unable to do that he is unable to express his emotions in the best way possible he is able to smile he is able to you know laugh and all but he is unable to have that physical connect when he's sad when he's worried when he's happy because all these things are very important and that's a reason why we why the children go through mental stress or uh, at times uh, there is anxiety and depression when a child is unable to express himself uh, the best way possible because whatever a person feel it's important to express it so all this learning i i believe that these are the important points or challenges that our children are kind of facing uh, in this uh, online learning now because uh, online learning uh, is is a contingency learning so that they can gain knowledge throughout and there it's not that the doors are not closed for them for knowledge they can gain knowledge they can you know read write and learn Uh, with uh, with the online learning so this is one of the important aspect why we started off with online learning so that uh, the children can continuously gain knowledge now these are few challenges that i feel uh, are uh, are important uh, that our children are facing today and i'm sure that uh, there is always uh, um, you know uh, a sunrise after sunset so uh, very soon uh, we'll all be in the new normal phase where definitely the children will get the same uh, you know uh, the same atmosphere where they will again connect with the teacher they'll again be there in the ground to play because life is about leading every phase with courage happiness and hope so my friends uh, every morning is a new life 
because when we sleep, we always pray that, you know, in the morning, uh, when we wake up, we have, uh, uh, you know, we wake, wake up healthy. So every morning is a new life. And if it's true, and if you believe in that, make every morning amazing with your thoughts, with your actions, and with your great thought process, because uh, it's your responsibility to make that day to write, uh, to, you know, write that blank paper of the day with amazing thoughts and amazing positivity. So I feel that learning, I congratulate every teacher here and every principal and educators here who have helped every child to gain knowledge throughout this phase. And uh, I remember when I, see, when I see children smiling, uh, when they get on to the music classes, when they get on to learning uh, different subjects, it's so amazing that they are now uh, enjoying the new normal in, in, in a unique way of online learning. But I'm sure that uh, that uh, the day is not far when we are going to have uh, all the challenges uh, will be finished and uh, the, the children will again uh, get brightened and enlightened in the same phase which they used to enjoy earlier. So all the best. Thank you very much. And I truly enjoyed. If you have any questions, my friends, you're most welcome to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tazeen, for, for ending the session on that very hopeful note. And I Thank think we all much. really enjoyed hearing, you know, reminding ourselves of the need for that emotional connect. And, uh, you know, we keep talking about a new normal going forward, the continuation of digital education, even after the pandemic. But I think you very nicely reminded us of all of those things where the physical human connect is so utterly important that it must never be ended, regardless of what digital uh, future we see. So thank you so much for that very uh, potent reminder. And, thank you, uh, Leah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think um, if the hosts agree, in the interest of time, perhaps we won't attempt to do a question and answer session now. Uh, I'd just like to uh, really thank all of our speakers today. Uh, I think we've really heard some extremely interesting perspectives uh, from, from all ends of the, the spectrum, starting with uh, Ms. Jennifer, who, who was very, very progressive in her thinking and got us to really rethink uh, from the beginning uh, what uh, digital literacy really means and think about engaging, you know, allowing and encouraging children to use new ways of communicating and use emojis and images as, as part of their writing. Uh, right over to, of course, um, you know, Ms. Tazeen, who we just heard at the end, who touched our hearts with the need for that physical and emotional connect that can never be replicated digitally. And, and all the speakers uh, in Mati between Dr. Neelam Parmar, Charity Lemoro, uh, Jasmeet Sani, and Lali John. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. Uh, I certainly learned a huge amount. I'm sure all of the participants, uh, all of the attendees learned a huge amount too. Uh, thanks again to the Ed Leadership team and Dr. Sunita Gandhi for organizing this wonderful session. Uh, and I will now hand back to the hosts. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roshan Gandhi, for chairing the eighth round table of the 13th Ed Leadership International Conference. And thanks to all the keynote speakers for sharing their thoughts with us. We invite you and your teachers to apply for the Getty Innovation in Process Fellowships at this Ed Leadership uh, Conference. Anyone working in education at any level can apply from anywhere in the world policymakers, heads of schools and NGOs working in education. Getty Innovators Award are for an idea you have already implemented and for which we have collected evidences. Getty Innovation and Process Fellowships are given for an idea for change that you have that you wish to implement after the conference. This idea may be one you gather during the conversations that take place at Ed Leadership. Please fill in the fellowships and awards from today onwards, if not done so far. Link is provided to you in the Zoom chat room. And those watching from Facebook and YouTube may go to www.getylearn.org and apply from there. We look forward to your applications for the same.
On behalf of the Global Education and Training Institute, I thank all the eminent speakers of the day for all the roundtables that we had so far, for their unwavering attention throughout the conferences. We appreciate the keen interest shown by you in all the roundtables. Attention spans of such lengths are rare in our field. Indeed, we can't thank you all enough for giving this conference such a massive attention. Before we bid good night to each other, please allow me to share these beautiful thoughts with you. Night helps us to realize the value of light. Night helps us to realize the value of light. Every dawn becomes a new opportunity, a new hope, a new thought, and new challenges that we face tomorrow. Tomorrow would be a day full of hard work to do. So for now, you wait for the night and slip your night shoe. Enjoy the faintest of music from far away. And I'm sure your tiredness escapes away. So sleep with the dreams of tomorrow to come and meet new challenges together to be overcome. Good night to all with a promise that we would be the first one to say good morning to all of you. Thank okay. you tomorrow at 8.45 with the ninth round table, which begins at 8.45 a.m. sharp. <clears throat> Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.